All righty. Welcome to the NATO at 75 Charting a New Course Conference, hosted by the Georgetown Center for Security Studies and sponsored by the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy, the BMW Center for German and European Studies, and the European Center for International Affairs. Our programming will begin shortly. Please take a moment to silence any cell phones. And as a reminder, we follow Georgetown University's speech and expression policy, which can be found on the Georgetown Student Affairs website. With the exception of the afternoon keynote, there will be a question and answer portion at the end of each session, during which you may come to the mic stand at the um, end or middle of the middle aisle and ask questions. Please be sure to phrase your comments in the form of a question. And in the interest of time, we ask that each person be concise and ask only one question. For the question and answer portion of the afternoon keynote with General Cavoli, Supreme Allied Commander Europe, please submit your questions in advance using the QR codes displayed on the screens on either side of the stage. Additionally, we will have several breaks during the day. You are welcome to use the restrooms located on the fourth floor and first floor of Healy Hall during these breaks. However, please note the doors will close to Gaston Hall at the beginning of each session. Out of respect for our keynote speakers and panelists, please be sure to return promptly for each session and do your best to minimize distractions. And finally, there are elevators located to the far right of the stairs should you need them. Thank you for joining us today.
Good morning, everyone. My name is Sara Moeller, and I'm a core faculty member in the Security Studies program here at the Walsh School of Foreign Service. I'm delighted to welcome you all, both those joining us in person here this morning in historic Gaston Hall, as well as those tuning in virtually from around the world to, the, to our conference on NATO at 75, charting a new course. 75 years ago last week, not too far from where we are meeting now, representatives from 12 North Atlantic countries came together in downtown Washington to affirm their resolve to unite their efforts for collective security and defense and preserve the peace and security of the Atlantic community, an association born of war designed to fortify peace. In the words of Secretary Acheson, who signed the treaty on behalf of the government and people of the United States, the purpose of the North Atlantic Pact was twofold. For those who seek peace, it is a guide to refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. For those who set their feet upon the path of aggression, it is a warning that if it must needs be that offenses come, then woe unto them by whom the offense cometh. This duality of purpose, a desire for peace while being prepared for war, has guided the alliance ever since, peace through security. Indeed, the NATO flag and emblem featuring a star representing a compass symbolizes the peaceful purpose of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. As explained by Lord Ismay, the Alliance's first Secretary General, the compass star guides NATO towards peace, while the circle signifies the unity among the Alliance's members. As a political military alliance, NATO is also unique in that its members have pledged not only to uphold the principle of collective defense and guarantee each other's security, but also their shared determination to safeguard the freedom and prosperity of their peoples, a freedom founded on the principles of democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. This hybrid political military identity has at times been a source of tension within the alliance. Over the course of the past seven and a half decades, the Alliance has often had to navigate the delicate balance between political and military priorities as it sought to fulfill its chief purpose and safeguard the peace, freedom, and security of its members. A tension that persists within the Alliance today and one I'm sure we'll hear more about over the course of the day. Following the end of the Cold War, NATO added two core tasks, crisis prevention and management, and cooperative security to its original focus on deterrence and defense. And for a brief period, NATO could direct its attention and energies towards out-of-area operations and expeditionary missions, securing the belief that Europe was whole and free. But history has now caught up with the alliance, and today Russia is once again threatening Europe and the wider Atlantic community. As a consequence, the alliance has returned to its original purpose, deterring and defending the Euro-Atlantic area. At the same time, the Alliance faces other threats and challenges, the persistent threat of terrorism, and the growing assertiveness of China, whose ambitions and coercive policies, as the 2022 NATO strategic concept stated, directly challenges the interests, values, and security of the Alliance. Along with managing these challenges, NATO must also confront one of the defining issues of our time, the impact of climate change. That's quite a crowded agenda. There have been other significant changes along the way as well. 75 years on from its founding, the Alliance is larger than ever, having added 20 additional members in the intervening decades, most recently Sweden last month, and several partner countries like the AP4. And as we'll hear this morning and afternoon, the Alliance is not only larger than ever, but it is also actively working on becoming stronger than ever. Navigating the complex and often turbulent waters of today's international security environment, while learning from past experiences and remaining agile enough to adapt to future contingencies is NATO's central challenge today. Over the course of the day, we'll have the privilege of hearing from many distinguished alliance practitioners and NATO scholars, each offering their unique insights and perspectives on these and other pressing issues. In a moment, we'll have the opportunity to hear directly from the US permanent representative to NATO, Ambassador Julianne Smith, who will share her perspective and provide insights on last week's NATO's foreign ministerial meeting, as well as a preview of the upcoming agenda for the July Washington summit. Following her prepared remarks, Ambassador Smith will take questions from the audience in the room. The afternoon keynote address will be delivered by Supreme Allied Commander General Christopher Cavoli, who will also take questions from those in attendance here today.
And to facilitate this, we're excited to introduce a new format for audience members to submit their questions in advance. At least it's new for me. Uh, the QR code that you see displayed before you on the two screens enables you to submit questions throughout the day ahead of this afternoon's session, ensuring we can incorporate as many questions from the audience as possible during our brief time with Sakur Cavoli. I encourage you to make use of this opportunity during the breaks in today's program. Organizing an event of this caliber and size, as I'm sure you can imagine, requires all hands on deck, and there were many individuals who were involved in making today possible. I want to begin by thanking my colleagues from the Security Studies Program, especially Professors Stephen Flanagan and Heidi Urban. They have been my guiding North Stars since we embarked on planning this conference nearly 10 months ago. And along the way, they have offered steady direction and been a constant source of advice, for which I'm deeply appreciative. I also want to express my gratitude to Jenna DeFossi and Abby Frameth from the Center for Security Studies, who have done an outstanding job making today a reality, and frankly, they've had to put up with far too many emails from me in the process. I'm also grateful to Professors Daniel Byman and Rebecca Patterson, the Director and Associate Director of the Center for Security Studies, for their support, along with the many staff and student volunteers from the program who are helping here today. Thank you all. I also want to thank the many colleagues from across the School of Foreign Service and the wider Georgetown University community for offering their assistance and support. In particular, I'd like to thank Jackson Menner from Protocol and Events and Jacob Mendel from Event Management Services. Thank you both for all of your work. Finally, I want to extend my gratitude to our Georgetown partners, the Mortara Center for International Studies and the BMW Center for German and European Studies for their generous financial support for today's programming. It's my pleasure to now introduce Dean Joel Hellman, who will offer a few remarks before introducing our first keynote of the day, Ambassador Julianne Smith. Dean Hellman, the helm is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you for all the work you've done in organizing um, what I know will be a fascinating and I'm sure an important day. Uh, I want to welcome to you to Georgetown. It seems like a particularly, I don't know, momentous day because of what we're going to see climactically as well as we're going to discuss here in the room. Uh, I am going to try to see whether or not the staff can actually get us um, glasses to, to look at the eclipse if we have lots of people leaving for about a 15 minute period in the afternoon. I don't know if stained glass is also a protective way um, of looking at the eclipse. Um, but it does feel, um, it gives this day um, a little bit more significance. Um, let me welcome you here for those who have never um, joined us here on the Georgetown University campus of the School of Foreign Service. Let me tell you a little bit about our school because it is uh, such an honor, a privilege, and indeed for us, very consistent with the mission of why this school was created. Uh, you are here at the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, which is the oldest school of international affairs in the United States. It was created in 1919 in the immediate aftermath of World War I with a very explicit mission. Our founder on that very day of inaugurating the school um, said, and I quote, unprepared as we were for war, we are resolved never to be unprepared for the peace. And for over 100 years, this school has been training generations of leaders engaging um, through our scholarship, research, and teaching on the core issues that will preserve the peace, um, uh, both uh, in the last century and going forward. So it is uh, very much in line with our mission to welcome this discussion on a critical uh, alliance, a critical set of relationships, a critical organization um, that has worked very much in accordance with this mission to preserve the peace, NATO at 75. Um, we are deeply grateful to be able to host um, a, such an extraordinary range of panelists to talk both about the history um, of NATO, but more importantly, about the future of NATO at a, such a critical moment. As we all know, NATO has uh, been challenged like never before um, uh, with an invasion in Europe that was almost unimaginable a few years ago, um, and yet NATO's resolve has shown to be 
well beyond the expectations, the, uni the unity of NATO, the expansion of NATO, um, has been true to the very mission by which NATO was created. But there are many challenges ahead, and this is an extraordinary opportunity um, to dig into those challenges, to understand those challenges, and to begin to set the stage um, for the next 75 years of NATO's efforts to preserve peace. And with that, we want to begin uh, with uh, someone, of course, who knows these issues um, from the inside out, as you say. We are so pleased to welcome today Ambassador Julianne Smith. She is, as you know, the U.S. permanent representative to NATO, a position that she took on in November 2021. Um, uh, following a, a long and distinguished career in multiple uh, positions, both engaging in and analyzing the transatlantic relationship. Prior to this position, she served as a senior advisor to Secretary of State Blinken. Um, before that, she was the director of Asia and geopolitics programs at the German Marshall Fund of the United States. She was also director of the transatlantic security program at the Center for a New American Security. She also played a number of roles in government. She was acting national security advisor and deputy national security advisor to the vice president of the United States. She served for three years as the principal secretary, secret director for European and NATO policy um, in, the, uh, in the Pentagon, um, for which she was actually awarded the Secretary of Defense's Medal for Exceptional Public Service. And of course, she has held a variety of positions in research institutes here in Washington and beyond the Center for Strategic and International Studies, the German Marshall Fund, the American Academy in Berlin. So uh, she is uh, uniquely capable of giving us both a perspective on NATO's past um, and, of course, a glimpse into how the U.S. Um, is thinking about NATO's future. Um, and we are pleased uh, uh, to moderate this discussion, first in a fireside chat format and then through your questions, um, to have a, a truly distinguished uh, member of the International Press Corps, David Sanger. He's the White House and National Security Correspondent for the New York Times um, and is one of the organization's most senior uh, writers, having spent 42 years um, at the New York Times during which he was associated with a team that has won multiple Pulitzer Prizes. Uh, his new book, the fourth book um, that he is publishing, um, uh, will come out in April called, fittingly, New Cold Wars, China's Rise, Russia's Invasion, and the Struggle to Defend the West. He's also written two other New York Times bestsellers. He's been bureau chief in Tokyo. He was Washington economic correspondent, the White House correspondent during the Clinton and Bush administrations, and indeed the chief Washington correspondent. So we couldn't have a better interlocutor and moderator for this conversation. And with that, it is my pleasure um, to welcome Ambassador Julie Smith and David Sanger um, to the stage to begin the day's proceedings. Thank you very much. for later. Uh, well, good morning, and uh, thanks for coming out early on a uh, Monday morning, and uh, thank you to Joel for that lovely introduction. Uh, it is a real pleasure and an honor to open this conference, NATO at 75, charting a new course, and I'm very much looking forward to your questions uh, in a few minutes. For three quarters of a century, NATO has been a cornerstone of international peace and security, uniting nations in a collective commitment to mutual defense and to our shared values. NATO's success story really is remarkable, and it's one that was by no means preordained. The fact that in 2024, 75 years after it was founded, the alliance is bigger, stronger, and more united, speaks to the alliance's adaptability. It speaks to NATO's resilience. But it also speaks to the commitment and the courage of millions of soldiers, sailors, aviators that operate together under the NATO umbrella. 
But I think it also speaks to the attractiveness of NATO's core values, democracy, individual liberty, and the rule of law. Now, I don't have enough time this morning here to go through all of NATO's many achievements over the last seven decades. And there'll be several panels throughout the day where folks will be allowed to look at the alliance from different angles. It looks like a superb uh, conference and series of discussions, and I congratulate the organizers. But what I do want to do this morning is I want to walk us through all that has happened inside the NATO alliance over just the last two years since Russia launched its unprovoked war of aggression in Ukraine. These last two years, have in many ways been transformative, and I don't use that word lightly. I don't think there's a better word to describe what's happened across the NATO alliance since the war started. And I think they've showcased time and time again NATO's agility and its innovation. So let me walk you through five big changes that we've seen again just in the last two years. First, after many, many years of focusing on expeditionary operations, or you'll remember in the 1990s, they were often referred to as out of area operations, the alliance has come home and returned to its core mandate of collaboration collective defense. And it's taken a series of dramatic steps to enhance its deterrence. Before the war even started, NATO allies were moving force posture into Eastern Europe. You'll remember that NATO, just a few months after the war started, announced four new multinational battalions on the eastern flank that were paired with the four that were created in the three Baltic states in Poland right after Russia went into Crimea in 2014. At the Vilnius summit, last year, the Alliance also rolled out new regional plans that provide clarity to all allies in terms of what's required to protect every inch of NATO territory. We're also working on an entirely new command and control structure, which I suspect General Covoli will talk about in his remarks later today. And we just finished conducting our largest military exercise since the Cold War, Steadfast Defender, with 90,000 NATO troops. And that exercise, for the first time in a long time, enabled us to exercise North North American troops moving across the Atlantic and into Europe to defend NATO territory. So that's point number one, dramatic shift or a coming home of sorts to collective defense and enhanced deterrence. Secondly, burden sharing has increased significantly in recent years. You'll remember that in 2014, all allies pledged to spend 2% of their GDP on their own national defense. That pledge was to last 10 years. That brings us to 2024. When we started the pledge 10 years ago, we had three countries in the alliance spending 2% of GDP on defense, and by last Last count, we don't know where we're going to end up by the end of this calendar year, but right now we have 20 allies that are meeting the 2% pledge. 20 allies. That is a significant increase over a decade. Of course, we want it to be all 32, and we're going to keep pushing until we get there. But the movement that we saw over the last two years, particularly by countries like Germany, that put an extra 100 billion euros on the table for their own defense after the war started speaks volumes about where we are on the subject of burden sharing. But when we talk about burden sharing, it's not just about 2% of GDP spending on national defense. Burden sharing also takes us to the question of Ukraine. And here, we're also seeing a remarkable level of burden sharing across the alliance. The United States over the last two years has provided roughly $74 billion worth of support to our friends in Ukraine. Our European allies collectively have provided somewhere around the order of $110 billion dollars worth of support to Ukraine. Every single member of the alliance is providing assistance to Ukraine, economic, humanitarian, 
and security assistance. So burden sharing is something that we have seen, an area where we have seen tremendous positive shifts just over the last two years. Third, NATO has added two new members. You'll remember right after the war started in the spring of 2022, there was a knock at the door and two countries that had hundreds of years of non-alignment decided to shift their national policy and request formal NATO membership. Not in five years, not in a decade, not in two years, but immediately. They wanted to start the process immediately. As you well know, Finland became an official member last spring and Sweden just joined officially and now has taken its seat at the table just a couple of weeks ago. And those two allies are already making many meaningful contributions to the alliance each and every day. Number four, NATO rolled out a new strategic concept in 2022. This is nothing new. NATO rewrites the strategic concept, its core mission statement, about once a decade. What was new about this particular strategic concept was that in addition to mentioning the two core threats that the alliance is facing, Russia and terrorism, for the first time in NATO's history, the strategic concept mentions the PRC, challenges associated with the PRC for NATO member states, and the importance of deepening our partnerships with our friends in the Indo-Pacific. Now, why is NATO doing this? Does it have aspirations to become a global alliance and add new members in the Indo-Pacific? Absolutely not. That's not the plan. The, our Indo-Pacific partners don't have an interest in joining the alliance, and the alliance is not looking to go global. But what we see is increased utility in working together with our friends in the Indo-Pacific on a number of shared security challenges that really have no geographic boundaries. Disinformation, malicious cyber attacks, or emerging and disruptive technology. We view these security challenges increasingly in one theater and not limited to just the Atlantic or the Pacific. And so NATO is moving out, while it's focused on the war in Ukraine, it is moving out to deepen these important partnerships with our friends in the Indo-Pacific to share best practices and insights on those shared challenges. Finally, NATO, while it has been addressing the challenges in Ukraine and coping with the Russian threat has taken a series of unprecedented steps to address a wide range of emerging and future challenges. And I'll give you a couple of examples. We have new initiatives across the alliance in two new domains, cyber and space. You'll remember when NATO was created, we focused on land, sea, and air. And now increasingly, the alliance is moving out to focus on security threats that exist in cyberspace and in space proper. NATO also recently announced a 1 billion euro innovation fund to protect our collective technological edge. NATO is in the process of building something called the Defense Innovation Accelerator for the North Atlantic, which has the handy name of Diana, to solve critical defense challenges both with the private sector and with academic institutions. We have expanded our work across the NATO alliance on climate security, but also resilience. We've identified eight key areas, such as our telecommunication networks, our health systems, or continuity of government, that must remain resilient in the face of any potential attacks. And last summer, we just announced something called the Defense Production Action Plan to ensure that NATO has the industrial capacity and the capabilities that it needs to support its defense plans. So taken together, what does all of this mean for this alliance? The enhanced deterrence, the new resourcing we're seeing, the new members that are still trying to join this alliance, the deeper partnerships with our friends in the Indo-Pacific, and all of the new initiatives that we're rolling out to cope with future challenges. Well, it tells us that at 75, this alliance remains relevant, it remains resilient, and it remains ready for the future. 
And that's why we look forward to hosting this year's anniversary summit right here in Washington, D.C., July 9th through 11th, where we will no doubt celebrate 75 years of historic achievements, our strong transatlantic bond, and NATO's vital importance in defending against future threats. Now, in addition to the celebration, we, of course, will be spending a lot of time at the summit focused on Ukraine. I can't predict, none of us can, with any certainty what the war will look like come July. But here's what we do know. All 32 heads of state will be traveling to Washington, D.C. in July to showcase their unwavering unity, their unwavering resolve in helping Ukraine win. We will send a strong signal to President Putin that he can't wait us out. We're not distracted that we're not looking away, and we may remain focused on Ukraine's immediate and future security needs. And we will take concrete steps at the summit to move Ukraine closer to the alliance and build a bridge to NATO membership. And of course, in addition to Ukraine, the Alliance will be making a series of new announcements on many of the subjects I just mentioned. We're rolling out new initiatives as it relates to cyber, to resilience, to climate security, and yes, defense production as well. So let me close just with this. Sometimes I encounter folks that wonder whether NATO's 75 years, whether or not that's some sort of liability. And I have a very short answer uh, on those types of questions. NATO's 75 years of experience, that is not a liability, that is an asset. 75 years of working towards consensus with our closest allies day after day on NATO's core mandate and our future mandates has made unity our greatest strength. Yes, working with 31 other allies day in and day out does have its challenges. It's not always easy to get 32 nations to agree around the table. But when allies put their full weight behind an issue or a position or a new initiative, there's no question that it has both regional and global implications. I think Madeleine Albright, formerly a, a professor here, of course, and our first female Secretary of State, said it best when she said, we know that when democracies, when the democracies of Europe and America are divided, crevices are created through which forces of evil and aggression may emerge. But when we stand together, there's no force on earth more powerful than our solidarity on behalf of freedom. And that's it right there. It's our solidarity, the solidarity that makes NATO stronger and has made NATO one of the most successful alliances in history and one that has made the alliance ready for tomorrow's challenges. Thank you very much. I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ambassador Smith. Thank you, everyone, uh, to be here. Just so you, um, I'm David Sanger from the New York Times, and um, just so that uh, you understand the order of the next uh, few minutes, um, Ambassador and I are gonna talk for about a half an hour, and then we're gonna go out to questions for everybody. There are a couple of microphones lined up, or at least one I see here, where you can um, stand for, for your questions. So thank you for this. Thanks for coming thank all you. the way from Brussels. Yeah. It's great to see you again in a previous life. I, uh, <laughs> we, uh, we, we had offices next to each other. Um, Indeed. Uh, but uh, it was hard to imagine then that you'd be ambassador to NATO. <laughs> 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 I'm still doing the same thing I was doing. Uh, so, um, so let me um, start with your um, comments about what it is that we've learned in the past two years, because it has been an extraordinary moment for NATO. And I think you summarized it well, that there were um, years, decades really, where they were doing expeditionary out of area operations. Right. There was a lot of debate within NATO. Is this really what we were created for? There was some debate, do we need NATO anymore? Um, there were my favorite conversations that I dug up uh, when I was working on, on New Cold Wars, uh, the book that you heard referenced before, the internal discussions 
mostly in the Bush administration, about whether you could bring Russia into NATO. And the Russian NATO Council gave them an office inside the NATO headquarters. I think that's gone. It is gone. Yeah, it is yeah. gone. Um, so that takes you to the question of what we have learned, what, what we were surprised by and what we've learned. So you gave us some of the great strengths that they've come together. There are three things that strike me that took NATO by surprise, and I wanted to run them, run through them because it will give us a sense of how they've reacted. In the opening days of the war, um, or in the run-up to the war, I should say, a lot of European leaders, even the weekend before the war at the Munich Security Conference, were telling me, were telling you, were telling Secretary Blinken, the Russians are just bluffing. They're not really going to do this. Their economic interests are so great in providing gas and oil, they would never take this risk. Sure, he's just trying to get a negotiated solution. What lessons have emerged from the fact that while the United States provided the intelligence and the Europeans believed the intelligence, they didn't believe our assessment of the intelligence? Yeah, you're, you're right. Um, I, this was an interesting time for me because I was confirmed in November of 2021, and that was right in the thick of, I think it was early fall 2021, when we had taken, the Biden administration had taken this decision to share an unprecedented amount of intelligence with our closest allies to read them in to what we thought was a clear indication that they weren't just bluffing. This wasn't just posturing. They were preparing to go to war. And so I landed in Brussels in late uh, that November, late uh, 2021. And I frankly didn't quite know what to expect. I guess my assumption going in was that with the United States putting this information on the table, the debates would shift and that we would all then sing from the same song sheet. Um, but in fact, what happened is exactly what you're describing. There were many allies around the table that were saying, come on, we hear what you're saying. We appreciate the fact that you've shared this level of intelligence with us. Many Many times, not just in one instance, but we were keeping the allies. And you were abreast. beginning to make it public because they were calling reports. That's right. In as well. That's right. Yeah. No. And and we were making it public. Absolutely. It wasn't just with our closest allies. Um, but then uh, one of my most vivid memories is when the phone rang on February 22nd at 3 a.m. It kind of felt, you know, we always talk about the 3 a.m. phone call uh, in the United States. It literally rang around that time. And we went in for the emergency North Atlantic Council meeting. Before the meeting got started, one of my colleagues from Eastern Europe raised his hand. Um, and before we were going to launch into a series of, t of steps, we were activating NATO's graduated response plans and activating the NATO response force, flurry of activity. He said, I just need to say, put his head out, look down the table at me, and said, I didn't believe you. I d I yeah. Secretary Blinken I has, has said similar. Um, but sorry, is, so what, but, but what that did, so the fact that tragically Russia decided to go forward with this war, there were several diplomatic efforts. You'll remember the trips to Geneva. There was the NATO-Russia Council at NATO headquarters on January 12th with Grushko around the table at the North Atlantic Council. So we had made efforts to encourage them to take another path. They did not. The war starts. There was a shift inside the alliance in that there was suddenly a different approach and attitude towards US intelligence after that moment. It had created a situation where the US had built up a considerable amount of credibility because we had shared the intelligence, called it out, and tragically, it had come to pass that from that moment forward, as the US continued to share intelligence, about Russian plans, what their strategy, what was happening on the ground, and what we envisioned would be next steps. Then
then you could see the Allies' attention and focus on what was being presented by U.S. briefers. So there was a significant shift from one day to the next across the alliance. Do you think it was all lasting? In other words, do you think now the intel between the U.S. and the other NATO members, the agreement on, on assessment has fundamentally changed? I think it's fundamentally changed, and the changes that we saw two years ago are still ever present today inside the NATO alliance in terms of with the seriousness with which allies look at and consider U.S. intelligence. There were two other areas that jumped out at me from my reporting on this period, one in the oldest of tech and one in the newest. Europe had pretty much stopped making conventional ammunition of the artillery shells of the kind you've seen fired. Um, and the Ukrainians, while the US and Microsoft and Amazon World Services and others did a fabulous job moving the Ukrainian government to the cloud, there had been no planning for how they were gonna to communicate to the cloud. Now, Elon Musk stepped in and you know, solve this one, but one, that's not, that was not part of the plan. So I'm wondering if you can just sort of bring us up to date on both the ammunition side and the communication cyber side of this. Yeah, so, sorry, desperately need some caffeine here. Um, uh, so two things. Um, First and foremost, on what was happening in Europe before the war and post-war. So one of the hardest lessons, I think, of the war in Ukraine for the NATO allies is a deeper appreciation and understanding of the brittleness of the transatlantic defense industrial base. And some of the shortages that we were seeing because of an aging and kind of shrinking um, workforce across that defense industrial base. And so so what we thought were NATO standards that would enable us all to have the stocks necessary to cope with any potential contingency, I think Ukraine opened our eyes to the reality that first and foremost, we needed to have a lot more on hand, um, but also that we needed to open up those production lines that we had shuttered um, many, many years ago and rethink about how we would, we're still in the process of doing this, backfill the shortages that now exist across the alliance because of the critical assistance that's been provided to our friends in Ukraine. So that defense production piece is front and center for us as a transatlantic project. We've seen some remarkable steps forward in just two short years, but my goodness, we have a lot more work to do ahead of us. Let me just cite one amazing example, the checks. The Czechs used to produce about 10,155s per year. They are now, two years later, producing 100,155s annually. So that's one example. There's many more. What Rheinmetall has done in Germany over the last year or so has also been impressive. We've done a lot to increase production here in the United States, especially on ammunition, but frankly, across many systems. But on Ukraine, the Ukraine piece of it, there, there's a very, an interesting set of different lessons that we've learned from them and we're learning in real time, and that is this war with Russia that the Ukrainians are in the middle of you know, defending their territory has brought emerging tech into what sometimes feels, and I know General Milley has this great quote that's in your book, that it feels, it's trench warfare. It feels not like World War II, there's an element of that with tanks rolling back and forth, but the trench warfare really brings us back to World War I, and yet the Ukrainians are pairing new technology and drones, they're using apps, you know, swipe right for more ammunition. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable what the Ukrainians have done in terms of attaching new technology to basically Soviet legacy uh, equipment. So on that side of things, 
yes, they're feeling now the pinch and the, the shortfalls that exist in Europe and in the United States, but they've also continued to innovate throughout the war and use technology to their advantage. And that's why NATO just recently created this something called JTAC, which is going to allow us to work with the Ukrainians and extract lessons learned on how they are fighting the Russians. What does modern day combat with the Russians actually look like? No one knows that better than our friends in Ukraine right now. And how it has pieces of a sci-fi movie, and yet it also has pieces of World War I conventional warfare. It's interesting that you, you say that. And in fact, I, I was going to ask you, and you uh, had it right, about the Millie um, quote. He, He's colorful, and I'll cut out a little bit of the colorful wording. Because um, as he always says, he speaks army as his first uh, language. But um, he said, um, trench warfare. For a while, we thought this would be a cyber war. Then we thought it was looking like an old-fashioned World War II tank war. And then there are days when I th thought they were fighting World War I. Exactly. And the fact of the matter is, I mean, I, I said this in my words, not his. It is part 1941, uh, 1914, part 1941, and part 2024. Completely. So, uh, that's, that's exactly it. That's is NATO now, does it have its head around that alteration in that you are doing something that mixes these three years? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's, first and foremost, we're obviously working to extract those lessons learned and what it means for the alliance. We're increasing production. We have thought increasingly about how NATO standards need to continue to drive and send signals to defense industry. You know, if NATO says, for example, let me pick a random number, um, you know, NATO mandates that all members must have, let's say, 30 days of ammunition, and then suddenly says, not 30 days, six months, a year, three months, whatever it is, and dramatically increases what the NATO standard is that all allies have to meet, it obviously then sends the right signal to industry that, hey, this has a future, and this it, it merits reopening these old lines. Because the, the answer you get from defense industry so often now, when we pound on their doors and say, please produce more and faster, both for our own stocks and for our friends in Ukraine, they often say, well, you need it right now. Will you need it next year? And we've seen this movie before where NATO allies think they need a certain capability and then they back off it or they pivot to something else or planning dictates a, a different set of requirements. And so we're trying to take a long, hard look at what those NATO standards are. Um, it, particularly as we refill our stocks based on the assistance we've provided, but then to send the right signals that this will be a lasting project for the alliance. The way we see it, this will be, the defense production piece of it will be, you know, over the next decade, we're going to be working on not only ensuring that we have the stocks necessary to counter any potential threat, but to backfill and continue to get the Ukrainians what they need. So this is expensive. What you, yeah, what you were describing. Indeed. And I know you were celebrating the 2% marker for 20 of the 32 countries, but that 2% marker was set 10 years ago. Correct. And I just spent, as you know, a couple of months in Berlin and um, spent some time with the German defense officials about their plans to do exactly what you've just described. And while the plans are impressive, you can't do it for the 72 billion euros a year that they spend on defense. Hard for me to say this with any accuracy, but I have my doubts whether you could do it for twice what they're spending. And yet the political conversation in Europe, including in Germany, has not caught up with the cost of doing what you've just described. Yes. there's. Good news and bad news. Good news is we're hitting 2%. Bad news is 2% won't do it anymore. Well, it's interesting. Look at, if you go back and look at the language from the Vilnius summit last summer, what did we say about 
we said that it is a floor, not a ceiling. And we said that because increasingly, when we look at what's going to be required for the future, we increasingly believe that additional resources above and beyond every country hitting 2% are going to be needed. And Secretary Austin has been clear about that. No doubt General Cavoli will mention it again later today. And what are we seeing in Europe? We're seeing countries now stretch to 3%. We have a number of countries that are already at 25 not just the Baltic states, by the way, Romania, some of our friends in the Nordic countries, I mean, a whole array of countries now are looking at 3%, and the polls are talking about 4%. Now, obviously, with the polls, because they're right there on the edge of what's happening in, in Ukraine, they feel this war in ways others maybe don't feel it so uh, acutely. But it is a conversation that is occurring across the alliance day in, day out, about whether or not, even when we all hit 2%, whether or not that will be sufficient. Because you're right to point out that not only to do the backfill work that we have to do, but to prepare for all contingencies, including in some of those new areas that I mentioned, it's going to require resourcing. So the bill in Congress right now, the $64 billion, uh, if you get it, still an if, um, much of the ammunition, as I read that bill, is just going to backfilling for things we've already given them. It wouldn't actually result in more ammo going immediately to the Ukrainians. It's right? both, it's both. And that's why we have to get the supplemental done. It's absolutely critical that we get this through Congress. The Ukrainians need this support desperately. They need to have US continued leadership. They need these resources. We wanna make sure that they don't go into the summer rationing their ammunition or facing any unnecessary shortfalls. We wanna put them in the best position possible to face well, they're already any rationing counter ammunition, aren't they? They are rationing. There are some shortages currently um, that they are grappling with. And I very much hope, we all hope, that that supplemental will get through no later than the end of this month. So um, let's talk for a moment about something you raised at the end of your discussion, which is the delicate dance about how you talk about admitting NATO eventually, uh, admitting Ukraine eventually into NATO. Um, no secret there's big division within the NATO alliance on this. The Eastern Europeans are pretty clear and we're clear in Vilnius. They want them in basically now. The president and Chancellor Schultz were basically the two leaders who were most vocal on the question that you cannot admit a country while it is in the midst of war. Um, and it sounds, from what I'm hearing, like they want to take the wording they used in Vilnius, which is vague about when Ukraine would get admitted, and move very similar wording forward for the 75th anniversary. Um, President Zelensky came in pretty hot to the Vilnius meeting after, after this, if you read his tweets, as all of you were. Um, <laughs> Tell us how you're managing this. Well, look, in Vilnius, we did a lot. We came together. It wasn't easy. It had some challenges. Allies have different perspectives on this, as, as you noted. Um, but we did come together, and we did a couple of things. First and foremost, we said to the Ukrainians, there's no question about membership. You will become a member of this alliance. Your future place is in NATO and we will continue to work to get there. We also made clear that there are a number of reforms that they need to undertake uh, to be granted full-fledged membership, and that's a challenge that all aspirants have faced. And they are making good progress. And in fact, we just had Secretary Blinken in Brussels last week, and we were able to get a report from the Ukrainians on all that they're doing on their governance and security reforms. And it's an impressive list for a country in the middle of a war to continue to make progress, for example, on anti-corruption is extremely admirable. So we applaud those efforts, and we want to encourage them to keep going. But we also, in addition to basically saying to them, look, NATO will agree to full-fledged membership for Ukraine when conditions are met and when allies agree, and that holds for this summer and summit. And when the war ends. Right. Or is at when least the, at a stopping point. Exactly. But 
what we did do is we created the new NATO Ukraine Council, where Ukraine comes in and sits as an equal around the table and is able to share firsthand impressions and insights from the war. We can hear what their requirements are, but we can also talk about a variety of other subjects. We've had meetings of the NATO Ukraine Council on attacks on critical infrastructure. We've talked to them about cyber attacks and looked for ways to provide additional assistance. But we did another important thing last year, and that was to lift map, the membership action plan that many new members have gone through, which can be a bit of a lengthy process, um, we remove that entirely and said, you will not have a membership action plan. You will proceed towards a session when the timing is right. So your question is, well, what are you going to do this summer on top of what you already did last summer if membership isn't on the table? And there, we will have a concrete deliverable for Ukraine. I can't can't get into the full details of that at this juncture, but we're working on a way to get them on what we're calling a bridge to membership by deepening NATO's work with the Ukrainians on questions of interoperability, on modernization, providing uh, additional resources to our friends in Ukraine, and institutionalizing some of the bilateral support that has been provided to date. You mentioned cyber. Um, before the war broke out, several years before the war broke out, um, NATO uh, agreed that a major cyber attack on a member would constitute something that could trigger Article 5. Um, tell us a little bit about what you have seen the Russians doing, both how they're using cyber inside Ukraine, where at moments the cyber attacks and the kinetic attacks seem timed together, and what you're seeing outside of Ukraine, where I think we had probably expected a more active Russian attack surface in the NATO nations. We've seen some, but not dramatically higher than the background noise of normal cyber conflict. Well, I guess the way I would describe that is it has, in essence, been a steady state. Um, the Russians, this is one of their favorite tools um, of the variety of hybrid tactics on which they regularly rely. Malicious cyber attacks is a play that, that we've seen them rely on time and time again. Obviously, to have an impact inside Ukraine, on the battlefield, with the Ukrainian public, to create political strategic dilemmas for presidents Zelensky to drive disinformation. They also use uh, disinformation on a, on a regular basis as well. Um, but cyber security and cyber attacks is a regular part of what we cope with across the alliance. It's ever present. It's not just up and down the eastern flank. I'd be hard pressed to find an ally that hasn't dealt with some sort of cyber attack in the last couple of years. And oh, by the way, the amount of learning that's happening between the PRC and Russia in this space is staggering. Those two actors increase increasingly learn from each other and rely on that cyber instrument to divide the NATO alliance from within, to divide uh, Europe from the United States, You're to create about vulnerability. In well, info wars, but also cyber attacks on our government structures, on secure mm -hmm. systems, um, on what the Ukrainians are doing on the battlefield. So what is NATO doing about it? NATO started first and foremost with protecting its own networks. That was project number one, and declaring cyber a new domain, which happened in 2016, as you noted. And then from there, last year, we built a virtual cyber response capability under which an ally that is under attack can knock on NATO's door and say, what's available here in terms of, I need forensics help. I need help patching a system. I've got part of my government that's offline. What can NATO provide me on the fly? And there we have this virtual response, kind of almost like a Chinese menu of, you know, a, a whole array of options that you can hand to an ally and say, this is available to you today. We have have you enacted this and made use of it? Well. So far? Yes. Yeah. I don't want to get into details about that, but yeah, we've, we've put it to good use. Um, 
And now at this summit, what we're also going to be focused on, we're going to have four or five new cyber deliverables at the Washington summit. We're working on building better capacity at the national level across the alliance. As you know better than anyone, we have NATO members that are best in class when it comes to preventing, deterring, um, uh, detecting cyber attacks, and we have allies that are catching up. And so we're, we want to bring the capacity of all allies up to the same level when it comes to counter defense. Of your issue. NATO members, the US and Britain have pretty extensive offensive cyber capability, have written about it over many years. Do you envision NATO having an offensive cyber capability as well? We're not talking about that at this juncture. Okay. Um, let's turn a little bit. You raised the Chinese cooperation with the Russians in cyber, but obviously it's much broader than that. I would say one of the surprises of this era is that the partnership without limits that turned out to have some limits that uh, was announced by President Xi and President Putin is one of the major dynamics of superpower conflict now. It's also what um, Nixon and Kissinger spent decades or years anyway trying to avoid. That was the opening, the motivation for the opening to China or a major one. Um, two years into this, because that was announced at the, at the Olympics in, or just before the Olympics. That's right, yeah. Prior to the invasion in 2022. Um, how do you assess the level of Chinese and Russian cooperation? And I guess I'll throw the Iranians in as well, because obviously they've been providing a lot of battlefield help, drone help to the Russians. Yes, and let's not forget DPRK um, as well. I mean, the amount of assistance that the DPRK has provided to their friends in Russia has also had a major impact on the You're war. You're talking mostly Ukraine. artillery, a mm -hmm. little bit of missiles. Yeah. So you've got you the Iranians think it has had a, you providing. You had a major impact. I think it has had an impact. Why don't we leave it there? Um, and certainly something that the allies increasingly talk about. Mm -hmm. But this brings us back to the theme that I mentioned earlier. Why does NATO invest so much, or why is NATO investing so much right now in these partnerships with Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand? Because we have so much to learn from one another about what the DPRK is doing to support Russia in this moment. We can talk about the PRC, not direct lethal support, but there's an indication that they're providing providing some sort of material support through dual use components. And we talk a lot about that uh, across the alliance and with our Indo-Pacific partners. And then of course, as you noted, the Iranian piece as well, as well where they've, they've provided a whole array of, of very effective lethal drones um, to their friends. And, in, in the US has been doing a lot to try to, and allies, to try to interrupt that supply chain for the drones. Uh, sanctions of many kind and so forth. How effective is that being? Do you think that there's been any impact on the Iranian ability to produce? I know they're now trying to produce um, Iranian factories in Russia. Yeah, we do believe that there has been an impact. I mean, it's, it's an ongoing project for the transatlantic partners. The sanctions piece obviously isn't handled by the NATO alliance, and I'm sure Mark Gittenstein, our ambassador to the European Union, could get up here and tell you why the last two years have also been incredibly transformative for the US-EU relationship because of what's happened in Ukraine. The amount of work that we've done with the European Union on sanctions, on support for our friends, uh, in Ukraine has also been um, just absolutely remarkable. But back to your, your question about the, the PRC and, and Russia, we do find ourselves across the alliance increasingly grappling with this question of how do we draw attention each of us bilaterally in our relationship with the PRC to call them out on this material support, to apply pressure not to continue to provide that kind of support, and make sure that they understand the consequences if they continue down this path. And I think it's been a very effective area of work for all the transatlantic partners. We're seeing many countries across Europe 
be much more um, forthcoming in calling out the Chinese for this no limits partnership with Russia, but also for their political support to what Russia is doing in Ukraine and that material support that I just mentioned. Um, the core of the NATO security guarantees since NATO's creation 75 years ago has basically been the American nuclear deterrent. Um, and yet we have seen in the past two years a revival of nuclear threats that are worrisome. Uh, I describe in the book the scare in October of 2022 when you and your colleagues were quite concerned. In fact, some of your colleagues said 50-50 chance that Russia would detonate a nuclear weapon in a battlefield nuclear weapon in Ukraine. Um, First, tell us a little bit about how that experience may have been transforming for the NATO members. Were they as fully aware as the US was of the nature of this threat? And then let's talk a little bit about how it may be changing the way NATO's thinking about nuclear strategy. Well, yeah, so a couple of things on that. First, when we rewrote the strategic concept in 2022, you see when you read the document, I mean, nuclear deterrence remains the backbone of NATO's deterrence policy, no question. And our wording on that is very, very clear. As long as nuclear weapons exist, NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. So that's not going anywhere. And the language on that, I think, was crystal clear. But I think you're right to point out that with the war in Ukraine and all of this nuclear saber rattling that we've seen on the part of President Putin, we now have gotten into kind of almost a review of what nuclear deterrence involves, what it means. We're working day in, day out to raise what we call our nuclear IQ. It's like dusting off, you know. I mean, just the whole theory of deterrence, I would say, came back to the forefront when the war started. Uh, and we were back right where NATO started 75 years ago. So obviously, we take what Putin says seriously. And the US was able to share but more with our allies to help them understand what we were seeing. But honestly, it's what Putin has been saying that's gotten everyone's attention. He's been very public about this. Medvedev has been very outspoken on um, the potential use of tactical nuclear weapons in Ukraine. And not as much recently, but you're right, in the early stages of the war, we heard a lot about the potential use of tactical uh, nuclear weapons. And so you can imagine what the reaction was around the Alliance, we were deeply concerned. At the same time, I think the US made it very clear publicly, but also privately with our, our, uh, our closest allies, that we didn't see any clear indication that the Russians were actually preparing to use nuclear weapons. Not then, not now. And so we take this nuclear saber rattling seriously. We continue to monitor the situation. We're in close contact with all of our allies up and down the eastern flank that obviously are gravely concerned about this prospect. But we have also one, reassured our allies about what we were seeing, whether or not anything, we were seeing any signs of weapons being moved closer to the border, um, but also just the need to continually warn the Russians that there would be serious, I think Jake Sullivan said, catastrophic consequences should Russia opt to do so. Well, that October 2022 period, which President Biden compared to the Cuban Missile Crisis at a fundraiser in New York. If you always want to hear him at his most candid, you <laughs> get, the, get the fundraisers. It um, uh, was a pretty searing moment. Uh, I mean, they did not move any nuclear weapons, as you say. They did hear commanders discussing the possibility, and that made a big, made a big difference. Um, a last question for you as we um, think out about uh, the summit that is um, coming forward. Um, there are the assurances that you can put on paper. There are the capabilities that you can build, and you've described to us how you're doing that. But the political atmosphere makes a big difference to allies' conviction that the US would be there should they need to invoke Article 5. Um, 
you've heard what one candidate said publicly about what he would do if somebody hadn't paid, you know, paid up. I assume he meant, but it's hard to know the two percent uh, bit. But separate and apart from candidate Trump's, you know, arguments, there is in Europe today, in part because of our own hesitance in passing the the Ukraine bill and all that, a questioning about whether or not the political body of the United States is as committed to NATO as it was before. The Republican Party has several prominent members who have expressed their doubts, both about aid to Ukraine and some about NATO. They may be just voicing uh, noise out here, and I suspect the majority of the party still has its old views. Um, this must be a problem that both drives you crazy and you can't do anything about. <laughs> because all you can do is work on the capability side, not on the political will side. Well, that's not entirely true. Um, I think it's on all of us, those of us that work on NATO issues to continue to make the case. And uh, I, last year I traveled throughout my home state, state of Michigan, to have conversations um, with the governor, with um, a variety of student groups. I went to both University of Michigan, Michigan State. I was able to do talk radio, do, a, a lot of outreach to try and answer those questions about why do we still have the NATO alliance and why should we keep supporting Ukraine? And I'm heading off to Ohio tomorrow to yeah. do the same thing. So um, some of it's out of my control and I was sure you were gonna ask this question, but here's what I uh, say when I get this question frequently. So there's two concerns about the United States that you hear on the other side of the Atlantic. One is, are you gonna get the supplemental done or is US support for Ukraine over? Is, is it now on us? Will Europeans have to take over and provide the remaining assistance to Ukraine? Uh, and two, um, can we count on seven more decades of U.S. presidents of all political stripes standing up and committing and supporting the NATO alliance. And I think my answer on both fronts is pretty optimistic. One, I think we have visitors coming through from Congress almost every week, delegations that are made up of Republicans and Democrats traveling together, and all I hear from them time and time again is, we're gonna get the supplemental done, we need to continue funneling support. There's a broad base of support in the House, in the Senate, it's bipartisan to continue supporting Ukraine. There are members in the House we all know that are skeptical, don't wanna see the supplemental go through, but by and large, when that vote comes to the floor, we're confident that we're going to get it If you can get, get it to it the through. floor, you think. Have to get it to the floor. That's the challenge. Two, on broad U.S. support for the alliance, I'll say public opinion data, actually the most recent poll that came out, shows that U.S. support for the NATO alliance is up. It seems that folks increasingly understand why this alliance serves U.S. interests and why it serves our allies' interests, and that bumper sticker that we say a lot, stronger together, isn't just a bumper sticker, it's the truth. Coping with Ukraine is something we need to do with 50 other countries around the world in terms of providing valuable security assistance. Coping with instability elsewhere in the world requires us to work with our closest allies and partners. It's not just Ukraine. So I think fundamentally Americans understand the value of alliances and the importance of the NATO alliance in particular. Um, but also I'll say when I travel um, around the United States and encounter um, uh, Americans in places far away from Washington, D.C., I think, again, there is this kind of bipartisan support that it's, it's NATO is not a partisan issue. I mean, it, it always, I suppose, has the risk of going in that direction like any foreign policy subject. But from where I sit right now, whether I'm traveling across the United States or engaging with delegations in Congress or doing press interviews with talk radio outlets, I mean, I think NATO enjoys a privileged place in American foreign policy that by and large the majority of Americans understand why it was created and why it's still relevant 70 years later. And that's what we're gonna be trying to do at the summit this summer. Great. 
Well, if people would like to line up, uh, and I think what we're going to do is probably take two questions at a time, since our, our time is short. Um, the ambassador revealed um, uh, in the course that the depth of her diplomatic skills that she went to both Michigan and Michigan State uh, doing doing this that outreach that, yes for outreach. my outreach speeches yes. yes I didn't study at both no I I understand that but, but now it's just, nice to be even here. just attending the two you know to, yeah. <laughs> for, for a day tells you of your skills here okay why don't we take the first two questions here thank you uh, so uh, Jason Davidson from the University of Mary Washington and the Atlantic Council um, last week the Secretary General confirmed that at the Washington summit. Uh, the Alliance will put forward its first southern flank strategy. Now, some people uh, would look at that and say, well, the Alliance has a really big problem on its eastern flank, so why is it messing around on the southern flank? So could you say a little bit about why the Alliance and why the United States should care about the southern flank of the Alliance and what specifically you would like to see in the southern flank strategy at uh, the Washington summit? Great, and we'll take the one right behind you. Hi, uh, thank you for an interesting discussion and raising the points on sanctions. Uh, I was wondering uh, when you came to the point of the sanctions effectiveness. So actually when we talk about sanction effectiveness, uh, uh, it comes to my mind, uh, and we do research also on how effective sanctions are about evasion, because Russia is evading sanctions with the use of many, many countries especially like from the former Soviet bloc, like Central Asia, Caucasus, and, and uh, China, you know. Uh, and uh, what, what, what is the philosophies, you know, that you have, and how, how is addressed at the NATO level and maybe at the go US government level? My name is Duru Warkenbeck, and I'm from Center of uh, Political and Global uh, uh, Strategies. Great, so let me start with the South. Um, it was a good question. Um, you know, we have, uh, a kind of a phrase that we use around the NATO alliance that we have a 360 degree approach, which means that the alliance is not exclusively focused on the North Atlantic or its southern flank or its eastern flank, that we simultaneously try to take on all of those areas. And those new regional plans that I mentioned in my remarks actually divides the all NATO territory into three different regions, and there is a region General Cavoli can say more about this, that has very detailed plans for NATO South on how to defend against any potential forms of instability or any attack uh, on NATO's southern flank. But there is a question on the table, and that is, while the alliance is focused on the war in Ukraine, what more can the alliance be doing to address some of the potential challenges or threats that emanate from the South? And there, there's a whole array of things to talk about. And it won't surprise you to hear that our southern member states, from Portugal and Spain to Greece and Turkey, to Italy, a whole array of countries want to see the alliance fortify its initiatives and policies in this particular area. So late last year, we appointed a group of experts, um, a small group of policymakers and academics with deep experience in handling some of those southern challenges. And they just recently came to the NATO alliance and presented us with over 100 different ideas of what the alliance could do to move out and strengthen its deterrence and defense and the way in which it protects its southern flank. Now, NATO is in the middle of debating those over 100 recommendations, and there's a lot of good ideas there. Um, there are small things, and there are bigger, more ambitious initiatives. But between now and July, the allies are going to have to settle on just a handful of initiatives that will enable us to deliver on something for the South. And as I noted also earlier, there's two chief threats that we're facing inside the NATO alliance, Russia and terrorism. And so we want to ensure that NATO continues to do good work in both of those spaces 
fortifying its deterrence and defense to counter both of those threats. So I don't want to get into where the US position is on those 100 plus recommendations. I really can't get into the details of that because we are literally right in the middle of debating uh, all of those good recommendations. But you're right to note that the alliance will have something more to say about its southern flank. And the reason I think that's important, I think why the Secretary General thinks it's important, is to showcase to any would-be adversary or actor that we are prepared for all contingencies. This is an alliance that can, as the old adage goes, walk, chew, uh, walk and chew gum at the same time. And so, as, as I said, NATO is addressing what's happening in Ukraine, but simultaneously moving out on an array of, of new initiatives. On the, on the sanctions question, I mean, again, NATO doesn't take on sanctions per se. This is not part of our chief work strand inside the alliance, so I'm hesitant to get into it. Um, I, I will say that we believe that the unprecedented unprecedented sanctions that both Europe and the United States have imposed since the start of the war has had an impact. There are instances where we see evasion and we continue to work with our closest partners in Europe through the G7, through the US-EU relationship and other bilateral relationships to get at the heart of that, to prevent it from happening. And it remains a key feature of what we work on with our transatlantic partners. But we believe the sanctions that uh, have been put on the table since the war started, have left the Russians with $400 billion less than they would have normally to put towards this military operation. And the fact that the Russians are now turning to countries like the DPRK or Iran or the PRC for capabilities and technology says a lot about what the West has been able to do to shut off the flow of potential components that could help them pursue this war. By the way, the DPRK artillery, we're hearing upwards of half of it are duds. Is this what you are? There are instances where we see a significant level of, of what they provided actually not, 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 working. not working. No. Well, two more here. And then I think that may be bring us to the end. If we can make the questions very short and crisp, we're running down on time a little bit. Hi, uh, my name is Alexander Malakro. I'm an undergraduate here at the SFS. Um, my question is to do with defense procurement. Uh, Europe, Europe has stated its desire in EDIS and EDIP last month to increase its role in defense procurement, but one of the issues that European member states have is that while they procure to NATO standards, they each apply their national requirements onto those, onto those uh, procurements, so 13 different national variants of Leopard 2 tanks which restricts supply chains, uh, NATO logistics, ability to mobilize and fight together. I was wondering how NATO is approaching not just expanding the defense uh, industrial base and procurement, but also seeking to better uh, align capabilities to reduce those sort of stepping on each other's feet. Thank you. Okay, and one more question there. Hi, my name is Brad Morith. I'm from the, uh, I'm a historian with the uh, Office of the Historian Department of State. Uh, question is, um, the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan in 2022, uh, what impact did it have with U.S. relations with other NATO allies, and was there an impact here regarding intelligence sharing in the months lead up uh, to the start of the war in Ukraine um, regarding uh, U.S. intelligence sharing with allies? Thank you. Um, so on that question, um, you'll remember that I mentioned that I was confirmed in late November of 2021. So I actually was here at the State Department serving as a senior advisor to Secretary Blinken throughout most of 2021. I was not inside the NATO alliance at the time during the withdrawal um, from Afghanistan. And I feel like I'm probably the, not the, the 
the best person positioned to talk about that. On the, on the question of fragmentation across Europe's um, industrial base um, and the associated challenges um, that we're seeing as a result of, of underinvestment over, over many decades, I mean, this is, this is a challenge that NATO is going to have to work on very closely with the European Union. And we were pleased to see the European Union recently roll out a European defense industrial strategy. It's an, a very interesting um, piece of work that clearly, very clearly articulates the challenges that Europe faces for the foreseeable future when it comes to building up its defense industrial base and getting at duplication, some of the challenges, the fragmentation that were mentioned by um, the individual that, that asked the question. We do, however, want to ensure that as the European Union thinks about taking on a variety of new initiatives to build out defense production and build capacity, that it relies on NATO standards. The last thing we want to see is for the European Union to establish its own set of standards. We would then have situations where countries are looking at their own national standards and requirements. They're looking at what NATO's delivering in terms of what's mandated for, through NATO membership. And then there would be a new aspect to it with the European Union potentially putting a different set of standards on the table. So the European Union is reassuring us that they will rely on NATO standards. We want to keep it that way. And we also want to encourage our friends in the European Union, at least in the short term, as they look to build out capacity and address some of those shortfalls that we address at the top, that it continues to look at non-EU member states for ways to backfill. Now, I understand why the European Union wants to focus on EU members and building up their defense industrial base in Europe, but we have to work together. We have to find ways to aggregate demand. We have to look at multinational solutions that will help us produce faster and get more for ourselves and into the hands of our friends in Ukraine. Well, thank you. Um, I've got a list of more questions, but we are <laughs> running out of time. Okay. So uh, we will have to save them for the run up to the NATO summit or something like that. But uh, I thank you for spending all this time, both in your um, uh, prepared remarks and your very candid answers uh, here. And I hope that we've given a, a good start off for what looks like a really promising and, and interesting day. Thank you very much, David. And thanks all of you for coming out this morning. Thanks to Georgetown University. And uh, I hope the rest of the day goes well. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador Smith and Mr. Sanger for being with us here today. It was an honor to host you. We ask the audience to kindly remain in your seats as our speakers make their way out of Gaston. In the meantime, if you have not done so already, please submit your questions for the afternoon keynote with General Cavoli, Supreme Allied Commander Europe, using the QR codes displayed on the screens to your left and right. I'll give you a moment to do so. We are now going to take a short break. As a reminder, bathrooms are located outside Gaston on the first and fourth floors of Healy Hall. For those of us joining virtually, we will return at 9.45 with our first panel. Thank you.
Alrighty. Welcome back, everyone. If you don't mind taking your seats, we'll get started in just a moment. We are pleased to introduce our first panel of the day, NATO at 75, Looking Back, Looking Ahead. Joining us are Dr. Susan Colburn, Professor Heidi Hart, and Professor Sten Rinning. They will be joined in conversation with Leo Michelle, who will be moderating the discussion. Dr. Colburn is the Associate Director of the Program in American Grand Strategy at Duke University, and a historian specializing in transatlantic relations. She is the author of Euromissiles, The Nuclear Weapons That Nearly Destroyed NATO, published by Cornell University Press. Professor Heidi Hart is an Associate Professor of Political Science at the University of California, Irving, and recipient of the 2021-2022 Council on Foreign Relations International Affairs Fellowship. She is an expert in European security and defense and the author of two books published by Oxford University Press. NATO's Lessons in Crisis, Institutional Memory in, Na in International Organizations, and Time to React, the Efficiency of International Organizations in Crisis Response. Professor Sten Renning is Professor and Vice Dean for Research at the Faculty of Business and Social Sciences at the University of Southern Denmark. He is the author of several books on NATO, including one published just this month by Yale University Press, titled NATO from Cold War to Ukraine, a history of the world's most powerful alliance. And finally, Leo Michel is a non-resident senior fellow with the Finnish Institute of International Affairs and the Atlantic Council's Scowcroft Center for Security and Strategy. He served in the US government for 35 years in a variety of roles, including as a policy advisor for arms control and NATO issues in the office of the Secretary of Defense. Please join me in welcoming the panels to the stage. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> uh, th thank you very much. Uh, when Mark Twain, who was the renowned uh, humorist and essayist, was asked by a reporter about rumors of his failing health, Twain famously answered, reports of my death have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> and I think that NATO officials can certainly empathize with Twain's reaction because after all, over the past 75 years, NATO has had to navigate many serious tensions among its members. Uh, some of these were rooted in differences inside NATO about, for example, nuclear strategy, uh, the alliance structure and its operations, and others flowed from disagreements over policies of or actions by one or more allies outside uh, in regions or on issues outside of NATO's purview. And just to give you a flavor of uh, some of these not so important uh, disagreements, uh, during the 1950s, the Allies were struggling over the questions of German rearmament and its succession into NATO as the Federal Republic. They debated the implications of a massive, what was called the Massive Retaliation Doctrine, uh, and that, that approach to nuclear strategy. And there were very sharp divisions among Washington, Paris, and London during the 1956 Suez Crisis. The 1960s saw intense debates over the concept of flexible response and very bitter and long-lasting recriminations over France's withdrawal from NATO's integrated military structure. In the 1970s, two NATO allies, Turkey and Greece, nearly went to war uh, over the, the Cyprus issue. And the Euro missiles affair of the 1980s brought to the surface some long-lasting tensions and disagreements uh, among allied governments. This was fed by massive public protests that at times seemed to pose an existential threat to the alliance itself. But it's important, given that background, it's important to keep in mind that ultimately the alliance remained strong during and after the Cold War 
because its members did not allow their differences ever to override their enduring shared interests and values. And I think interests and values are both important, have been both important to NATO. But of course, a lot has changed over the past 75 years. And so the question we have to ask is, will the past be prologue? And that's why we're going to have a two-part discussion. First, Sten and Susie will have more to say about how NATO fared during the Cold War. And Heidi will reflect on lessons learned from NATO's post-Cold War experiences in, as Ambassador Smith uh, mentioned, out-of-area operations. We'll then turn our attention to the current and potential future challenges facing the Alliance. And I have the clock here, and I intend to reserve, hopefully, at least 30 minutes for questions from the audience. Um, let me start with Sten. Uh, congratulations on your recent book. But uh, as I mentioned, and it has been mentioned already, uh, during the first two decades of the post-Cold War period, NATO's emphasis really did shift largely to crisis response and crisis management and uh, counterterrorism in out-of-area operations. But Russia's full-scale invasion um, uh, in 2022 certainly has put deterrence and collective defense back at the center of uh, NATO's priorities. So kind of looking over the Cold War period, uh, how has NATO's approach to deterrence and collective defense during that Cold War period influence its structure, its assessments, and its policies and actions today? Uh, basically, what's changed fundamentally and what hasn't? Well, <clears throat> thank you for that question. Let me first of all say what, what a pleasure it is to be here in Georgetown today and uh, to be on this panel with uh, Heidi and Susie. Um, change and continuity. Um, it, it's obvious to, to uh, in a way, be tempted to bracket about 30 years of crisis management and cooperative security and say, now we're back. Uh, NATO has come home, it's collective defense. And uh, it's true, there are many parallels. And uh, one of the parallels I'm, uh, I like drawing, drawing on is uh, back in the 80s, we, we, we used to say that the, the Europeans would always say, you're so lucky, America, you have, you have President Reagan, you have Bob Hope, you have Johnny Cash. Uh, <laughs> the Europeans would say, we, we have our heads of governments, but we have no hope and no cash. And, and, and here we go again. Um, um, and so there are many parallels. Defense forward, reinforcements, coupled conventional defense to nuclear deterrence, uh, manage the central front and the flanks, um, manage below the threshold threats uh, from, from uh, the adversary, the Soviet Union, Russia, uh, essentially manage escalation. Um, <clears throat> all this is back. But I would put my emphasis on discontinuity. And this has to do with the fact that for those 30 years of crisis management and cooperative security, the muscle memory in NATO of collective defense went away. And force structures became much smaller, much, li much lighter. They were deployed out of area, Balkans, but then especially to Afghanistan. And NATO was not set up to defend itself. It was no longer a collective defense organization in capacity. Uh, of course, in name it was. And now that it's reinventing that uh, collective defense capacity, they have gone from 16 allies in 1990 uh, to 32. Um, there's a war going on, which was not the case back then. Um, there's limited defense. Europeans are waking up to the demands of not only mobilizing for defense in the middle of Germany, but further east. The logistical challenge is so much greater. And the 30 years of cooperative security with Russia meant that enlarged NATO did not move Western for forces or military infrastructure eastwards. There was nothing there except, the, of course, the military forces of the new allies, limited as it was. 
All of that has to be invented. Um, and there's a very poor connection between con conventional defense today and nuclear deterrence. It's, a, it's a still a weapon of last resort. It was much more integrated in, into strategic thinking during the Cold War, where you had, a, again, a theory of escalation that uh, may have been imperfect and controversial, but at least it was a coherent theory. Today, there is really no theory, and they're having to invent that, as we heard uh, Ambassador Smith say in slightly different words. All of this has to happen in an alliance that is more complex, not only 32 allies, but there's so much else going on in the alliance. There's the southern flank, which is about terrorism. And if anything has caused a lot of headache in NATO in the 2010s, it's really not Crimea in the 2014 annexation. It's the civil war in Syria and how that estranged Turkey, the US, and France, and led President Macron to say that NATO had become brain dead. That was Syria, that was not Russia. So the southern flank is, is a lot more difficult than during the Cold War. And then on top of that, you have China, is now in the strategic concept. Again, we heard Ambassador Smith say this, emphasize this. Um, and the need, therefore, f to develop partnerships with the key US allies in the Indo-Pacific. That was always NATO partnership policy. It was about creating a multilateral uh, framework around US allies elsewhere. Um, all this at a time when Russia is conducting major war in Europe. So the complexity compared to the Cold War is much greater. The muscle memory is low to non-existent. And the need for leadership is therefore much greater. And when I say leadership, I don't just mean the high pace of summits that NATO has come to depend on. I think there's a limited amount of leadership in those summits. When I say leadership, I mean clear priorities for how NATO is going to manage this very complex agenda. It cannot simply address all these issues and say, now there's leadership. It has to prioritize. And that's, that is a work in progress. Mm -hmm. Well, you mentioned the, the, the nuclear uh, subject. And uh, let me turn to Susie. NATO, of course, does not own nuclear weapons. Uh, it's the weapons of the three nuclear allies, the United States, France, uh, and the UK, that uh, form the basis for the, the NATO strategy. The goals of the NATO's early nuclear policy, which were to deter aggression and reassure non-nuclear allies, did not fundamentally change during the Cold War, but the strategic balance has changed during that time, and NATO had to make important, sometimes very painful adjustments. You've chronicled some of these in your excellent book, which I'd recommend to our audience here, uh, on the Euro missile saga of the 1970s and the 1980s. It's a long and complicated subject, but I'd like to, to ask you if you could describe the key considerations that shaped NATO's nuclear posture and its policies during the Cold War and how those have evolved during the first 20 years or so of the post-Cold War period. Yeah, it's, uh, so when you think about NATO's nuclear posture, right, we start from these, these two principles, uh, core objectives of, on the one hand, deterring aggression uh, in the North Atlantic Treaty area, and then as a complement to that, providing reassurance to each and every signatory of the treaty, regardless of their size or geographic location. And when we put it in those terms, it sounds simple, except that the geography of the treaty area is incredibly hard to defend. I always tell my students that if you had landed, uh, you know, you're a Martian, you land on Earth in the late 1940s, and you could design an alliance, NATO is the last thing you would want to design. You don't want your most powerful actor, your, the, the guarantor of security, the furthest from the flank you are trying to, to defend. Now, what those two components mean, right? deterring aggression and providing reassurance, change and evolve over time. 
In part, that's because the landscape changes, right? You have changes in nuclear weapons technology and capabilities, as well as in the threat perception, particularly of the Soviet Union, and then, of course, uh, its core successor, the Russian Federation, after 1991. And so the alliance, as in so many places, needs to adapt. There are a few different areas or key themes we might pull out in NATO's nuclear posture over the years. The first being changes in doctrine and strategy. So at the time of the signing of the North Atlantic Treaty in April of 1949, the United States is the only nuclear power on the planet. That changes only a few months later when the Soviet Union detonates its first atomic weapon. And of course, that's a very different landscape to think about how you deter aggression or provide reassurance than one with a US nuclear monopoly. By the early 1950s, NATO had decided to rely heavily on nuclear weapons, including stationing US battlefield weapons in Europe and relied on a strategy Leo referred to, right, of massive retaliation. Essentially, you're gonna go from zero to 60 uh, very quickly. Throughout the 1950s and 1960s, the viability of that massive retaliation strategy was heavily debated and contested, right? As many allies wondered whether the changing strategic balance between the Soviet Union and the United States, changing weaponry, meant that that massive retaliation would really protect them. By 1967, the Alliance had adopted a new strategy of flexible response based on the principles of escalation, right? So they used all these rather hokey metaphors to describe it, uh, a ladder with various rungs, uh, a chain with various links connecting it, my favorite Britishism, a robe, a seamless robe of deterrence, right, that had no snags uh, within it. At the end of the Cold War, the, the Alliance's nuclear posture changed dramatically and, and was considerably reduced given changes in the overall threat perception. So significant cuts to the nuclear weapons at NATO's disposal across from strategic weaponry down to battlefield weaponry, uh, but also a move to, as Sten said, right, the treating nuclear weapons as weapons of last resort something that is, is still lingering in NATO's nuclear posture today. So if we have all these changes in doctrine and strategy, that's only one piece of the posture puzzle. Another is about reassurance. And reassurance is not easily calculated. It is in the eye of the beholder and ever changing. And in an alliance as large and unwieldy as NATO, you have a lot of actors with different perceptions of what will in fact reassure them. So NATO's nuclear posture is shaped by a series of proposals, successful and failed over the years, to share control and ensure greater input in the alliance about what weapons would be fielded, where they would be deployed, and of course, how and when they might be used. So I could point to the atomic stockpile proposals of the late 1950s, or the multilateral force and Atlantic nuclear force proposals that failed in the early 1960s. Instead, the Alliance decided to create a committee, uh, the Nuclear Planning Group, or NPG, uh, which is still with us, and instead moved towards other forms of reassurance. So we could take, for example, the stationing of US weapons in Europe in the early 1980s, uh, like the contentious Pershing IIs and Glickums. The other piece I would flag is that arms control has played a central role in NATO's nuclear posture in large part to signal allied intentions. And often NATO has relied on a paired approach where they will modernize or field new weapons, but also propose arms control talks alongside that to manage the costs of those deployments. And that's really drawing on a broader principle in allied thinking uh, that has long roots but was enshrined in the Harmel Report in 1967, pairing dialogue and defense. And so it's this paired approach, for instance, that forms the basis of the 1979 dual track decision, uh, which calls for the deployment of those Pershing twos and Glickums I mentioned a second ago. As a concluding note, I'd say I focused primarily on the, the Cold War period because nuclear posture is so much less important in the post-Cold War period. It's, 
its centrality to the alliance recedes considerably uh, in the early 1990s. I think this is something we're grappling with now, the sort of nuclear weapons, nuclear questions, the theory of deterrence is back. Uh, and we're trying to figure out how much of the old Cold War context uh, can and should inform uh, the conversations today. Good, and we'll come back, in, I think, in the second round here about uh, looking ahead to some of the nuclear challenges. Heidi, and it's been mentioned this, this period since the end of the Cold War up until arguably two years ago with the, the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine, there's been this parenthesis where NATO is focused very heavily on uh, out-of-area operations. These have included, just to remind everyone, peacekeeping in Bosnia, air campaigns in Kosovo, Serbia, and Libya, and the stabilization and training efforts in Afghanistan. Uh, one could add uh, training of Iraqi security forces. And just to remind you, because we all suffer a little bit from amnesia here, at its high point, the NATO-led operation in Afghanistan uh, included approximately a little bit more than 130,000 military personnel, 90,000 of whom were American, and 40,000 uh, from allies and partners, 30,000 strictly from allies, Canada and the Europeans. And there were, at one point, there were six of our NATO allies that suffered per capita more killed and wounded in action than U.S. forces there. Certainly not to minimize the contributions, I would say, and the sacrifices of the American forces. But we shouldn't forget that uh, bravery and also the losses were not a monopoly of the United States during this, what was a very long war. I, I think it is fair to say, though, that those operations have had mixed results. And you've written a book trying to look at how NATO went about uh, trying to learn from uh, these operational experiences. How does it learn uh, as an organization? And let's start with the question, do the Allies even agree on where they've made strategic errors or what they accomplished uh, through these operations? One of which, of course, is still ongoing, and that's the NATO presence in, uh, in Kosovo, although much reduced since the immediate post-war period. That's right. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here to speak. Um, to this point about uh, learning, uh, one of the things that was quite surprising for me in doing the research on learning in a, in a NATO context was that NATO actually, relative to other international organizations that are out there, does have quite significant institutionalization. Um, you do have a lot of different offices. You have multiple places within the organization's bureaucracy for opportunities to learn um, an entire NATO lessons learned process. Um, but what I was surprised about that was despite, of course, a, a strong military culture in this political mil military alliance, is that so much of the learning um, happens in the corridors, in the informal spaces, and that there was actually, despite, I think I interviewed 120 officials across the alliance um, in ACT, ACO, NATO headquarters, et cetera, um, was that much of that learning um, was through these interpersonal networks and relying heavily on old timers, many of whom, as we've heard earlier, have retired, um, as uh, Sten had mentioned, and are rotating out. Old timers who are suddenly becoming very, very important um, for you know, the, the knowledge that they have as the, the so-called Cold War warriors. Um, what does that mean? Well, that means that learning still matters. Um, those, the advantage of having lessons learned processes is that it encourages people to think and talk about learning. So I think one of the big takeaways is that we should maintain these, um, you know, these bureaucratic structures. Um, but 
unfortunately, we see a large reticence to sit down and read these things. So to answer your question, yes, um, there is consensus. Yes, there have been numerous strategic lessons that have been put out. I think um, much of the value, I would say, is um, in some of the internal documents, and I would just say I'm speaking in my personal capacity since I worked for the State Department NATO desk at the time of the Ukraine war invasion. Um, but that in itself is very important, having and creating spaces for learning to happen. Um, even though you have extreme time pressure and uh, NATO has a, a quite significant reactive um, culture. Um, you know, to maybe reference what you were mentioning. What are some of those lessons that came away from my research? Um, so first of all, um, when we think about Afghanistan in particular, uh, one of the questions that I asked was, you know, what do you think in, in interviewing all of these different officials is the biggest strategic lesson, particularly strategic failure that you think um, that we should, we should reflect on? And to be clear, this was done before the Taliban took over. This was several years back. Um, but the key takeaway was civilian casualties, that we really underestimated the importance of civilian casualties. What's interesting about that is subsequently, we've seen scholarly research that's come out to show that um, you know, on a very subnational level, scholars have been able to trace how specific incidences of um, you know, violence uh, against civilians then has translated to higher rates of radicalization in those areas within Afghanistan. So certainly we need to start from the premise of civilian casualties matter for clear moral reasons. I would say additionally, civilian casualties matter for operational effectiveness. Um, and that was something that came out very clearly. Um, I would very much implore anyone who is continuing to work on NATO today to not forget Afghanistan. Um, there have been, like I said, these lessons learned processes. Um, some of them have been referenced by former um, Assistant Secretary General uh, John Monza's uh, piece. He had a piece in the Atlantic Council, which I would encourage many of us to read. Of course, if you're interested, I would encourage you to read my book as well, since there's countless, <laughs> countless, countless quotes of folks talking about these lessons from Afghanistan, um, and then also lessons from uh, the Libya operation. But um, another issue is the SIGAR reports, right? That was something that uh, in interviewing folks, very few people that I interviewed had looked at those SIGAR reports. Would you and, want to explain the acronym, please? Sorry, uh, this is the, I think it stands for Special Investigator yes. General um, of Afghanistan. Yes. Maybe you can help me with the R reports, someone can can fact check me on it. But basically this is, I should probably know, right? <laughs> basically these, this is a special office um, that's set up for the purpose of um, oversight of, um, of this uh, Afghanistan operation. So SIGAR was specifically part of um, DOD, but it was meant to have um, some independence so that it could exercise oversight. So SIGAR would send in individuals out into the field and try to do interviews. I've interviewed folks from SIGAR myself and frustrations that they've talked about, about just getting blocked along the way, trying to get access to information. Um, part of the reason why this is really relevant today is not just because NATO spent two decades in Afghanistan, but also because when we think about security assistance that we're providing for Ukraine, when we think about um, NATO's continued presence in KFOR and Kosovo, um, you know, a lot of those, uh, those mistakes that were made on the ground are things that we could absolutely translate into these other um, uh, out of area uh, contexts. Um, I would just say, uh, maybe to con conclude, is that um, another key takeaway that came out from NATO's responding to crises more broadly, since my research had looked at crises in kind of a broader context, is that we shouldn't underestimate, um, we shouldn't underestimate President Putin's uh, extensive, at this point, disinformation campaign and his broader desire, as he stated, for uh, reunifying the Soviet Union. Um, in the interviews that I had conducted at the time, uh, this was kind of shortly after uh, Crimea had happened, the annexation of Crimea, and you know many of the NATO officials were really lamenting the fact that 
Russia's status as a, as a NATO partner had not shifted, right? That even NATO's kind of strategy and thinking towards Russia had, uh, you know, there was some hesitance to, to shift that. Um, and maybe that speaks to some other broader issues about um, cohesion that NATO is continuing um, to struggle with today. Well, you're, you've given me the perfect opening. I'd like to reverse the order now and come back to you, Heidi, to, to pick up on that. Um, based on your research and, and some government experience as well, I've learned, what challenges pose the most serious problems do you think going forward to NATO's cohesion? Uh, and I'll just mention a couple. We've seen indications of democratic backsliding in, among some of the a small number, but still significant uh, within NATO's ranks. Although NATO leaders uh, routinely emphasize the importance of protecting democratic values and what's called the rules-based international order. So a bit of tension there. Uh, according to its strategic concept of 2022, and it's quite interesting language that NATO adopted, it said NATO, quote, cannot discount the possibility of an attack against allies' sovereignty and territorial integrity. I don't recall seeing that. Uh, in previous strategic concepts. But the Russian disinformation efforts uh, that have been mentioned already a couple of times uh, seem to, and these are aimed at undermining the credibility of Article 5 and uh, seeding distrust among the allies and among governments and among the publics. Um, this campaign seems to have intensified somewhat. And there could be other shocks external shocks to cohesion in NATO, and I'm thinking uh, possibly some of the fallout from different perspectives on the ongoing conflict in Gaza, or even the security impacts of, of climate change. How can a political military alliance of 32 sovereign and in independent countries, what, what can NATO do to better anticipate and tackle such a diverse range of, uh, of threats and, and some opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, one advantage of thinking about NATO returning to collective defense is that we've really seen um, an emphasis on those core values. And so I would argue that um, in the aftermath, immediate aftermath of the full scale invasion of Ukraine in 2022, we saw um, in domestic publics across uh, the alliance, solidarity, as uh, Ambassador Smith had referenced, complete support for not just the alliance, but for Ukraine and the blatant disregard of, um, of uh, Ukraine's sovereign, sovereignty and territorial integrity. Um, so as a result on that piece, I think we continue to see um, cohesion um, on some of those democratic values. But I would argue that on this issue of democratic backsliding, this has always been an issue, I would say, since the origins of the alliance. Um, it's not something new. It doesn't mean that we shouldn't take it seriously. We absolutely should. But there have always been um, struggles in maintaining support for democratic institutions um, within, uh, within some of the allies at any given time. Um, what we have seen on uh, the, you know, when we think about this cohesion around maintaining support for Ukraine at this moment, which is such a critical moment, um, is the concern about uh, this domestic support, right? So, um, you know, making reference to the public opinion polls, as Ambassador Smith had mentioned, over the decades, there has been strong public support for NATO across the alliance. Um, we have seen since 2014, if you look at the public opinion polls, um, some partisan shifts slightly, but even among conservatives, you still see um, a majority of conservatives here in the United States who are supportive of NATO. Um, but the concern, I think, links back to the disinformation campaigns. So one study recently found, it was looking at 10 different allies, and it found that a quarter of respondents in those 10 allies, um, including the US, cited NATO as a cause of the Ukraine war. 
And of course, much of the Russian you know, disinformation campaign has been focused on linking um, NATO to Ukraine and basically trying to um, you know, focus on NATO as, like I said, as, as a cause um, and NATO's enlargement specifically as a justification for this full-scale invasion, despite the fact that's very important to point out, of course, that Russia itself had signed multiple international agreements recognizing, acknowledging, legitimizing the sovereignty of um, Ukraine. And so I would think, you know, in terms of some of those recommendations of how to confront some of these challenges, I mean, at this point, I think every high level person in NATO should be talking about this issue. Um, I think, unfortunately, it's really been underestimated um, within uh, the alliance, I think the NATO Public Diplomacy Division is doing a fantastic job, but there needs to be more speaking up and really clarifying because there seems to be so much confusion. I've given several talks at, you know, for Council for Relations and different venues, as I imagine many of the speakers here on this panel have done, and there continues to be um, you know, confusion and misinformation about uh, what NATO is, what it does, and um, you know, how... Uh, how this invasion of Ukraine fundamentally threatens, um, you know, the broader uh, collective defense that we're that we're thinking about in protecting uh, the alliance, um, you know, moving forward. Um, also, really relying and going back on those old timers, those Cold War warriors who have that deep expertise, um, not just in terms of um, the knowledge that they bring to the table, but also just their familiarity. I would say with, um, you know, Russia the Russian playbook. Um, so thinking about the Eastern allies, thinking about the Balts, thinking about Finland, these countries that really have that experience and um, not thinking, oh, you know, just because they're small allies, that they don't have something to bring to the table. Um, that, is, that is of real value. On, um, you know, some of the other challenges, since you asked about some of the other big challenges that NATO is facing, um, above and beyond, right, the, the, the clear threat that we're, that we're all talking about today of Russian aggression against, you know, um, other Eastern European um, uh, countries, is the, the existential threat of climate change. So something that I'm working on right now, a lot of my research is focused on NATO adaptation, how NATO is changing over time. And so uh, a co-author of mine, Jackie Burns, and I have interviewed 63 um, officials from across the alliance to try to get a sense at why and how is NATO in adapting in the ways that it is to climate threats. Um, and I think it's just important to point out that as an existential threat, climate change is a threat to deterrence. It's also a threat to NATO's ability to be interoperable. So as we see individual allies that are supposed to be meeting these pretty significant climate targets, they are moving in sometimes different directions and adopting different types of technologies. So how does that affect, to go back to the, the initial question, how does that affect NATO's ability to be effective in its operations? Um, can a British EV plug in in Estonia, for example, you know, as we start thinking about bolstering the eastern flank, um, are you know, are NATO um, you know defense plans are these incorporating climate threats? Are um, O plans having climate security? Is that an annex? Is that part of the planning process? Are climate threats part of tabletop exercises? Are they built into, um, you know, war games? These kind of things. So I think there's a there's still this challenge among many folks in the military, in particular, or this this broader resistance to thinking about climate because of the stereotype mm -hmm. of, oh, climate is kind of a tree hugger type phenomenon. When in reality, we can see and people are living it every day, um, the ways in which it climate threats are compromising the ability of the alliance to, um, to really do its job. Thank you. Well, I think we'll probably come back to this, and I would anticipate at least a, a question or so on that issue. Uh, Susie, I want to come back to the nuclear uh, topic. And of course, in, in response to this increase in Russian uh, nuclear saber rattling, as we call it, um, at least in part in response to that, but also to actually to Russian modernization and, and uh, changes in doctrine and deployments. NATO summit declarations have become pro progressively more um, 
progressively stronger, I would say, in their, their language, describing the importance of uh, the uh, deterrence role of nuclear weapons, the importance of things like what we call nuclear sharing arrangements within the alliance, um, things like that. And, and allies, the U.S. and the allies are doing something about it. There are programs now to modernize uh, the dual-capable aircraft um, deployed by several allies. Older U.S. gravity bombs in Europe are being replaced by more modern, reliable, uh, effective uh, weapons. NATO's become more transparent as well in its nuclear-related um, nuclear exercises. And our two newest members, uh, Finland and Sweden, are now members of the nuclear planning group. Um, looking ahead, do you see a stronger consensus on NATO nuclear issues than we've had in the past? Uh, and I mean, we have to be alert to possibilities that something could happen to change that consensus. Do you see risks to that consensus as well that we haven't mentioned so far? Yeah, I think it's clear that nuclear weapons remain central to the alliance's posture. And you don't need me to tell you that. Ambassador Smith told you that already this morning. Right, the strategic concept, the last strategic concept was explicit that it is the NATO's defense and deterrence is based on a mix of nuclear, conventional, and missile defense, along with adjacent cyber and space capabilities. But that doesn't get at this question, right? Is it stronger? And, and so I would say certainly in the wake of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine in February of 2022, we've seen more talk about NATO's nuclear capabilities, more willingness to be explicit in terminology that as long as nuclear weapons exist in the world, NATO will be a nuclear alliance. That may sound obvious, but to even get such clear language is often hard in a, an alliance like NATO. But just because the language is more explicit, the historian in me can't help but point out that that doesn't mean it's stronger, per se, right? And so I would point to one particular uh, risk area that I see, which is that the, con the current consensus around nuclear weapons and their place in the alliance, but around allied defense in general, is predica predicated on a fundamental bargain. It relies, above all, on US leadership, US capacity, and US willingness to continue playing that role. All right, it relies on the protection of the US nuclear umbrella. And I think the diplomatic thing we could say is that not every leader in the alliance's other 31 member countries looks at politicians in Washington and assumes that that will last forever. And so that opens up the possibility or potential for proposals for other allies to consider how they might reduce or leave behind their reliance on the United States and on the American nuclear deterrent, right? I don't think it's a coincidence that we've seen talk of proposals that sound suspiciously like things I've read about in the archives from 1963 or 1964 about European sharing schemes, both conventional uh, and even occasionally uh, nuclear in, in nature. So NATO, right, as Ambassador Smith told us this morning, is returning to the past and dusting off this old theory of deterrence. But I think any cursory review of NATO's history during the Cold War should be a pointed reminder that that nuclear posture was almost always contested. And that's because it's not based on firm, easily quantifiable, and agreed upon things. It's based primarily on emotions, psychology, perception, confidence, right? What I always bucket together as the fuzzy stuff. And plenty of other issues beyond nuclear posture shape that sense of confidence or whether an ally is reassured. So in the 1970s, Nuclear debates about whether or not the United States could be trusted were impacted by everything from the conduct of the Vietnam War to Jimmy Carter's human rights policies. Right? All of those things bore on how Washington's allies understood the US commitment to NATO and whether it was reliable. 
I think NATO's history also reminds us that sustained attention on the alliance's nuclear dimensions and nuclear capabilities can provide some degree of reassurance to publics, but it can also elicit broad concern about what a world with nuclear weapons looks like, right? Uh, if we look at NATO's history during the Cold War, there are recurring episodes of ban the bomb campaigns, anti-nuclear uh, uprisings, and we shouldn't assume that those are inherently relics of the Cold War. We still live with nuclear weapons, nuclear weapons can still do immense damage, and we shouldn't be surprised that some people do not unquestioningly share the logic of deterrence as the best way to preserve their safety. And so if that consensus remains fragile today, I don't think that should surprise us, but rather it should be something that we can see very clearly from the alliance's past. Managing that consensus will require, as it always has, careful and ongoing calibration to adapt to new circumstances and views. That's something that's been true for seven decades and I think will be as we move forward. Uh, Stan, I, uh I want to come back to you as the European uh, on our small panel here to talk about the figurative elephant in the room. And I'm going to be less diplomatic, perhaps, than the, our moderator, David Sanger, and just remind the audience that in February, the Allies heard a former president of the United States claim to have told an Allied leader, quote, you didn't pay, you're delinquent, no, I would not protect you. In fact, I would encourage them, he was referring to Russia, to do whatever the hell they want, end of quote. Our allies have also witnessed his, loyal his loyalists in Congress drag their feet on providing the critical military assistance needed by Ukraine. So I know you can't speak for Europe, but I'm going to ask you to take a stab at this anyway. What is the effect? from your perspective, of such statements and actions on European thinking about the credibility of U.S. commitments to NATO? And can Europeans, I'll put this in air quotes, Trump-proof the alliance, as some have suggested in, uh, in recent articles? So, so we're staying with nuclear issues, except the political kind, I guess. <laughs> um, um, there, there's no question that uh, Stoltenberg, Secretary General Stoltenberg, is trying to trump-proof the alliance uh, on Ukraine, uh, setting up a policy that will be durable uh, whatever comes in November. However, um, the impact on European thinking, I would say, is considerable, and it is, um, it is unprecedented in the history of the alliance. Um, We've seen concerns with Russian or Soviet behavior before, and uh, obviously Russia is on, on a war path. Um, we have not seen this level of concern with the American commitment to Europe. And <clears throat> come what may in November, it could be Trump, it could be Biden, um, there's a widespread sense that Biden, if he wins, will be the last truly transatlantic president of the United States. And Trump is not just Trump, it's about a political movement that has reached into Congress, that has captured a broad uh, a segment of the American population. Um, and there's a sense that this is here to stay. Uh, ho however it expresses itself in American politics, this is a fact and Europeans will have to live with it at a time when Russia is trying to uh, impose uh, great political change on Europe by way of war. And that, that, this is obviously shaking European politics in a big way. Um, the most obvious example of how this has changed Europe is the fact that Finland brought themselves and Sweden into NATO. I would never have thought that it would happen in my lifetime. And I'm not that old. Um, <laughs> this is a this is absolutely stunning that the Finnish president saw what was happening in Russia and said, this is so dangerous, we need to get into NATO. Uh, and the fact that the Swedes made it in as well. Um, something is really up. Back in the 80s, uh, apparently I like the 80s, um, 
an American uh, colleague wrote of, uh, of, of European defense that it was uh, sort of like a room full of filing cabinets looking at each other. Um, things are not that bad, um, but uh, there's a lot to be done in order to, to see how, how Europeans will react to this. Let me just mention a few good things, and then I'll get to some things I think, I think are more worrisome. The good things is that the European Union's uh, common security and defense policy has collapsed. Uh, and when I say that, I mean it is being retooled. The old version, which was very much about autonomy and crisis management and uh, reaching out out of the area, uh, is clearly not the answer to the collective defense challenge that Europe is facing. So uh, there's a lot of energy being put in Europe into to retooling EU instruments for collective defense at the defense industry level. And uh, Ambassador Smith spoke to this. A lot of money is being put on the table. 80% of what the Europeans are buying today uh, is being bought in the United States. They want, so 20% so in Europe, they want that to be 50% by 2030, building up the defense industry because that is where capacities come from. More collaboration, defense industrial collaborations, more defense industry openness, more competition. You can say this is Europe's Pentagon moment. If all this works out, the defense industrial strategy of the EU, the US, uh, Europe will gain a sort of Pentagon motor engine in European defense industry. That will be huge. Um, we also see it with the European Peace Fund, um, of a facility it's called, which was all about funding crisis management in North Africa, but it has now become a security, security assistance fund for Ukraine. So collective defense is making its way into the EU, um, and the EU is, I think, working very well with NATO on resilience and how this is going to uh, play together. Where I think the bad news sort of begins a little bit is um, this has to be translated into European capacity, operational capacity for defending themselves, uh, ourselves. Um, and things are moving slowly. I said that in, uh, earlier. Um, there's a lot of the, the defense money in Europe. They will go towards meeting the NATO defense planning process uh, capability targets for individual nations. And that is fine. That's good. But getting those targets to become an operational capacity, we don't have an answer to that yet. And uh, I'm a member of the Alphen Group, a network of experts, and uh, we put out a statement on this, and uh, I'll welcome you to read it. I can go into further depth on this. But moving from capability targets to operational capacity is Europe's next challenge, conventionally. Susie mentioned Europe and nuclear deterrence and how we're getting back to some sort of sharing scheme. I entirely agree. Something is going on on nuclear deterrence because that is ultimately how we guarantee each other's collective defense. Um, and if the US pulls out a little bit, a lot, entirely, someone is going to have to fill in that gap nuclear-wise. And that debate is happening. And you saw President Macron talk about French boots on the ground in Ukraine. He didn't have in mind trench warfare for the French army. He had in mind putting a European nuclear power into the game. Someone who Russia cannot coerce by the threat of escalation because they have nuclear weapons. This is truly very important for Europe. And the Germans, they know it. They know that however much they build up conventionally, they will be coerceable by Russia because they can't go to the nuclear level. Who is going to have Germany's back nuclear-wise? That's a key question. That's an emerging, rapidly emerging German debate. France has more nuclear weapons than Britain, but they have no street reputation for protecting others nuclear-wise. They, they do not extend their deterrence. 
Britain, nor does Britain, and they have fewer. How is this going to happen? That debate could work out well, and it could open Europe for a competitive space on nuclear deterrence. And if I was Poland, I would probably consider getting my own nuclear weapons if the US pulled out. So it's a very dangerous situation. Very important, very dangerous. And let me finish off by saying Trump. <laughs> he is a phenomenon of north-south politics. And we have that in Europe too. It's about immigration. It's about identity. It's about borders, secure borders. And how you speak to popular concerns about what's happening to our society. Um, and Europe's political center is as beleaguered as your political center. It's not holding very well. The fringes are mobilizing. There are all kinds of issues taking a stab at the political center. And the political centers are keeping the east-west axis against Russia together. And so CSDP's transformation, conventional buildup, nuclear debates with a political center that is not doing well. That's Europe's condition. And so let me finish that by quoting Donald Trump. We'll just see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Uh, we have, I'm, I've broken the promise, I said maybe 30 minutes. We have fewer uh, than that for questions, but um, I would invite uh, members of the audience who have questions, please. Um, I, I would just say, uh, let, let's try to keep them brief and let's take two at a time. My name is Geert von Braun, European-American, Belgian-American. So I know Brussels, that's where I grew up. I think the United States and its allies haven't won a single war since World War II. What makes you think that you will win the next war against Russia and China, considering that the other wars were really against small nations? Provocative question. <laughs> is, there, is there a second one for, for now? If not, why do, why do we take a turn? Who, who would like to? Well, I, I think the answer to that question is no one wants to fight a war with Russia. They want to deter it. And they want to deter it by conventional defense. This Europe is going to be impenetrable. They cannot get in. But even if they get in, then there's the nuclear deterrence to punish that penetration. There's no desire to fight that war. The war with China is going to be economic and technological, uh, hopefully. Um, and um, um, war at the level between NATO, Russia, NATO, China, the US, China, is going to be so catastrophic that the parallel to what went on in Afghanistan or Iraq, Libya, Kosovo, it's just a different ball game. And uh, you, you would hope that deterrence works. Maybe I just... Sure. I'll just add on to that to say that there is a war underway, um, and that's an information war. And that's one of these concerns, right, that we're talking about here, is who is going to win that information war, and that's going to help decide who the next president is here in this country. That's going to decide who's elected in terms of, you know, some of these governments in Europe where, as we heard, the center is a little bit wobbly. Um, and there's also a, a cybersecurity war going on, right? I mean, as we heard earlier with Ambassador Smith's reference, every single day there are cyber attacks on NATO, on allied governments, um, by many of these uh, large actors with whom we're talking about. Um, and we hope, 
as we just heard, that we don't end up with a, a conventional or a, or a nuclear war and that deterrence works. <laughs> Anything, Susan? I, I would just pick up, Heidi's mentioned a few times about uh, information and the misinformation and disinformation landscape today. And I think uh, we, are, we are recalling an old problem. So yes, it is acute today. But the allied leaders of 1950 worried deeply about the popularity of ban the bomb campaigns and uh, popular sentiment in favor of neutralism rather than support for building up what became NATO after uh, North Korea invaded South Korea, right? And so there is a long tried and true uh, information game surrounding the alliance because leaders primarily in Moscow have known that cohesion is one of the most valuable things for the alliance. And in an alliance of democracies, turning public opinion against allies and publics against their governments is an easy source of leverage. So I think when, when you talk about uh, having, uh, talking to the old timers, right? Part of it is also just remembering our own history. The Alliance has a long history and it's not all good or instructive, but it can help us think through the challenges of how have previous generations of policymakers grappled with not always the same, but similar problems uh, over time. Uh, sir, please. I'm Barry Posen. I teach security studies at MIT. Um, this is a great panel. I especially appreciated the engagement with nuclear issues, and I want to try and press you a little harder on the nuclear um, deterrence question. I I'm an old dog, and I, I worked on NATO Warsaw Pact competition you know, back in the day, and uh, it was very clear that um, NATO, right up to the end, relied very heavily on the threat of relatively early few first use of nuclear weapons as a key part of its deterrent posture. And we threw everything but the kitchen sink at it in terms of, of, of nuclear weapons. That's how we got up to six or 7,000 warheads in Europe. Um, the Allies were quite insistent that it remain this way, right? We, we, we could not get them to buy more than 30 days worth of conventional stocks to be able to fight in a conventional war because they wanted the threat of nuclear escalation to be front and center. So I'm trying to come up to, to today and, and ask you to speculate a little bit on how this issue may play out because as you have correctly said, in our narrative, we talk about a fairly extended non-nuclear campaign. We rely very heavily on the, the nuclear shield and the, I mean, the conventional shield. And the nuclear sword is meant to come out very late, if at all. And it is not clear to me at all whether countries have really engaged with the implications for their conventional force planning uh, that this change has, right? Um, NATO forces are still stuck in the size and organization that they generated for the last 30 years. Yeah. There are no reserves. I mean, no reserves of people. Uh, right? for, and not just weapons, but reserves of people. So th this is a this is a high hill to climb, and, and I, I, I wonder, just, you know, this is future telling, you know, how do you think this is going to play out as people really begin to engage with these issues that, that Sten raised, which is like planning real capabilities for real wars? Okay. Thank you. I, could we have a second question? And I would ask you, I'm sorry to, let's try to keep them brief so we can get in at least a couple more here in our time. I realize it's a complicated Subject, Barry. So thinking about strategic deterrence perhaps a bit differently, in 1970, I'm sorry, in 1989, I believe PepsiCo purchased Russian submarines and sold them to Sweden. Do we think that there's any creative approaches leveraging private sector today, understanding the capabilities, but perhaps not wanting to add to the shipyard graveyards that we've seen uh, accumulate in India, for example. Is it really a build more capabilities question, or are we also looking at aging infrastructure across the board with all 
NATO and US uh, SMR structures and whatnot, and there are also different guardrails that the US and NATO are subject to that uh, India and Israel I don't believe were signatories to, for example. Since I've already broken one rule, let's break one more, and <laughs> let's just take the third question now, and we'll we'll just cut it off at, at that point if we can. All right, sir, uh, please. Yeah. First of all, uh, thank you for all being here, and uh, Dr. Coburn, I was actually in your uh, Canadian International Relations class in, uh, at the University <laughs> of Toronto about four years ago. I know you probably don't remember me. It's but, wonderful uh, to see you again. <laughs> yeah, it's good to see you again. Um, so my question is, uh, given that how uh, conflicts have shifted in the past decade, uh, with now you, even NATO getting involved in uh, Operation Inherent Resolve, which is American-led uh, operations in Iraq and Afghanistan, of course, ending recently, and now there's a greater focus for the United States to play a more active role in the Pacific. How do you see, um, panel, uh, question for the entire panel, how do you see uh, NATO adjusting to those commitments, um, that potential shift in um, military posture in the Pacific with all the different conflicts going on? Does it make sense for a alliance that was built primarily for the defense of North America and Europe to play a greater collective security role in the Pacific? And does it even make sense that, you know, we are kind of elevating all those non-NATO allies that we have in the region, Japan, uh, South Korea, Australia, New Zealand, for example, how do they fit into that structure? Thank you. So could I ask each of you to maybe take, uh, you can take your pick of the questions or parts of the questions, but each, um, if you can keep your responses to say, uh, two minutes or so, then we'll have time for close-out remarks. Sure. Want to start? Sure. Okay. Um, so on uh, Professor Posen's point, I would say that this is, a, this is a really big concern, the concern about reserves and the concern about people. And I would just point out uh, the differences that you see in conscription, right? Here in the United States, uh, we had the draft, um, but we now are in a voluntary uh, you know, armed forces. Um, and even though the draft still exists in the form of young men signing up, this has not been opened up to young women, even though it's been um, discussed uh, numerous times in uh, Congress. So I would say that that's a real, a real legitimate uh, concern. On the last question, um, thinking about, you know, is it possible to be thinking about, um, you know, the Asian Pacific region and as, you know, U.S. priorities, uh, U.K. priorities are shifting in that direction, um, does it still, should we still be thinking that NATO has a presence and really has um, some meaning uh, and some significant contributions to make in uh, out-of-area operations? And I would say yes. And the greatest example of that is what's going on in Kosovo. Right, so if you haven't been following this, um, NATO for many decades now has had a presence in the form of, you know, a modest uh, military operation there in Kosovo. Um, and so ethnic tensions have been rising in recent years um, with several significant violent um, outbreaks. And there's been, NATO has actually contributed more troops and boosted the, the troop presence there. And so I think in the same sense that we are now reflecting back on the consequences of uh, the withdrawal from Afghanistan, um, you know, thinking about what would it look like with a complete shift away um, from, you know, some of the other operations that exist right now? Is it worth the cost to um, maybe maintain that presence in, you know, in Kosovo, given that those, some of those conflicts are not 100% uh, right. resolved? We talk a lot in political science about the post-conflict and questioning, is the post-conflict really post-conflict, um, given that conflicts have a tendency to uh, cycle back up? An excellent reminder. Susie? Uh, so I'll take first about the NATO's role in the Indo-Pacific and, and what that relationship looks like. There's always been a tension in allied strategy about whether or not its fundamental role was regional engagement or global engagement. And so in the 1950s, uh, one of the early Gaullist pushes was for the creation of a global strategy. The British had made a similar push earlier in the 1950s. So this question of 
Is the treaty area really the only place that NATO should be operating? Uh, it has, has a long history, and I, I think we're seeing the latest phase of that, but I would say that there are lots of ways that NATO can be engaged in shaping the strategic landscape in the Indo-Pacific without suddenly turning its attention away from Europe to the Indo-Pacific. And so I think we can see that reflected in all of these, uh, this investment in partnerships with Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, and the like, uh, but also thinking about what a stable Europe means for the broader uh, international security landscape. And, and so I don't think they're quite as much in tension as we often uh, believe they are. Uh, on the question of, of deterrence and sort of future forecasting where we're going, the Cold War history of the debates over deterrence give us so much contradiction to parse through. Uh, the prevailing European view was, yes, rapid escalation of nuclear weapons because it makes deterrence more credible and more likely to protect their homelands. Uh, when American planners talked about what that would look like to use those nuclear weapons, most of those same Europeans then said, wait, 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 wait. I really don't like the range of those missiles you're planning to launch. You know, those 400 kilometers, that strikes my neighbor's house. The 1,000 kilometers strikes my next door, the, the country uh, one over's house. Uh, and so, so there was always, a, I think, a fundamental tension about theory and practice. Uh, I thought it was particularly telling this morning that Ambassador Smith said that they were getting back their nuclear IQ. And so if I had to hypothesize about where we're going, it's that when a lot of what has worked in the last 20 or 30 years is because people aren't paying attention to it. And now that the relationship between conventional and nuclear deterrence is back on the table in a real way, fundamentally inverted in, in major ways from what it was during the Cold War with much greater emphasis on, on conventional capability, uh, when people start turning over those rocks, I think people are going to find that the assumptions underneath them are very uncomfortable ones. Uh, and so I, I would speculate that we are uh, due for a considerable round of probably very unpleasant debate about what's required uh, and, and what the implications of that will, will mean because the fundamental geography of the alliance is the same. How things impact a voter in Omaha, Nebraska is not how they impact someone in central Poland. Well, thank you. Um, on on the Indo-Pacific, um, I think, uh, and maybe that was an accident, maybe it was deliberate, uh, but you put it in exactly the right terms. NATO has a collective security role in the Indo-Pacific. Collective security, that is talking to the key U.S. allies, getting them multilateralized in a dialogue on resilience, technology, disinformation. Um, but on collective defense, NATO is and must remain Euro-Atlantic centric. It cannot, by its makeup and its complexity, take on a collective defense role in the Indo-Pacific. It, um, it, it simply would not work. And the way they address China is about China coming to Europe, as Stoltenberg has said, and then working the multilateral framework with these key U.S. allies in the region. I think this is the future for NATO in, in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, as an American colleague of mine said, uh, both Russia and China are, are uh, headline news, but Russia is above the fold. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I, I didn't quite catch the, the private market uh, question, so maybe we can discuss this in the break. On, on Nuclear uh, issues, um, I think we have seen the future. And that is, the Allies will want to play up conventional defense in a way that is bigger than during the Cold War. And um, it's true that during the Cold War, the, US, the, the Europeans wanted to accelerate escalation to get the US involved. The US sought to delay escalation beyond the conventional, so to, to not be involved in uh, the nuclear weapon level. Um, that was then. Now NATO is at, at the point where they're really building up defense, so they're very careful to say defense and deterrence. And we see the plans coming out of the past two years of defense planning. 
300,000 reaction troops, uh, frontline defense, etc. It's all about not pushing nuclear issues to the forefront. Why not? One, one issue is that in Europe, as in the United States, I, I guess, uh, but I know the European scene a bit better here, um, we have been through a couple of decades of hopefulness that perhaps nuclear weapons would go away. The abolitionist movement, or President Obama's Global Zero, uh, public opinion has not come back to embracing nuclear deterrence as something that is beautiful and nice. And the political center I talked about that is not solid in any case is not about to go more solid if they embrace nuclear deterrence against their own population. So there's a great big gap between where the population is on, on nuclear deterrence and where the political center is. A lot of political leadership, public education, may change this a little bit, and the Europeans will need to have this discussion in order to not end in, in that competitive space that I talked about, who's going to have the nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. But uh, another fact that has changed and which cannot be changed, uh, rolled back, is the fact that NATO is now at the border of Russia. In the Cold War, the early stages of nuclear escalation were about the space in between the superpowers. So you could, you could devastate parts of Western Europe, parts of Eastern Europe, and it would still not be strategic, right? It would be tactical or intermediary. That option is off the table today. There's no space between NATO and Russia. So everything for Russia is strategic. So the escalation is much more violent and unpredictable compared to back then. And that is a challenge for NATO that will not go away. And that is why they will do a lot to maintain a considerable conventional defense component in the defense and deterrence posture. But the nuclear conversation will need to be had because it is there at the end of defense, there is nuclear deterrence. And I think this afternoon, um, and I hope most of you can stay, there will be a, uh, a continuation of this discussion, of this very important topic, one of the afternoon panels. The organizers, uh, we have to call this to, to an end. The organizers initially had, had offered me a couple minutes to kind of sum up the discussion. I think it's been a very rich one, and I don't really think I need to sum it up, but a couple of things that have been mentioned this morning. I do want to take a minute then to offer a couple of uh, personal reflections. Julie Smith mentioned something very important, and that is that essentially that neither NATO's successes nor its shortcomings were preordained, and we really can't afford to take the alliance for granted. Uh, I served in government for a long time, and I've come to the conclusion, really, that people, it's not unique to me, but people make policy. Hopefully, with some combination of, of foresight, shaped by a knowledge of history, uh, respect for important values, and pragmatism, openness to compromise, and, and maybe a dose even of humility. And we will continue to need those, uh, uh, those type of men and women uh, in NATO and inside NATO governments dealing with NATO's affairs in, in the US, in Europe, and in Canada. So this is mainly directed to the students in the audience. Uh, I was the director for NATO uh, in the Pentagon for NATO policy on September 11th, and I saw how within a few hours, our Canadian and European allies proposed to invoke Article 5, Collective Defense Article of the Treaty, for the first time in history and for the defense of the United States. And that proposal came back to Washington, and it was very quickly approved at the highest levels of this government. It meant something. In the following weeks, NATO as an alliance undertook some meaningful steps to help the United States, not only to protect our airspace, but to relieve the United States of some of the responsibilities we had around the world so that we could uh, redeploy some efforts uh, to Afghanistan. And in those areas where NATO as an organization was not prepared for one reason or another to act as an organization, you should make no mistake about it. Everything that we had done for decades in NATO on interoperability of equipment, of thinking, 
of exercising and of training, all of that was vital uh, for the performance of our militaries in, uh, in bilateral operations, in other channels, but also in uh, what became known as coalitions of the willing. People put that together. One other example, and you mentioned uh, Sten, Finland, and Sweden. I've spent a lot of time working with both those countries, and you know, it was remarkable. It was really remarkable how quickly after uh, the Russian invasion in February 2022, 20, those two countries said, we want to be members. And they applied at the same time in May uh, of 2022. And it, if you look at Finland, it set a record, I believe, for the shortest uh, lapse of time between that formal application and its succession. 11 months. Sweden, for reasons that we're aware of, there's some foot dragging by a couple of allies, but as of last month, it's now a member. People made that happen. Diplomats, military officers, Ministry of Defense civilians in those two countries worked for decades to make their countries more interoperable with NATO, to make their publics more aware of what NATO does and get rid of some of the old myths. And, uh, and it worked. And we see the benefits. People did that. So I hope the students in the audience here think of that and think of the role they have to play. And, and since I began the session by quoting a, uh, an American, uh, Mark Twain, I think it's only fitting that we, we close it by uh, maybe remembering a, a little known European expert on transatlantic uh, defense policy, who's the Brit, uh, Sir Mick Jagger of the Rolling Stones. <laughs> And I, I, I think of him because, of course, NATO is not a perfect organization, but in one of his songs, Mick Jagger summed it up, I think, very clearly, my view of NATO. And remember he's saying, you can't always get what you want, but if you try real hard, you just might get what you need. Please join me in thanking our panelists. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You. I believe there's going to be a, well, you'll tell that. Yep. <laughs> um, thank you, panelists, for your uh, valuable insights into how the Alliance's past continues to inform and shape the Alliance's present and possible future. We ask that the audience kindly remain in their seats for a moment as our speakers depart the stage. A quick reminder that this would be a good time to submit your questions for the afternoon keynote with General Cavoli using the QR codes displayed on the screens on either side of the stage. We are now going to take a short, another short break. We will resume our programming at 11.15 with our second panel, which will explore the future of deterrence. Thank you.
everyone. Welcome back. If you please wouldn't mind taking your seats, we'll get started in just a moment. As a friendly reminder, remember to silence your cell phones. Welcome back, everyone. Our next panel will discuss NATO and the future of deterrence. Our first panelist is NATO Assistant Secretary General for Defense Policy and Planning, Angus Lapsley. Joining him will be Justina Gotkowska, Dr. Heather Williams, and Professor Stephen Flanagan, who will be moderating. Angus Lapsley has served as the NATO Assistant Secretary General for Defense Policy and Planning since September of 2022. Within NATO's international staff, Mr. Lapsley leads the team responsible for the alliance's capability and force planning, postures, posture plans, and a range of defense policy questions, including nuclear issues. <coughs> Prior to his appointment, Assistant Secretary General Lapsley spent over 30 years as a diplomat for the United Kingdom. Justina Gotkowska is the Deputy Director at the Warsaw-based Center for Eastern Studies, also known as OSW and head of the Security and Defense Department. She focuses on regional and European security and defense issues in Northern and Central Europe, and has also written about NATO's defense and deterrence posture on the Eastern flank. Dr. Heather Williams is the director of the Project on Nuclear Issues and a senior fellow in the International Security Program at CSIS. She is also an associate fellow with the Project on Managing the Atom at the Harvard Kennedy School and was a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow in the Security Studies Program at MIT. Dr. Williams has extensive experience as a professor and lecturer on arms control, deterrence, and disarmament at King's College London, and previously served as a special advise, specialist advisor to the House of Lords International Relations Committee inquiry into the Nuclear Non-Proliferation -Prolifer Treaty and Disarmament. And finally, Professor Stephen Flanagan is an adjunct senior fellow at RAND and adjunct professor of security studies at the Walsh School of Foreign Service, Georgetown University. Flanagan has served in several senior positions in the US government, including special assistant to the president and senior director for defense policy and strategy, and previously for the president and senior director for Central and Eastern Europe at the National Security Council staff. Flanagan has published numerous books, reports, journal articles, and commentaries on transatlantic, international security, and defense issues. Please join me in welcoming the panelists to the stage. Thank you, Abby, and thank you all. It's a pleasure to be here and, and having a chance with this panel to delve into a bit further into some of the issues that have already been uh, explored a little bit in, in the first panel, but now we're gonna dig down a bit more into this question of NATO's, the future capacity uh, for deterrence and defense. Uh, I'll make a few opening remarks to set the stage a bit in the transition between the first and second panel and then turn to each of our distinguished panelists in, in, uh, for a series of questions um, following in the pattern of the first uh, panel. So building consensus on the appropriate size and mix of conventional and nuclear capabilities as well as on the strategy for their employment and equitable sharing of the fiscal burdens and strategic risks of maintaining them has been an enduring challenge in the realization of NATO's deterrence and defense policy uh, over the past seven decades. And you heard already from our first panelists about some of these enduring tensions. Uh, it became clear in NATO's earliest days that this am the ambitious conventional force goals that allies set at an extraordinary 1952 meeting, uh, Lisbon, of the foreign defense and finance ministers to counter the Soviet threat. It's an, uh, almost unimaginable, 50 divisions, 4,000 aircraft, 700 ships, uh, that that certainly was never going to be achieved, uh, at least uh, not within the realm of fiscal realities at that time. So NATO soon shifted to a greater reliance on the nuclear dimension uh, of deterrence, uh, particularly U.S. strategic forces, and then moving from the concept of massive retaliation in the 1950s to flexible response in the 1960s, which envisioned a more sustained initial defense with conventional forces, while preserving ambiguity about how nuclear weapons might be employed. 
We also heard in the first panel that, of course, strong opposition uh, to, uh, in many allied countries, to the 1979 dual track decision on deploying intermediate range nuclear weapons in Europe to counter new Soviet capabilities and strengthen the linkage to the US strategic deterrent led to redoubled efforts to improve conventional capabilities. NATO launched what was then known as the Long-Term Defense Program of 1979 to 86 to mitigate negative shifts in the military balance with the Soviet Union by exploiting new operational concepts and emerging technologies. Well, few allies met the goal of 3% real growth in annual defense spending to realize that program, deterrence held, and NATO continued to rely heavily on the nuclear dimension of, uh, of deterrence. After, as the Cold War, um, at the, after the Cold War, the deterrence and defensive alliance territory became less urgent. And of course, the focus, as you heard of Ambassador Smith earlier and, and, and some of the earlier panel, the focus of allied military efforts shifted to the conduct of expeditionary peacekeeping, stabilization, and later counterterrorism and counterinsurgency operations in Afghanistan. Now, of course, in the wake of Russia's annexation of Crimea and the instigation of the insurgency in the Donbas in 2014, NATO undertook steps to reassure multiple vulnerable allies and bolster deterrence by developing the enhanced forward presence in northeastern Europe and the tailored forward presence in southeastern Europe. Since 2022, NATO has taken further steps to strengthen this forward presence in the eastern part of the alliance and other elements of its defense strategy and military posture and added two new members, as, as we heard um, Ambassador Smith mention today earlier. Allies are also reviving national resilience plans, seeking ways to augment defense industrial capacity and expanding cooperation in both those areas. In this session, we have asked our panelists to discuss the state of all those efforts and the next steps to advance and sustain what NATO calls its concept of deterrence and defense. We are very fortunate to have three speakers who can address these issues authoritatively. And I will turn to them uh, in, in, in sequence and then uh, in each of their areas of expertise and responsibility. So let me start first with Assistant Secretary General Lapsley. Um, would you uh, provide the audience uh, a bit of an overview of the developments in the Alliance's uh, deterrence and defense concept uh, and military posture in recent years, particularly uh, decisions taken since 2022 to reinforce and expand the number of battle groups in the eastern flank and progress uh, in advancing uh, the, uh, both the decisions of the Madrid and Vilnius NATO summits uh, that, were, uh, that tried to uh, add to additional elements to support the deterrence and defense concept. Um, well, thanks, Stephen. Um, morning, everybody. It's a, it's a real pleasure to, to be here in this splendid um, setting. And I think you're, you're right in your question that um, I mean, something quite profound is happening in NATO at the moment and has been now for a couple of years, which is uh, an alliance that for most of the post-Cold War period was, was focused on building regional security and expeditionary operations, is now right back to putting deterrence and defense at the heart of uh, our agenda. And that was confirmed by the uh, Madrid summit and then the Vilnius summit. I'd say two points about our kind of overall um, uh, approach. Um, the, the first is there's a reason why we talk about deterrence and defense in that order, because the primary goal of the alliance is to make sure there isn't an attack on any NATO uh, uh, ally. And we've been pretty successful at that for the last 75 years. But uh, I think there is a recognition amongst allies at the moment that the scale of the challenge, in particular from Russia, Russian risk-taking, Russian capabilities, Russian political objectives, mean that we absolutely cannot take our success in that for uh, granted. Um, of course, the best way to achieve deterrence is to convince your adversary that if we had to fight, we would do so successfully and we would win. Um, and putting that mentality back at the heart of NATO is, is, is really uh, what, what, what is, is happening at the moment. Um, I think the second point I'd make about deterrence, and it will link to some of the things I think probably Heather will, will say, is we're really conscious that we have to think of it in sort of layers. So we have to manage, and if we can, 
deter all of the ways in which Russia is trying to um, uh, divide us uh, and harm us that stop short of open war, what we call sub-threshold threats, action in space, cyberspace, interfering in our politics, disinformation, etc. Then we have to be ready to deter in the conventional sense of, um, uh, of being able to stop and win uh, a conventional attack uh, uh, on NATO. And then lastly, we have to be ready to maintain deterrence um, when it comes to nuclear weapons uh, and other forms of strategic uh, uh, effect against us. And how those three layers interact is, is actually really complicated and, and one of the most interesting things in the Alliance at the moment. We, t we use the word coherence, um, uh, sometimes people use the word integration, uh, but it's about convincing the other side that there's no gap, there's no space that you can, um, you can come at us at, uh, that you can exploit. Um, uh, I think the, in terms of how we're doing though, Stephen, to, to your question. So um, the first thing that's happening is a lot of reorganization of the alliance, but more profoundly of uh, national defenses, um, in particular in Europe. Um, uh, so we now have a set of plans, war plans and strategic plans uh, that will that tell us how we will manage deterrence and how we would, if we moved into crisis or open conflict, how we would fight. And those plans are critical. You'll hear from General Cavoli this afternoon who owns those plans, who, who drew them up. Uh, because if you follow through the logic of those plans, they tell each national um, defense force what they're going to be doing, where they're going to be doing it, how they're going to be doing it, who they're going to be doing it with. And that is quite transformative. Uh, we haven't had that in the Alliance since the end of the, uh, of the Cold War. Um, with the plans come the need to uh, reform our command and control systems. And there is a lot happening there in terms of the reorganization of headquarters, allocations of specific roles to specific headquarters, growing some headquarters, like, for example, the one in Norfolk, Virginia, which is responsible for the Atlantic uh, and, uh, and Northern Europe. And it comes with a, uh, a capability demand signal. It comes with a bill. Um, and this is the core of my job. Um, and because we now know what the plans are, what you'd need to fight them, and because allies have become much more transparent with us over the last two years about what they've got uh, and what their plans are, uh, I now have a pretty good idea of where the gaps are uh, and therefore what we need to press allies to invest in uh, over the next couple of years. And um, you know, there are areas like we know we're going to need a lot more air and missile defense. Uh, we know we're going to need more deep fires um, to hold uh, targets at risk at long range. Uh, we know we need a lot more logistics and enablement um, capabilities, the ability to move things around, sustain them and supply them. Uh, we need better digital underpinning um, of our force so that we can actually fight in a multi-domain uh, way. And then we still need the ability to bring uh, our land forces together and coalesce them as larger formations, divisions and corps, and fight them coherently. So we've got a pretty big capability challenge ahead of us. Um, the good news is there is now, I think, a recognition in Europe that to meet those capability targets, we are going to need to invest more. And uh, as uh, Ambassador Smith said this morning, uh, things are changing there. We've gone from having half a dozen allies in Europe spending 2% of GDP on defense to having over 20. Um, and I'm, I'm hoping the numbers will keep rising. Uh, uh, even today, I think there's an, uh, an announcement coming out in Canada um, about increased defense spending. So, um, and you have a lot of, in particular, wealthy Northern European allies who were not spending that much on defense over the last two, two decades, now really starting to uh, invest. Now, all of that will take time to have effect. Um, you also need to find the people um, to um, uh, uh, then actually fill out your armed forces, and you need the industrial capacity to, to get there. But I'm kind of quite optimistic that Europeans are now moving in a, in a much stronger direction. The last point I just make is I think sometimes people underestimate that there is a cultural and intellectual reset of the alliance that is as important as the organizational structures and the money and the industrial capacity and the people. Um, actually getting people to understand what deterrence means in the modern world and what defense would mean in the modern world, what it would mean for our whole societies um, uh, if we were under attack, not just 
frontline countries who would obviously feel it most, but also um, rear area countries, if you like, who would almost certainly face massive cyber attacks, possibly air attacks, yeah. disruption to their space-based capabilities, etc. So it is, I think, it, I mean, it's a really exciting time to be in the alliance um, uh, and to be working at NATO because uh, people understand the scale of the challenge and national governments are, I think, uh, really starting to get to grips of what it means. Great, thank you, for, thank you very much. Uh, uh, really uh, opening up the doors to a number of areas, and we, we, we do want to come back to that question of resilience, but, but that's also a good segue to what I wanted to ask uh, Justina Gutkowska. Um, given where you work and live um, on, on the Eastern flank, um, would you share insights from your work at the um, Center for Eastern Studies and, and thinking of Central East European governments about NATO's current forward defense posture? Uh, and the requirements of deterrence by denial and defense, as allies have professed uh, very strongly in the last several years, of every inch of alliance territory? Uh, sure. Uh, thank you for this question. Thank you for the opportunity to share my ideas and views from Poland. Uh, I would um, start with saying that um, NATO's uh, conventional deterrence and defense posture has more, more elements that uh, enhance for presence or for defense, as you as you said, and it's um, uh, and um, I would um, go back in time and um, tell you how uh, this enhanced forward presence was perceived uh, in, uh, on the eastern flank. Uh, it all started, of course, after a, uh, 2014 annexation of Crimea and Russian intervention in Donbas, and there was the first strengthening of deterrence and defense uh, on the on the eastern flank. Uh, it took quite a long time since 2014 because the decision was made 2016. The um, first battle groups came uh, 2017. Uh, four battle groups in three Baltic states and Poland. Um, and back then, it was the the main uh, and the only, actually, uh, substantial NATO military uh, presence uh, on the eastern flank. Uh, so that was some kind of a breakthrough. Um, uh, but at the si same time, uh, each of the um, four NATO battle groups um, amounted to little uh, more than 1,000 troops. Uh, so overall, this NATO presence was, and I think still is, too small to ensure the defense of the Baltic states uh, and Poland. It was uh, intended more as a part of the tripwire strategy um, that would trigger an allied military response. Uh, and that was an outcome of a compromise among NATO member states after 2014, uh, when some of them still wanted to stick to the NATO-Russia founding act that set limitations on stationing substantial forces uh, in the new, uh, back then, 1997, uh, new um, uh, member uh, states uh, of the alliance. But it was not the only NATO response, and I want to underline that because it's 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 important when we uh, uh, when we talk about uh, conventional deterrence and defense uh, now. Uh, back then, NATO decided on um, on uh, a reform of NATO response force, on reform of force and command structures. So there were uh, division level commands uh, uh, headquarters created in Poland, Latvia. Um, there was two um, uh, uh, headquarters quarters created on the strategic level, Joint Force uh, Command Norfolk and Joint Support and Enabling Command in Ulm. And all this presence, uh, it's worth to underline, uh, was supplement supplemented by uh, placing a US ABCT uh, Armored Brigade Combat Team uh, in Poland, 5,000 soldiers. And uh, this presence uh, was reformed and uh, refurbished uh, after 2022 uh, Russian invasion on uh, full-scale invasion on Ukraine, uh, with uh, 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 four more uh, battle groups uh, being established, with a decision uh, to increase uh, battle groups in Lithuania and in Latvia to a brigade. Um, uh, so then NATO-Russia founding uh, act uh, was uh, deemed as non-binding in the conventional realm. And then uh, first exercise, NATO exercises came, which uh, exercised um, re reinforcing these battle groups uh, to a brigade level. 
uh, very important uh, changes, uh, but still not sufficient to call it a forward defense or defense by denial uh, in the opinion of many in the Baltic state uh, and in Poland. But to that, some quali qualitative changes were added that uh, Angus was talking about. Uh, reintroduction of uh, a detailed defense planning with three new regional uh, defense plans, uh, a, re uh, a setup of a NATO force model uh, that was mentioned already in, in, the f uh, um, in the former panel, and as well as Sweden and Finland joining NATO. The strategically changes the landscape uh, in the Baltic uh, Sea region. So very important changes uh, and um, as, um, adding to that, another 5,000 um, US soldiers being placed in Poland and exercising across uh, the northeastern flank. Um, is um, uh, in this setup is the NATO enhanced forward presence on the eastern flank a forward defense or defense uh, by denial? I would say I have doubts, not yet. Maybe we are heading towards, uh, towards this goal, but I think uh, their, uh, um, allies need to invest in capabilities in readiness uh, and in placing uh, additional assets in the Baltic states, Poland and uh, elsewhere uh, on the eastern flank. But it does not mean that uh, deterrent does not work. It does. And I think this is a, a, um, a conviction uh, on the eastern plank, flank and in Poland, because, because behind the battle groups, that this enhanced forward presence on the eastern flank, we have a transatlantic alliance that is politically coherent and that is signaling the will uh, to use whole military potential to, def to defend uh, its, its allies uh, if needed. There is the U.S. military capabilities, European allies that are in the progress of uh, rebuilding their capabilities, and last but not least, national capabilities and investment in national uh, um, armed forces uh, in Poland, in the Baltic states, and elsewhere, elsewhere uh, on the uh, eastern uh, flank. So such uh, calibrated uh, uh, conventional deterrence depends on very much uh, on all many elements, and if some fall. Um, uh, in, if some fall out um, or will be diminished, others must step in or deterrence will fail. So the main question on the eastern flank uh, is not about the current posture, but about the future of de deterrence, that it depends highly on the future of US policy towards Europe, um, having in mind US domestic developments, uh, that depends on potential conflicts in the Indo-Pacific and its consequences for Europe and for the eastern flank, um, that depends on the pace of national and European investments in defense and depends on the state of uh, transatlantic uh, relations. So, but uh, all in all, having in mind the um, anticipation of politically very volatile times also within the alliance, a strong allied military presence on the eastern flank is necessary uh, in order to deter Russia from uh, undertake, undertaking risky adventures. Uh, like, for example, I, and I think this is what we are worrying uh, mostly about um, in the coming years, like starting a conventional limited aggression uh, on the Baltic states uh, because there is not enough forces for uh, defense by denial with a threat of use of nuclear weapons. Um, um, so in order to uh, divide the alliance, uh, in order to, uh, uh, for the allies not to respond, hesitating to, uh, um, you know, to go into nuclear uh, escalation. Um, so therefore, uh, we do need to work on, even if we, the, the conventional deterrence uh, and defense has more elements, I think, working uh, and making progress and strengthening uh, enhanced forward presence to make it um, a forward defense uh, is, an, um, uh, is necessary uh, as perceived on the eastern flank. Great. Thank you very much, Justine. I want to, and I do, I would like to come back maybe to some of the questions where we can talk with also um, Angus about the force model and, and, and the force generation capabilities. but. You led very nicely into another question, that, and, and you're talking about, of course, the, the fact that det the conventional deterrent posture is backed up by the U.S. strategic guarantee and the guarantee, the nuclear capabilities of those two other allies that, that have uh, those nuclear capabilities. So I wanted to turn to Heather Williams and ask her, how do you assess um, the state and general direction of the nuclear dimension of uh, the alliance's deterrent posture, including um, the steps that have been taken or should be taken uh, in uh, to ensure that NATO's non-strategic uh, nuclear deterrent capabilities remain safe, uh, secure, and effective 
uh, steps that have been taken over the last several years. Well, thank you, um, Stephen. Thank you to Georgetown for the invitation. I'm really honored to be on this panel. Um, I, I wanted to start, out, start off by zooming out just a little bit to point out a couple of the fundamentals of NATO's nuclear posture, because I think that those will shape the direction it goes forward in. So first and foremost, NATO has said, as long as nuclear weapons exist, it will remain a nuclear alliance. Um, additionally, I think it's worth pointing out those nuclear capabilities, I, you know, the, the dual capable aircraft mission, any nuclear sharing arrangements, those have been getting a lot of attention lately, but really NATO's, what underpins NATO's nuclear posture are the nuclear forces of the United States, the United Kingdom, and France, particularly the United States. Um, and then the other kind of, uh, I think, decisive factor in the direction that we're going to go in is NATO has also consistently said that they remain committed to arms control, non-proliferation, and disarmament. And so those are three seemingly competing priorities in some ways that are going to have to work together to shape the direction that the alliance goes in. Um, and so with that in mind, um, I, there's a couple um, indicators we're already getting about the direction that, that NATO is going in on these issues. It's been mentioned a few times, there has clearly been an effort by the allies to strengthen the quote unquote deterrence IQ. I should say, I don't like this term, I find it slightly pejorative, but <laughs> if the allies are fine with it, fine. Um, but really it's about relearning deterrence issues. And I particularly commend the new allies, Finland and Sweden, for the efforts that they've been putting in to better understanding what what does it mean to be part of a nuclear alliance? What is nuclear deterrence really about? What is extended nuclear deterrence about? Um, the other direction of travel that I think we're seeing is this um, really impressive unity around NATO's nuclear mission. If you had asked me in January of 2022, is Germany more likely to double its defense budget or to join the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, the Nuclear Ban Treaty, I would have lost a lot of money. Um, and so this unity that we're seeing around the nuclear mission is, um, a really important trend that I don't think we should, we should take for granted. Uh, from my perspective, there are two big factors that I think are going to shape the direction that it goes in. The first, obviously, is Russia, but it's particularly the question of how much is Russia going to rely on nuclear weapons going forward. As we have seen, Russia's conventional forces have not performed particularly well, and they've had to resort to buying some pretty, excuse me, crappy systems off of others. Um, but it isn't just about Russia's conventional performance. It's about the investment that Russia is going to have to put in to rebuild its conventional forces. That is not a quick turnaround process. And while they're doing that, I would anticipate that reliance on nuclear, that they will shift to greater reliance on nuclear weapons. This happened in the 90s as well, obviously. Um, but also, you know, I, I would anticipate Russian continues its nuclear saber rattling. That saber rattling has underpinned it since day one of the invasion. It has taken different sounds, it has looked a bit different, but it has been consistent. Um, disinformation has been a really key part of that. I was glad that came up so much in the previous panel. Mm -hmm. But the second trend that I think is gonna be really important here, um, it is gonna be the impact of two peer competition. This thing that all of us wonks in DC are really obsessed with right. and talking about and focused on right now. Um, from my conversations with the allies, and every time I see Angus, I think I ask him this question, how are the allies thinking about two-peer competition? I think that thinking is, start it seems like that thinking has started, it's still evolving um, a bit, but the way that the allies engage with that issue will have a really significant impact on the alliance's uh, nuclear posture and the dimension there. Um, you know, for example, if the U.S. is um, in a, in, if U.S. conventional forces are diverted to a different theater, what does that mean for the allies? Are they gonna to have to step up and, conventional and contribute more conventionally? Um, and so I, I think the direction of travel really is flexibility. That seems to be what NATO wants more of in its nuclear posture. Mm -hmm. And there's a couple options um, that I'm hearing about that I think could contribute to that. To be clear, I don't agree with all these. I'm just putting them out there to keep it spicy. Um, the, the first one would be uh, uh, supplemental or new nuclear capabilities on the part of the United States. So the most obvious one here is SLICAMN, sea launch cruise missile, nuclear variant, or other regional capabilities. Um, another option would be to look to another important nuclear actor in, um, in NATO, which is the UK. Uh, for example, if the UK wanted to add a fifth boat, or add another leg back to its nuclear delivery platforms. I think there are some pretty serious domestic and financial um, constraints on that, but that's another option. Um, another one, which I'm sure we'll get to, would be um, to expand the nuclear sharing mission within um, Europe. Poland has obviously indicated interest in that. Um, but then another, another option might be a change in nuclear posture and strategy. For example, to consider earlier and more decisive escalation 
either with um, advanced conventional weapons or with nuclear weapons. This last point is one I, I think is really interesting in the context of two-peer competition in particular, because the United States, for example, at least, we're no longer just signaling to one adversary. If we end up in a crisis, we're now signaling to two. Um, and so that's where I think kind of more decisive earlier action could, could be justified. Uh, to your other question, you know, what should be done to remain um, a safe, secure, and effective um, arsenal? Well, as I said, this, you know, NATO's nuclear posture is underpinned by three nuclear possessors, particularly the United States. If you want a safe, secure, and effective NATO um, nuclear posture, you need a safe, secure, and effective US nuclear arsenal. Um, and so at the very least, US has to continue on its current modernization plans. There have been plenty of challenges with that. We all know Sentinel is uh, in, a, in, a difficult, um, in a difficult growing period, we'll say. It has to do with Nunn McCurdy now as well. Um, but so really proceeding apace with US modernization and the current program of record at a minimum, I think is essential for NATO's nuclear, um, nuclear security. Um, but in addition to that, you know, there's things that other um, allies can be doing, participating in nuclear exercise, exercising, um, the alliance continuously evaluating its forces in response to all these changes. And these are things that the alliance really is doing anyways. And so I, I commend that. Um, I, I know this panel is about deterrence, but I also wanted to bring up assurance, which I think is a really key component of this conversation. Because as I'm talking more and more, as I talk to European allies, I'm hearing them more and more um, express their concerns about US credibility. And domestic politics is absolutely a part of that. Um, the other part of that is that it seems like quite a few allies are concerned that um, at what they perceive as competing priorities for US um, attention, particularly in the Middle East and China. Um, to quote uh, a Polish expert who I, I met with in Warsaw a few months ago, uh, said, we are, we are now number three on your list of foreign policy priorities, and it's probably a distant third as well, uh, coming after the war in Gaza and obviously China. Um, and so for, for that, I, I want to make a slightly more impassioned recommendation here to, uh, to my fellow Americans, um, which is that um, you know, in addition to following through with our nuclear modernization plan, uh, I wouldn't dare to hope that we get on the same page domestically about allies, um, but I would hope that we would have enough courage in our convictions to have the debate. Have the debate about um, making the case for why allies are one of our greatest strategic assets and why maintaining transatlantic leadership remains in America's national interest. And I haven't heard that debate yet, and so I hope that we can get to that. No, thank you very much. No, and I would like to come back to that question of, of the peer-to-peer uh, -to -peer deterrence and what impact that might have on extended deter the U.S. extended deterrent, the credibility of that. So uh, you've raised a couple of other good issues that we should definitely come back to. But I did want to turn back a little bit uh, to the initial capabilities for defense and, and back to Angus um, on, um, you know, we did talk, uh, and Justina mentioned, the, you know, the, in, was the earlier discussion of the NATO force model, which has a very ambitious uh, and much larger uh, force generation goals um, uh, and, and very rapid. Um, SACUR has also uh, been working on these plans, uh, and I wondered if you could give us uh, some sense, uh, obviously some of that can't be discussed in any much detail, but uh, whether there might be some additional elements of that or, or perhaps uh, reinforced uh, by, the, uh, by the decisions of the Washington summit on, on uh, both the plans and the, um, and the, uh, the development of, of, the, uh, of the force generation capabilities. Yeah, well, I think this slightly goes to Justina's commentary on, on how do Eastern flank countries feel about the posture we have now and whether that is sufficiently robust enough. And I mean, I think you know, the honest answer is if the way, if, if the only way we were going to defend the Eastern flank was through the battle groups, even when scaled up to brigade level, the answer would be no. Mm. But of course, that's not the only way um, that we plan to, uh, uh, to defend all of the territory of the Alliance. Um, I mean, uh, one of the things which obviously Ukraine can't draw on, but 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 that we would is the enormous amount of air power uh, and power that can be projected from the sea. Um, when, whenever I'm in the Baltic states, you know, I remind them that you do realise an awful lot of the firepower that would defend your country will come from the North Atlantic or the Norwegian Sea, um, for example. Um, uh, but also, we're very focused on this question of actually how do you move the forces that you need into place uh, at the right time and that comes down to two things first of all it comes down well actually three first of all you have to have the right warnings and indicators you need to know 
what's happening. And of course, if you go back to the invasion of Ukraine at the beginning of 2022, actually, we saw it all. We had a big debate about what it meant, but we saw it all. Uh, even the Russians can't actually assemble an invasion force uh, invisibly. So first of all, you need to see what's happening. Secondly, um, uh, you need to act early enough, in particular, to, um, to move forces. And we are um, taking decisions in the alliance now about giving SACA uh, the necessary authorities to make muscle moves and uh, move forces into place before you get to an Article 5 um, situation. And then thirdly, you need, as I said, the kind of capabilities, the logistics to move stuff, uh, and you need the military mobility set up uh, so that you know how you move across uh, Europe at scale. Um, so there's a lot in that kind of mix. On the force model particularly, so essentially what NATO allies, European allies in particular, have been doing for the last 20 years is they've been providing relatively small forces, sending them to the other side of the world or somewhere else, and doing that on a rotational basis. Um, an Article 5 situation is very different. In an Article 5 situation, you need a much larger force um, but you pretty much know where it's going um, and what its job is going to do, uh, what it's going to be. Um, so the, the way in which we organize our forces has, has really changed. Um, last year at the summit in Vilnius, we confirmed that we had about 300,000 forces, uh, uh, troops at high readiness. The number of forces that lie behind that at lower degrees of readiness um, uh, is much, much larger there, than that. And actually, one of the really encouraging things of the last 12 months is that most European allies have come to us and come to SACA and said, in an Article 5 situation, if we've got it, you've got it. Um, pretty much our entire force structures will be made available to NATO um, uh, to, uh, to fight the fight. Um, and we know, as I said earlier, there are lots of capability gaps then within that force structure, and our job is to make sure that allies fill those gaps over the next few years. Uh, but we have, a, we have a much clearer idea now of, of how we will fight and, and where we'll do it. Great, thank you. Uh, and yes, military mobility, but that also is a good segue to what I wanted to ask Justina a little bit about, and there was a discussion Heidi Hart in the first panel about NATO's been very good about learning lessons. I wanted to ask about what you think of the, some of the key lessons from Russia's war on Ukraine uh, for NATO strategy and posture and how those could be applied in enhancing the security of, of NATO and Ukraine which is, uh, I would note, the mission of this new uh, center that uh, NATO defense ministers just agreed to establish in, in Poland on, on uh, the NATO-Ukraine cooperation on uh, joint uh, training, education, and uh, lessons learned. Mm. Um, definitely, uh, NATO has a lot to learn from Ukraine, both from Ukraine's adaptability uh, to what is happening on the battlefield, on the way, uh, from the way uh, how Russia is waging this war and uh, what Russia is learning uh, from the war, war fighting. But uh, overall, I would like to make a comment that uh, the war in Ukraine will probably be not repeated in that form if we had a conflict between Russia and NATO uh, because of what Angus just said, allied air power, long range strikes, uh, intelligence and rec reconnaissance. Uh, that uh, would change uh, um, substantially the picture of how this war, uh, uh, the, a war, a conflict between, between Russia and NATO uh, would be waged uh, from the first days. Um, this was, uh, or these capabilities, uh, uh, something that uh, Ukraine did not have from the start of this war, or not, not in the, that, in some parts, not in that magnitude, uh, and uh, currently has only uh, a limited uh, access to. Um, and um, uh, as I mentioned, we need also to look at uh, lessons learned uh, that Russia takes uh, from this war, from the use of Western-made uh, weapon systems. Uh, my observation as a civilian, not a military, what, what NATO should learn and what Poland uh, is learning from, from this war is that we need more mass. We talked about that in the previous panel. Uh, the magnitude of, of the uh, conflict war in Ukraine shows that European armed forces need to grow, need to grow uh, to build bigger reserves. Uh, we have a discussion in Europe on the eastern flank ongoing or decision made already on reintroduction of compulsory 
compulsory draft, uh, extending the voluntary one in case of the Nordic states, drafting on drafting women, on, or on introducing um, a kind of state service uh, that would be an alternative to uh, military uh, uh, draft for young people to serve in civilian uh, crisis response formations. Um, so this is a discussion that we have in Poland. We have abolished the draft uh, 2011, and right now uh, uh, we have a public discussion not, that is not yet uh, 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 taken seriously by the pol politicians and military, but uh, some decisions were made on uh, creating bigger reserves. Uh, more air defense, uh, um, uh, sorry, uh, more mass, more heavy land formations. Uh, I, I think if you look at uh, Polish, uh, what, what um, uh, Poland, on Poland's decision uh, on uh, military procurement, that shows that uh, Poland's lesson was to uh, strengthen land forces, armored, uh, heavy armored capabilities. Uh, and the war in Ukraine, even if it will not be repeated as uh, it is being waged right now, shows to us that, the, uh, uh, that uh, NATO needs to re reinvest in the military capabilities. It thought that some years ago that are gone. Uh, so, uh, and another issue is we need to exercise uh, in bigger formations. I think this is a point that uh, we uh, see uh, in the training uh, of Ukrainian forces, Ukrainian soldiers in Europe, the, a point that is missing and that has an effect, negative effect on their performance on the battlefield uh, in Ukraine. Um, a third point, more air defense. Uh, I think we uh, observing uh, Ukrainian air defenses, uh, we need to know that Ukraine uh, has had huge amounts of post-Soviet equipment that helped it to defend Ukraine city cities. Uh, later on, uh, uh, this post-Soviet equipment was uh, uh, rep uh, replaced or supplemented by Western air defense systems, but we don't have it in NATO. Uh, we, uh, there is a huge gap uh, to be dealt with by all member states, uh, NATO eastern, northeastern flank uh, states included. Uh, we have right now problems in Poland where we have, you might have heard about that, where we have Russian missiles uh, flying through Polish uh, airspace, Turkey, uh, t taking a turn for a second time. Um, uh, and attacking uh, Ukrainian territory um, with, uh, in my opinion and uh, in the opinion of many Poles, Russia uh, deliberately testing our reactions where we don't have capabilities to put uh, nationally uh, and uh, limited capabilities within NATO. Uh, we don't have ground-based systems to put them on the Polish-Ukrainian border uh, to deter Russia from such moves or to shoot down uh, such missiles with uh, ground base uh, air defense systems. That shows how uh, huge this gap is and how quickly uh, we need to uh, invest in it. Poland is doing that, but it takes time. Uh, it's working with the US on uh, mid range air defense, Patriot with the UK on lower levels. Um, so the only way to counter such uh, um, uh, Russian moves is to use uh, fighter jets and try to shoot down uh, in the future um, uh, Russian missiles from the air. Uh, more long-range uh, strike capabilities. This is my fourth point. We sh we um, we have seen the discussions and leaked conversations uh, from Germany, from the top um, you know, military uh, representatives of the Bundeswehr, talking about uh, uh, Scalp and uh, Storm uh, French and UK long-range missiles um, uh, being um, depleted and therefore uh, the need for delivering uh, towers. So definitely uh, there is a need to uh, invest uh, in our long-range uh, uh, long-range strike uh, capabilities and to increase uh, the stocks. More ammunition, this is obvious, natural, we have been talking about that. Um, but what, uh, what is uh, particularly interesting from, from the war in Ukraine and from the Ukrainian adaptability is introdu introducing inter uh, um, innovation to the battleground, how to 
do that quickly, how to change the mode of operation of arms industry. This is, a, is not accustomed to such a pace of uh, development uh, and change, and I think Ukrainian can teach us uh, um, uh, here some lessons. Um, I have a few points, but I will end with, uh, with uh, an, an issue of civilian resilience. Uh, that is particularly uh, important to us on the northeastern flank, how to prepare society to function in crisis and conflict situation, uh, hugely important to learn lessons from Ukraine, and how to move, for example, major public uh, um, services online, that you, something that Ukraine has done under the, uh, the war conditions. Poland is very advanced in that, and uh, I think Ukraine can, uh, can teach us uh, a lot of, we, we can learn uh, a lot from, from Ukraine. Uh, also, civil-military cooperation, uh, that would be another point. Um, and uh, um, well, I, 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 I'll, I'll stay. Oh, great, thank here. you. And uh, when I, was, I do want to come back to the nuclear question, but before we do, since you mentioned resilience, I know that Angus has been working on, and his colleagues in, in NATO headquarters have been working on uh, looking at ways to encourage cooperation among allies and, and strengthening their national resilience, defense, industrial capability. If you might touch on that as just uh, briefly uh, before we go to the, and then I'll come back to Heather and, and we'll go to some questions from the audience. Sure. Um, well, I've just you know, introduced it really well. I think there are, there are two kind of big aspects of this. So the first is, are societies and civilian governments, are they thinking about and do they have plans for how they would experience a war, essentially? And this is partly a psychological shift, and you've seen some allies actually addressing their populations very directly um, about this. Um, countries like Sweden and Denmark have sort of stood up very boldly recently and said to their populations, you need to be ready for the prospect of war. But it's also about, are you planning to, uh, how you would keep going things like provision of energy, food, uh, telecommunications, healthcare, transport, etc. So what we do in NATO is uh, we set benchmarks for what does good look like in um, each of these areas, and we now have a process of, of assessing allies uh, against that, helping them to learn from each other, uh, do sort of compare and contrast. The, the other aspect to this is the relationship between the military and the civilians um, uh, in, a, in a war. So many civilian governments uh, over the last 20, 30 years have got quite used to the idea that if there is a civilian contingency, you turn to the military for help with a pandemic or a natural disaster or a terrorist attack. In a full-scale Article 5 situation, actually that dynamic is likely to get reversed. Uh, because the military will be flat out dealing with the military threat. What it will need from the civilian side is access to transport, access to much larger healthcare, um, much less you know, dealing with mass casualties, uh, for example, um, probably access to stocks of food and energy and things like that that it wouldn't be able to, to generate organically. So this is why one of the things we're looking at for the Washington summit is, is allies making a pledge that they will all have nationally, each according to their own systems, uh, a, a mechanism for doing that civ mill, as we call it, civilian military planning, so that they know they are ready for that. There is a third aspect to resilience, um, which is as well making sure that you know, our own infrastructure is not vulnerable to interference from um, uh, uh, hostile powers. And that's obviously a lot about Russia, but it's also a lot about China. And um, uh, you know, when you look at how embedded China has become in uh, a lot of infrastructure uh, and sensitive services uh, uh, in a number of our allied countries. There is quite a big debate going on in NATO and in the European Union uh, about how do we reduce the risks um, of, of those dependencies being exploited uh, in, a, in a period of crisis or war. Great, thank you. And, and before we do shift to some audience questions, I did want to ask you, come back to you, Heather, and ask you, you, you touched on some very important issues, I think, on the importance of strategic the strategic uh, the, the U.S. and other nuclear capabilities that, at the strategic level that back up NATO's deterrent posture. You mentioned the U.K. as an option. What about um, 
the question of uh, perhaps uh, Europe uh, filling both the combined UK French effort in filling some of the pressure that the US is going to feel as it continues to focus on deterring uh, China and and not, let's not forget North Korea as well. Uh, Sten Running mentioned the interesting comment about is that part of what was behind Macron's gambit of saying, well, if you put a nuclear armed uh, power on the ground in Ukraine, is that going to give Putin some second thoughts? And I know you've been thinking about some of these issues uh, with regard to Russia's saber rattling at uh, at CSIS uh, in the Pony Project on uh, deter and divide. So maybe you could. It's a bit of a Merv question, but maybe you could touch on a couple of those issues before we. I love Mervin. Um <laughs> So I'll, I'll I'll start with the one on the uh, the contributions of the UK. Um, in France and this debate going on now about a Euro deterrent. Um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a European. I spent enough time there. I'm a little bit skeptical that Europeans um, will put aside hundreds of years of history to completely trust one country, um, one of them. Uh, no, no offense to any of the French in the room. I'm really sorry. Um, but it's not to completely rule it out. I think the Sten's points are really, really well taken. Um, and that just um, it highlights how much really is um, hinging on the upcoming uh, US election. There is one thing about the UK and French arsenals that I do want to highlight, though, and that is the French arsenal has really um, historically been defined by its ambiguity, mm -hmm. um, by uh, which they have really religiously stuck to, whereas the Brits, um, I think, have tried to strike a, a slightly um, different balance in terms of transparency into their arsenal, transparency into numbers, and transparency into their doctrine. And in recent years, in uh, the subsequent uh, integrated reviews that the UK has done, I think we are seeing more of a shift towards ambiguity in the UK's nuclear posture. And I think this is a really fascinating question that NATO itself is also taking up, which is, you know, when it comes to nuclear issues, do we draw red lines? Article 5 is as strong of a red line, really, as you can say. Um, but the nuclear component, um, I, I think we're seeing that shift among the allies towards greater strategic ambiguity um, overall. And then to your, your question about um, how to respond to nuclear saber rattling by the Russians, um, I actually think the alliance has done a pretty good job um, at this thus far. I saw um, the Deputy Secretary General recently called it out as psychological intimidation, uh, which I I think is a great, great point and something that all of us have to kind of sparse out how much of this is rhetoric and how much is reality um, and trying, trying to address it that way. And so I think some of the things that the Alliance did really well that it should continue to do, um, first and foremost, is the intelligence sharing component. Um, that was, I, I thought, really exemplar in the lead up to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, both within the alliance, but also more publicly, um, but also calling out and trying to combat Russian disinformation campaigns. And I mean, Russian disinformation is um, really, it, it's, it's so pervasive, but in the nuclear space in particular, we're seeing it take on certain flavors mm -hmm. um, and it's really aggressive. So for example, in October, 2022, there was a six day period when ev like every single Russian official said, Ukraine is about to use a dirty bomb. Um, and this was clearly a disinformation campaign. Maybe it was an attempt at a false flag. Maybe it was trying to shape a wider narrative. Um, but NATO members came out and pretty clearly and decisively said any nuclear use by Russia will be met with catastrophic consequences. No, Ukraine is not trying to develop a dirty bomb and really trying to um, stand up to Russian disinformation in that way. With that said, I think we should anticipate Russian disinformation, you know, it's a multi-headed hydra. It's going to keep evolving. It's going to keep changing. Mm -hmm. And the purpose of it is to divide the allies. And so staying really um, on the front foot and forward leaning on combating that disinformation and combating it across the alliance. I think some allies have taken more of a leadership role in combating disinformation than others. And that's something I think would be great to see, um, to see more of the allies kind of get involved with. Um, I, I think that the only, one, just one other point around this disinformation and, but not just disinformation, but Russian nuclear saber rattling, and this gets to the core of what deterrence is, which is we have to convince Russia that using nuclear weapons will not serve its long-term interests that it will not achieve whatever those desired gains are by using nuclear weapons. And there are a lot of different ways to do that. And it, that might mean, um, you know, surety of some sort of um, retaliation response on the part of NATO. Um, but the other idea that I'll put out there has to do with what would be the international reaction. Um, if, you know, if Russia is the first one to use a nuclear weapon, um, in, in, recent, in recent memory, in however many years, um, then you know, what would the international community do as a response to that? I've had a lot of debates about this recently because I don't know if Russia, if, if Putin is facing a decisive military loss, does he care what the international community thinks? Mm -hmm. 
Um, the truth is none of us know. If anyone in this room knows what Vladimir Putin is thinking, then please come to the mic and tell us. Um, but I, I think that that is the, the best way to really stand up to Russian nuclear saber rattling is having that decisiveness that you will not get what you want by doing this. Great, thank you. And yeah, and Ambassador Smith mentioned that importance of the information sharing that was going on in terms of what was Russia actually doing when it was rattling that saber was important. But uh, so thank you. All right, we have about 20 minutes for questions from the audience. Uh, as you know, you've been directed to go to the microphone, if you would, and uh, identify yourself. And we look forward to some additional questions. I don't see anyone yet rising to the occasion. Oh, good. Someone's approaching. Hi, thank yes. you uh, very much for being here and uh, taking the time. Um, my could question you, is... Could you tell well, us who you are? I'm sorry. Uh, my name is Jason Rodriguez. Yes, Jason. Um, I'm a PMF in OSD policy currently. Okay. Um, so my question is, um, what lessons from deterrence in Ukraine and on the eastern flank should or maybe more importantly should not be applied to deterrence in the case of Taiwan? I think it's a lot. Oh. Taiwan. It's an interesting one. Ready two at a time? Or are we going? Should we? Okay, we'll take a few and uh, we'll let people uh, cogitate on that one. That, um, yes, go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, awesome. Thank you all so much for being here and taking the time to speak with us. Uh, my name is Ellen Harnish. I am a graduate student in the Security Studies program here at Georgetown. I also work in OSD. Um, and my question kind of surrounds this point that's been brought up about political developments and the implications for European security, you know, given what could happen in U.S. politics in the next few months, um, specifically for Poland. Given the tensions, you know, in Europe, outside of Europe, how feasible do we think it is that that France or the UK could extend their nuclear umbrella over Poland, or would it be more prudent for Poland to think about developing its own nuclear weapons? And kind of, if so, when should that start happening? So just curious for your thoughts and opinions on that. Thank you. Okay, maybe why don't we, uh, so we don't lose the first one, what, should we, um do you want to take? Do you want to take that second question, Justina, and then we come back to it? Uh, on oh, maybe, maybe we can take another one. Take one more. Okay. All right. Go ahead. All right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I'm sorry. We'll take one more. Hi, I'm a uh, Christian Amelia. I'm a recent grad from uh, the SSP program. Um, I had a quick question. You know, Dr. Williams brought up that arms control is, you know, kind of still a pillar of, of NATO's strategy to some degree, but with the New Start Treaty set to expire in February of 2026, and Russia and China really having no interest in engaging in arms control. I'm curious what you all think. Should that still be a pillar? And, and if so, how do you actually operationalize that? Thank you. Okay. All right, Justina, you want to start yeah. now on yeah. Poland yeah. and nukes, and then we'll um, clear capabilities and we'll come back to There is a, f a lot of uncertainty um, in Poland uh, about the future of uh, U.S. security and defense policy towards Europe and towards uh, the eastern flank. And the situation that we are right, or you are right now in uh, here in, uh, in the U.S., uh, the uh, months-long discussions uh, in the Congress on U Ukraine uh, supplemental uh, are raising, I would say, this level of uncertainty because they are showing to us that the domestic situation, domestic pol politics um, uh, has a hand uh, over um, uh, security and defense uh, strategic strategy goals. Uh, but I think that overall Poland um, has a different experience of Trump administration um, than the rest of uh, Europe, a much more positive one, uh, where Poland has created a workable, uh, bilat more, more bilateral relationship with Trump administration, and has, uh, through which uh, Poland has increased U.S. military, economic uh, presence, and political ties. Uh, we have another uh, government in place. Uh, which uh, will make a difference since there is no, um, I would say, I, kind of ideological affinity. Uh, so that will be a different situation. But still, I think there, there is some distance uh, from the rest of Europe uh, and discussions uh, in Poland about the immediate um, repercussions of a change of uh, administration for the eastern flank uh, and, and for Poland. Uh, the uh, discussion about the nuclear deterrent uh, 
is there in the public, uh, but I think um, and uh, is beginning to uh, to be also in the in the Polish uh, administration. Overall, uh, there is a conviction that the U.S. nuclear deterrent uh, is still in place and uh, will remain in place. That we need to um, uh, do uh, much more in the conventional realm to convince the uh, uh, future. U.S. administration, where be it Republican or uh, de uh, Democrat, that uh, alliances, um, uh, that the burden sharing in uh, the alliances is much fairer to them. That uh, alliance, uh, NATO, transatlantic partnership is of use and of benefit to the U.S. Uh, and I think there is, uh, and therefore from Poland you can uh, hear um, the proposals of setting uh, the bar for defense spending higher to 3% in the coming years, um, for making European uh, greater input into regional defense plans, uh, in um, proposals to uh, strengthen European pillar of NATO, strengthen European engagements as a sort of um, uh, an input, uh, a greater show of uh, uh, European willingness to cooperate and uh, with the uh, future uh, Republican ad administration. Nuclear discussions for us are difficult because, Nash of course, there are in the public ideas about going nuclear for Poland, but uh, Poland does not have uh, civilian nuclear uh, uh, power plants, uh, Poland, uh, and hence that would be very difficult and only with the help of a major uh, ally that has nuclear weapons to develop nuclear weapons on its own. That would take uh, uh, time and in the meantime uh, Poland would become very vulnerable uh, to some kind of Russian uh, retaliation strikes uh, um, uh, while developing own nuclear capabilities. Uh, with regard to European deterrent uh, or um, ideas uh, on uh, enhancing European deterrence, I think there is a conversation about uh, the French ideas, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, on the margins uh, of uh, um, acknowledging that the U.S. nuclear deterrent uh, is, is in place, uh, I suppose that there will be uh, discussions uh, in the future on how to um, strengthen European component and overall new, uh, NATO's uh, nuclear deterrence, and th that would be the way Poland would like to Thank you. Uh, go. Um, so if we could turn to the, I do want to come back to the lessons for Taiwan, of ta for Taiwan but uh, um, on, the, on, the, on the question of arms control yep. and also, Heather, maybe uh, that's one other thing we hadn't talked about is if we talk about in the context of Russian nuclear saber rattling and crisis communications, what uh, is lacking now in terms of there not being, uh, there had been some channels established both at NATO and the U.S. Uh, in terms of strategic uh, crisis communications with the Russians. Um, do you think there's some area from scope for that as well, or re, uh, finding a way forward on, yeah. on reviving some of those uh, crisis communications capabilities? Yeah, so um, Christian, thank you for the question. This is literally my favorite topic. I, I would have thought I'd planted that question. Um, but you know, should arms control still be part of NATO's position? Absolutely it should be. Um, however, arms control of the future is gonna look very different from arms control of the past. I am not saying that we should be pinning ourselves to something that looks like START or INF or New START. We need to take a more expansive approach to thinking about arms control. Um, arms control as we know it is dead. It really is. Like New START is kind of the last of its kind. Um, I asked some folks on the Pony team to look at what, um, what arms control agreements um, from the Cold War era are still in place and have not been somehow soiled by Russia. And it's a very short list. It's like, I think I could count it on one hand. Mm. Um, and so arms control as we know it, just, it, it's really not a thing anymore. Um, and you know, one of those was like the seabed treaty. And, you know, no, no disrespect to the seabed treaty, but that's not exactly the type of arms control that I think we're particularly interested in right now. But with that said, arms control is not just legally binding, verifiable <coughs> treaties. If we take this more expansive approach, think of arms control as informal agreements, things like the incidents at sea agreement. Um, which in terms of crisis communication and trying to avoid escalation, that's a really great example of the direction of travel that I, I think we could be moving in. Um, other examples might be things that take a more asymmetric approach. You could have joint, um, uh, joint statements that are focused on controlling behaviors rather than on, patrol, on controlling weapons. 
shameless self-promotion. I have an article in Foreign Affairs on this called, Be I think it's called Behavioral Arms Control. Um, and so it's not about rejecting arms control altogether. It's just about changing um, what arms control, what we think arms control looks like and what we want it to achieve. And then just one other point on this. I, I, I haven't brought it up yet, but I think it's a really important one. The NPT is also arms control. Mm -hmm. And when we have these conversations about, oh, maybe another NATO ally will de develop an independent nuclear weapon, you know, these surveys coming out of South Korea, you know, when we, when we have those conversations, we have to also talk about the NPT. Uh, I, I believe the NPT is pretty weak at the moment, but I also think that we are lucky to have it and we should do everything we can to preserve and protect it. Um, and so with that said, NATO and NATO's nuclear members in particular have to stay committed to arms control because they will be held accountable in the NPT. And there are a growing number of countries in the NPT that recognize, well, arms control as we know it is dead, so what are you doing for Article 6? And that is literally how those conversations go. And so to maintain the NPT, NATO has to keep this commitment to arms control. And then just final point, another reason I'm pretty skeptical about this idea of you know, new independent actor, nuclear actors um, like blossoming among America's allies. I mean, is Poland really gonna be the first country since North Korea to withdraw from the NPT? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. I don't think that about South Korea either. Um, and so, but that's also why we need the NPT and we need to keep it healthy. And so arms control might look different, but we still need it, if anything, for that reason. Okay, and the, man, the person in the back, just give me patience for one last opportunity. I want to do pick up. And Agnes, I, yeah. Agnes, I know the defense of Taiwan is not definitely in your, your responsibility, but obviously we, we do know, or we, we certainly there's a lot of evidence that the, the PRC is watching carefully the lessons that Russia is learning in, in Ukraine um, in terms of uh, resilience, uh, unexpected resilience, the uh, limited of capability of, of some of their cyber and other uh, efforts to disrupt Ukrainian capabilities of uh, space. Um, I wonder if you might touch on, on maybe some of the, or at least what, what do you think some of the NATO has lessons have drawn about, uh, mm. about the war in Ukraine that, that uh, may also be exportable, let's say? Well, just very quickly on the other two questions. Sorry, I mean, I agree with everything Heather said on arms yeah. control. And of course, not only would Poland have to withdraw from the NPT, but any ally that helped Poland mm. would yes. have to withdraw mm. from mm. the NPT. Mm. So okay. it's a real, uh, 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 that's a real uh, no-go, I think. Um, uh, and on, on the nuclear deterrence point, I mean, of course, the UK does extend its nuclear deterrence to Poland and to all members of NATO, because uh, the UK's nuclear deterrence is specifically assigned to NATO. It's actually the only one of the, of the P3 that, that does that in, in, in those terms. Um, uh, and I do think that you know, even if um, you were to see a changed UK and French posture um, for the reasons that um, uh, Heather alluded to earlier, uh, it would almost certainly still be within a broadly NATO framework. Um, that's the only credible framework uh, in which to, to do that. But what lessons have we learned from, um, uh, from Taiwan? Well, I think the most important lesson is don't let conventional deterrence um, slip in the first place. Because nuclear compellents, i.e. rocking up and saying, do this or I'll nuke you, is really difficult and not very credible. Mm -hmm. uh, nuclear deterrence, I've already done this, and if you want to do anything about it, uh, you risk a nuclear response. That's arguably more credible. Um, so don't get yourself in the situation where uh, your opponent has a conventional advantage over you, has, has achieved something, and is then bringing nuclear deterrence into play to try and um, uh, stop you doing anything about it. I think that's overwhelmingly the most important lesson. But I think you know, we would also look at the kind of broader dimensions of deterrence. Um, uh, you know, why did Putin make the, the mistake of invading Ukraine in the first place? Because his understanding of Ukrainian intent, his understanding of Ukrainian coherence were clearly wrong. Um, uh, we mustn't let Russia or indeed any other ad adversary make the same mistake about us. We have to kind of constantly remind them that our intent, our willingness to fight and defend ourselves, our coherence, uh, they are all absolutely uh, strong. So it's a mixture of conventional deterrence is the basis on which uh, a lot of things rest, and that broader sense of, of psychological, political coherence and, and, and will. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm sorry, the person at the microphone in the back there, I can't quite see you, but. Uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, my name is Jakob Grein. I'm also a graduate student in the Security Studies program. 
And my question concerns strategic culture. Um, you're very much at the vanguard of European and transatlantic security as experts, as policymakers. Um, do you see some kind of convergence towards a unified European or NATO strategic culture, or do affairs within NATO continue to be overdetermined by national strategic cultures mm. and individual sort of material and strategic considerations? Thank you. Right. And uh, I think there's another couple of questions. Why don't we take them together since we're getting uh, close on time? Uh, hi, my name is Peter Roberto. I work at the Center for European Policy Analysis. Uh, I just wanted to ask uh, about those defense and deterrence plans uh, and how NATO and its allies can incorporate other partners like Ukraine or Georgia that are facing uh, Russian forces uh, into those longer term defense plans in the next 10 to 15 years in the interim uh, to NATO membership. Okay, and then one last uh, one, please. Great, thank you, and my thanks to the panel for a very engaging uh, discussion. Question about uh, resilience um, and to our ASG, uh, particularly, but others uh, welcome on this topic. Uh, I'm Nathan Rogers, by the way, from Canmore Company, a lot of work in the resilience space, specifically in the transatlantic uh, arena. Uh, question as we approach, of course, the summit, um, as you mentioned, the uh, pledge for civ mill planning in this regard. Of course, we've taken a lot of steps in the resilience uh, discussion with, with NATO. Interested in uh, any, if you can unpack that a little bit more for us, uh, where we're going in the resilience agenda. Of course, we have an original commitment to enhance resilience from the Warsaw Summit 2016. We've had this, uh, the Allies have doubled down on this in 2021. What's in store this year for the resilience? Uh, and would you agree resilience is increasingly central to Allied uh, deterrence and defense? Uh, of course, militaries you know, just go to war, but nations do whole of governments, whole communities uh, responsible for being a part of this. Interested in if you could unpack that for us and where uh, the alliance is going for resilience. Thank you. Maybe if uh, I'll start with uh, Angus, if you want to lose that question and, the, and the, the, the one on DDA, perhaps, if you would be willing to address that quickly and then. Yeah, so just I'll start with the one on culture, because I think that's a really important point. Um, so go back, I think, to the fact that we now have a defense and deterrence or deterrence and defense strategy that is based on a set of plans that will, over the next few years, give allies a much more granular uh, understanding of exactly what their armed forces are supposed to do. That will drive a level of requirement for interoperability, uh, the ability to fight together both at the granular level and then at the broader kind of strategic level that we haven't seen since the end of the Cold War. And I think that is already starting to uh, make or force our allied armed forces to become a bit less nationally focused and a bit more alliance focused. And that some of it is kind of basic, some of it's training, but some of it is, for example, equipment. So we have a standard artillery shell um, in NATO, 155 millimeters. It turns out that over the last 20 years, allies have all gone off and slightly tweaked their artillery um, and, and the shells that go in it. So it turns out you can't put a 155 millimeter shell from one ally into the gun of another. And that's happened for all sorts of perfectly understandable reasons, but it's now got to be reversed. And, and we are now, um, I think, sort of going back to a much tougher focus on interoperability standardization. Um, and it's, as I said, it's both technical and it's cultural. On resilience and kind of what next, um, I mean, I, I, we always make the point that resilience is a national responsibility and some allies would get quite cross with me if I didn't make that point um, uh, early on. But I think where we're probably going is um, we've got a cycle now of looking at how allies perform against our resilience baselines. I think over time that, that cycle will get more demanding, will get more granular in what we're looking at. Um, and we will do more to support allies learning from each other and supporting each other uh, uh, from that. Secondly, I think the broader question of industrial resilience has really come into play over the last two years when we've seen how much uh, both North America and Europe has struggled to produce quickly enough what we need both to support Ukraine and to support our own armed forces. So I think industrial policy, defense industrial policy has become an issue. And then I think the third area I would see really developing 
is the idea of partnership between the private sector and uh, and the public mm -hmm. sector when it comes to resilience. That the answer to resilience is not simply to just make your state bigger and bigger uh, and to add more and more functions to it and more and more capability. The answer is to have properly planned partnerships with the private sector. Um, off, yeah, transport would be a really good example. Um, the most important trans single transport actor in European security is probably Deutsche Bahn. The German railway system, which would be absolutely essential to moving things through the centre of Europe uh, in a crisis. So it's those kind of partnerships and understandings that we're probably going to have to um, spend more time on. Thank you. Well, and just uh, turning to Justina and, and uh, Heather, uh, in the, briefly um, on the question of culture, uh, any, any thoughts on how the Alliance is doing in maintaining its strategic uh, culture or cohesion? Yes. Uh, Thank you. That is a very interesting question. Um, I think that uh, the, uh, the Alliance have harmonized uh, to a certain extent uh, with regard to Russia the, uh, and understood uh, Russian goals um, uh, and Russian way of uh, thinking, but still we see that some um, divisions uh, in understanding how to react uh, to um, what Russia uh, is doing against Ukraine are still there. And I would uh, give two examples. I think that there is uh, a difference in approach, th th there is a difference in uh, approaches on how, uh, on what, uh, how the West should uh, uh, shape the strategy of military deliveries to Ukraine and I see a clear division between uh, the Eastern flank and Western Europe together with the US uh, with uh, Western Europe being more cautious, red, with setting red lines that gradually um, have been crossed but still are man maintained and with Eastern Europe uh, being uh, of the opinion that we should uh, strive uh, to uh, give Ukrainians what we can from the very beginning and uh, in order uh, for them to um, push out uh, Russians as quickly as possible. So this uh, fear of escalation that has uh, and is ex has been existing here in the West is not is, is present to a lesser extent in Poland. The fear of domestic consequences uh, of a Russian defeat uh, is uh, here much more present than on, on the eastern flank. And the understanding that Russia needs to be defe defeated in order for peace uh, to be maintained in, um, in uh, Eastern Europe uh, is strongly in, uh, on the eastern flank and not that much in uh, Western Europe. So I think still we have different understanding how to, how to deal with, with Russia and Russian aggression and what should be the end state of the war. Uh, so I see the first division between the no, uh, no Eastern um, flank members of the Alliance and Western Europe together with the US. And the second uh, division that emerged lately is a very interesting one and shows to me how difficult we will have, uh, uh, how difficult situation we will have in Europe if uh, the US uh, will uh, withdraw. Uh, then we, we have uh, had an um, exchange uh, of positions and statements between France and Germany on French or Macron's proposal on putting soldiers in, uh, in Ukraine. France's understanding is if there is less Europe, Euro uh, if, there, if there is uh, less uh, US in Europe, uh, Europe needs to step in. Right. German's understanding is if there is less Europe, uh, less US in Europe, uh, we need to be very, very careful. Well, thank you. No, we, we will have to continue some of this discussion into, into the break and into the afternoon, but I wanted to give Heather one last uh, sort of uh, chance to make one last comment. I'll, I'll be very quick on, I just want to make a really quick observation on the influence of history on strategic culture, because I think you're asking a really important question. Are we seeing a convergence in strategic culture within NATO? I mean, the answer is yes and no. From a historical perspective, these allies are united by a shared history, by a shared interest in things like democracy and rules-based international order that has carried forward over decades. On the other hand, there is not a convergence and the allies are not a monolith. Um, and just to end with two, two kind of personal observations, when I moved to Europe from the US, the most shocking thing to me is the proximity of war. War feels so much closer in Europe. I mean, this was in 2010, 2009, that you know, every, every British train station has etched in marble the names of the kids from that town who died in a war. 
that sense that war is so close and that war can happen, and it could be by your neighbor, that feeling doesn't really pervade or sink in the way that it does in the US. And so that's, that influences strategic culture. And then the other very quick observation, it is, the Allies are not a monolith. So that was my observation when I moved to Europe. When I moved back here and being in Washington, everyone, including me, says, the Allies, the Allies, the Allies, as if there's only 32 opinions, not to mention the Indo-Pacific. You know, within each one of the Allies, there's probably 100 other opinions. Um, and so I think from the US perspective, we still have a little bit of a historical hang up on treating the allies as if they are all the same and always speak in one voice. And that affects our strategic culture as well. Um, and so that, that's something that I really am trying to push um, you know, in, in my own work is to really have a better understanding of the allies on that much more granular, granular level because ultimately that will strengthen the alliance itself. Well, that's a very nice coda to this panel uh, talking about the future of defense and deterrence and why it has to continue to work in the interest of, of all the members of the transatlantic community and the wider world. So please join me. We're at, uh, at the, the break time for lunch. Uh, please join me in thanking our panelists for their providing us a very rich intellectual menu. Thank you, panelists. We are grateful for your insights and discussions on NATO's future of deterrence. Uh, once again, we ask that you kindly remain in your seats for a moment as our speakers depart the stage. Our next panel, titled U.S. and European Perspectives on Alliance Burden Sharing, will begin streaming live at 12.45 p.m. For those joining us virtually, we invite you to tune in. It is a virtual-only panel. For those <clears throat> Excuse me. For those of us here in Gaston, we will be breaking for lunch. We encourage you to take advantage of the food options available on campus and nearby restaurants during this time. Please hold on to your lanyards as you'll need them to gain readmittance to the conference following the lunch break. Please plan to be back in Gaston and seated by 1.50 p.m. in time for the start of our third panel of the day, which, we will, which will explore NATO's role in the Indo-Pacific. Thank you.
Everyone and uh, welcome to Riggs Library for our lunchtime panel on U.S. and European perspectives and alliance burden sharing. Joining us for our lunch discussion today, we have Dr. Sophia Besch, Camille Grand, and Professors Barry Posen and Brian Blinkenship. Sophia Besch is a fellow in the Europe Program at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. Her area of expertise is European defense policy and. Prior to this, she was a senior research fellow at the Center for European Reform in London and Berlin, where she was lead researcher on European defense industrial policy, the EU's role in European defense, German defense policy, and the security implications of Brexit. Camille Grand is a distinguished policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. He leads the organization's defense, security, and technology initiative. And previously, he also worked as assistant secretary general for defense investment at NATO from 2016 to 2022, piloting NATO's work in capability, delivery, missile defense, and armament and technology cooperation. He's also served on several independent expert groups and boards for the UN, the EU, NATO, and the French government. Professor Barry Posen is Ford International Professor of Political Science at MIT, Director Emeritus of the MIT Security Studies Program, and serves on the Executive Committee of Seminar 21, a platform connecting the worlds of policymaking and academia within the national security community. He's the author of numerous books with Cornell University Press, including Restraint, a new foundation for US grand strategy. Professor Brian Blankenship will be our moderator. He's an assistant professor of political science at the University of Miami. His research interests lie at the intersection of international security and international cooperation with a substantive focus on US foreign policy and the politics of military alliances. Uh, he was previously a Stanton Nuclear Security Fellow with the Council on Foreign Relations, and he's author also the author of a recent book from Cornell University Press on today's topic. Uh, his book, which is superb and I highly commend to everyone, is titled The Burden-Sharing Dilemma, Coercive Diplomacy in U.S. Alliance Politics. Please join me in welcoming the panel. All right, well, fantastic. Thank you, Sara, for the introduction. Uh, it is my pleasure to moderate this panel on uh, US and European perspectives on alliance burden sharing. Uh, we have three fantastic panelists, as, as Sara noted. So uh, to set the stage a little bit, um, our subject today is burden sharing. Uh, burden sharing is one of the most important issues in any alliance, uh, but, but, but particularly in the NATO alliance. Uh, burden sharing, in many ways, is the mechanism by which an alliance pools resources, aggregates resources for the purposes of achieving common objectives. Without burden sharing, you risk either not having enough resources to do the job, or you risk unduly burdening one or a subset of members, causing, uh, causing mayhem and discord in the alliance. Uh, and in part for that, for that reason, in part because burden sharing is so important, uh, it is, it is perennially one of the most contentious issues in any alliance, including the NATO alliance. Uh, you know, in recent years, of course, burden sharing has become top of mind, in part because of uh, the presidency and candidacy of Donald Trump. But even prior to Trump, burden sharing was, was and likely will always be a contentious issue in the alliance. Uh, Trump, in many ways, his distinguishing characteristic was not in emphasizing burden sharing and making it a contentious issue, but in airing it out in public. But if you look privately, these, uh, these sorts of debates, this sort of coercive pressure is common throughout the alliance's history. Uh, you look back to Kennedy administration, Johnson administration, Nixon administration, all of them very much leveraged threats of troop withdrawals for the purposes of encouraging burden sharing. Uh, even further back to Eisenhower, who uh, at one point said that you know, if U.S. troops remain in Europe indefinitely, he would consider that a failure of U.S. policy. Uh, and, you know, as I, as I argue in, in, my, in my new book, The Burden Sharing Dilemma, uh, take this point to, to plug it for just a moment, uh, part of this contention, you know, part of the reason why burden sharing is so contentious is be, only part of it is because, you know, the U.S. is encouraging allies unsuccessfully to spend more, uh, Part of it also stems from the U.S. itself. Uh, the U.S. Is often, often looks at what the consequences of burden sharing would be in terms of allies becoming more self-reliant, doing things their own way, uh, and often recoils at that. 
So uh, today we're going to be discussing a variety of subjects related to the issue of, of burden sharing in the, NATO, in the NATO alliance. And I'm going to start off with uh, one opening question that I'll, I'll give each of our panelists the opportunity to say a few words on. Um, and that is uh, a very general question on the state of burden sharing, particularly defense spending in the NATO alliance. Uh, 2024 looks like it will be the first year since the 2014 whale summit 10 years ago uh, that the 2% standard uh, spending on 2% uh, of GDP defense spending standard will be met uh, across the alliance as a whole. Not every member is meaning it, but, uh, but most of them are. Uh, and as a collective, they, they look likely to meet it this year. So my question for our panelists is, first of all, how much progress does this represent? Is it enough? And second, is 2% even a good standard for burden sharing? And if not, is there a better metric? So I'll start with, start with Barry. Well, it would be churlish not to note that there's been progress um, in Europe, uh, and a good deal more money has been spent than uh, was originally expected when we agreed on 2%, and more will be spent. But uh, I, I think, as was pointed out this morning, 2% uh, was a, a, a share of GDP that was reached uh, almost 10 years ago on the basis of an understanding of then extant shortfalls and then extant beliefs about what was needed to, to, to address the shortfalls. And it appears impressionistically that two things are true. Uh, to quote a different politician, uh, they misunderestimated the um, extent of the shortfalls uh, and they didn't understand the direction of the, of the threat environment. So it's quite likely that though 2% has assumed a, um, an important uh, symbolic role in the alliance, that as an indicator of either burden sharing or of successfully reaching force planning criteria of the kind that was discussed in the last panel, it probably doesn't cut it. Um, stop me if I go on too long. Uh, I, I, I'd add a couple other points. If you want to discuss burden sharing, we need to decide what is the burden. And I think this is one of the biggest questions. Um, I was at ISA just now and went to a European Union and the Liberal World Order panel, which was a great panel, by the way. It was from the special issue of international affairs in the fall. If people take seriously this notion of a liberal world order and you, Europe's particularly commitment to that liberal world order, and the United States is spending three and a quarter to three and a half percent of GDP to defend that world order, then 2% doesn't cut it as a fair share of the burden. I'm not saying that's the way it should be looked at, I'm just saying if one looked at it that way and one could, then you can't consider 2% of GDP to be a fair share of the burden. Uh, if we're measuring against the defense of Europe, we're stuck with the hoary old problem of what share of the US defense budget really goes to defend Europe. And uh, depending on where you got your accounting degree and who's paying your salary, you can make that number look small or large. Uh, I like to use 50%, which is as good as any, and that means we're more or less in the same ballpark, but that still makes us uncomfortable because we know we're, we're not um, getting enough. Um, finally, I have to say, I don't really care much about the idea of equity in burden sharing. Uh, a, like everyone else, I think I'd like to move beyond money to capabilities. But B, as many of you know, I have some radical positions on the transatlantic relationship. And my little quippy way of talking about the problem is the current contract between Europe and the United States is the United States agrees to defend Europe and Europe agrees to help. And I believe we have to reverse that contract, that Europe has to agree to defend Europe and the United States has to agree to help. And I think that changes things significantly. So I'll stop. Thank you, Barry. Sophia. Not much more to say on that point. Uh, <laughs> well, thank you, Brian, and thank you to uh, Georgetown for, for having us all here. Uh, look, we all know the, the flaws of the 2% metric. Uh, I won't spend much time on it. Um, input doesn't equal output. It doesn't take into account some of the important contributions that allies make outside of defense spending, be that aid to Ukraine, Russian energy divestment, risk sharing in a more general sense. It's also not the same for all allies. You know, uh, the allies where the gap is the highest in absolute terms, Germany, Canada, Italy, Spain, 
Uh, on the one hand, only a little bit goes a long way. On the other hand, the gap here is often much larger than for other allies, so they have a lot more to catch up on. And in most cases, it, it won't be enough. We know that the investment gap uh, across the alliance, across the European uh, in NATO is closer to 4% than, than 2%. What I think sometimes gets missed that is that the, the politics of 2%, I think, have changed. Uh, I think a lot of uh, European allies used to look at 2% as the golden ticket in Washington. Uh, it's what you needed to do to be a good ally in the eyes of the United States. Um, and I think what we're realizing on the one hand is that even for those Europeans who do more, if it plays well on Capitol Hill, there will always be people here in DC who will continue to criticize Europeans, and there will always be ways to criticize what Europeans put into the alliance. If we all spend 2%, we should be spending more. 20 allies spend 2%, there's always some that don't. But what I think has changed is that Europeans are not currently increasing their defense investment to keep the US in. They're increasing their defense investment to keep Russia out. And I think in that sense, you know, money uh, speaks louder than words. And what we're seeing, this trend, is a real sign of threat perceptions in Europe changing, and I think changing sustainably. So what matters now, to make this conversation, I think, around burden sharing a bit more um, concrete and a bit more constructive, is to look at two things. One is prioritization, and one is sustainability. So when we talk about prioritization, um, in the previous panel, I think Justina made the point of what have we learned uh, in this war? What do we need to invest in? Of course, we need to invest in heavy armored brigade. We need uh, to invest in air and missile defense. We can't forget that we also need to invest in technology to maintain the, the competitive edge of, of the West, if I uh, may say it like that. Uh, we need to invest in the less exciting things, spare parts and, and ammunition. And in recruitment and retention, um, that, that'll cost money too, to have the, the people um, to wield these capabilities. And then we need to look at sustainability, and perhaps it's not surprising that as the German on the panel, I, I bring that up, because the question is not just do we hit the targets now, the question is do we hit the targets consistently over the years to come? Um, do we manage to bridge this gap between the short term and the long term, which I think is where we've arrived right now. The European Commission has made that point in its defense industrial strategy recently. Others have too. Um, do we send the right signals uh, to industry? And I think I'm encouraged here to end on a positive note that we have begun the debate in uh, several capitals, including my own, of where is the money coming from? We're no longer just talking about we should spend the money, but we're talking about what does that mean? Do we borrow? Do we reprioritize? Do we cut social spending? Uh, do we increase taxes? Do we have EU uh, level funding? I think that is the important conversation to have right now, and I'm encouraged that we're beginning to have it. Thank you, Sophia. And last but not least, Camille. Well, uh, a lot has been said, so I'll, I'll try to be, be quick. I'll, I mean, on, to look at the glass half full, it is clear that we've turned a corner. Uh, we have more than 20 allies when the pledge uh, was adopted at the Wales Summit, there were only three. Uh, the Europeans are collectively spending 100 billion more than they were um, 10 years ago, the, uh, and it's, it keeps growing. So, so the, 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 the numbers uh, are uh, rather there. Yes, the Allies are in three different groups. There are those that are clearly uh, committed. There are those who are just uh, uh, making the cut. And there are those who are still lagging behind. But altogether, the, I mean, the, the shift is, is there. It's massive. Uh, and I think nobody's questioning it anymore, uh, which was not the case before uh, uh, February 22, let's be honest. There were still uh, a lot of European Allies that were trying to finesse the commitment uh, in different uh, shape or form. I don't think it is, it is that at the moment. Um, and, and to just to, you know, I remember wealthy allies uh, saying oh, we are too wealthy to be at 2%, uh, or big allies that were saying we are too big to be at 2%. Uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the Germans suggesting that it would be embarrassing for the French and the Brits if Germany was outspending them. You know, that sort of thing has completely. <laughs> Uh, uh, I'm glad the, that your ego uh, uh, that, all that sort <laughs> is of strong thing. enough yeah, to yeah, withstand. But, yeah, yeah, we, we can with, withstand that. <laughs> and we are much sharper anyway. So, uh, but the, 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 but the, 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 the argument, uh, the, all of this has, has sort of disappeared. So, the, nobody, so that's the good news. 
I guess, and there I'm very much uh, with Sophia, we, we, we really need to sustain it. You know, if we had been at 2% for the last 20 years, there wouldn't be an issue today, to a large extent. We might want to do a surge in specific capabilities, we might want to fill specific gaps, but part of the problem today is that we haven't been doing our homework for 20 plus years. Um, so so the, the paradox is that 2%, to, to go to your question about whether the metric is, is correct, in the absence of any other good metric, I, I stick to it. Uh, uh, but uh, the, 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 the issue is, you know, had we been doing, you know, the reason why countries are, uh, need to surge sometimes way above 2% uh, is because they have been at 1% for many, many years. So, so, so that's part of the problem, is that, uh, you know, of course, you have to take the long-term view, and they need to sustain this now. Because, of course, if it is a bushfire for a couple of years, to, uh, and that, you know, I don't know, if you know, the orange elephant in the room is not re-elected, uh, uh, how do we, uh, 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 you know, fine, we're going to get away with it. Or if the uh, conflict in Ukraine uh, slows down, that's going to be OK. You know, that sort of... Uh, behavior would be creating problems for the future. And I think that's the, the where I do have a question mark about the sustainment. And I think what we have to do. Second thing is we have to spend it on the right thing. So the easy thing is to say, follow what Angus Lapsley is telling you. Uh, another one, <laughs> another one is, to, uh, uh, is, to, is to say, um, OK, you need to do the boring stuff. Uh, when I was at NATO, I, I never rarely saw a, a, t a defense minister wearing a t-shirt I bought spare part and ammunition. They were all into, I, I engage into a fancy thing. And now we see the results. So, so, so the, the, the outcome there is, you know, do the, the boring stuff, do the 20th century capability of, uh, you know, numbers, enablement that, uh, that have been degraded so much by not spending 2%. And finally, prepare for the future and look into the... the, the, the but you, have to, you can't choose, pick and choose between those three and argue that because you have exquisite cyber capabilities, you can afford not doing the logistics, uh, that, the, which is part of the problem uh, still. Uh, altogether, there is no reason whatsoever why the Europeans uh, uh, shouldn't be capable of deterring uh, Russia that they already outspend collectively and that they, if the, the growth continues and if everyone was at 2%, I think the number would be $450 billion or, or something like that. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, that is about even if you do the, 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 the account on Russian budget that is not the official budget, it's still about two to one. So there's no reason what, whatsoever why it shouldn't work, but it needs to be properly focused uh, and, and, and sustained. Last point is um, maybe the most uh, difficult question, is where, you know, in, if, you, if we agree that we're in that sort of ballpark in terms of money, because that's what's fiscally sustainable and that's what needs to be there. By the way, much less in terms of percentage of GDP than the Cold War figures. What sort of conversation do we need to have on uh, uh, um, where do we put our priorities? And there I think there is a, an element of that which is a transatlantic conversation. And I think the argument is, are we looking for Europeans to be able to do much more on their own, which would mean that the Europeans deliver to the alliance a full force package, which they've never done. Uh, so they look at all the enablers, including some of the strategic enablers that have only been provided by the US over, uh, over the years. Or are they continue to, uh, um, and to, to, to Barry's point, are they going to continue to be supporting a, a US uh, 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 core capability? So if you look at that, you could say two things. Well, you know, one of two things. You could say, oh, but today, look, the, I mean, 90% of most capabilities in, are in peacetime in Europe are uh, non-American. Uh, the, the, uh, on the other hand, if you look at exquisite strategic enablers, that number tends to be reversed. And this is where I think we need to do, to do some serious thinking collectively, or preferably, because I don't think it's for the Europeans to have this decision on their own. Uh, 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 but the, on what sort of things are we looking at, which is also a smart way from my perspective to move away from the sort of political conversation of saying, OK, everything is about what's going to happen in November, but rather about how do we shape the conversation so that any administration is in a position to uh, uh, indeed have more reliable European partners and then all the m multiple reasons for uh, America to be distracted from the European theater, whether it's an, an Asian contingency, 
whether it's domestic issues, uh, are not as dramatic as they might sound today. So, so I think that conversation needs to take place, and I would argue rather now than, than in you know, five years or, or in 10 months when, when the, 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 the thing you know, the, the, the problem is really on our, on our lap. But uh, I think so, that, so that's the sort of conversation that I would like to see unfold. Fantastic. Thank you all. So in the, in the spirit of the previous responses, I'd, li I'd like to now turn to some questions that go beyond the 2% standard. Uh, and in particular, I, I want to turn to something, uh, a similar point that, that uh, Camille raised in, in some of his last comments on the issue of how substantial the gap is between where Europe is now and, and where it might need to be, you know, if it, if it was going to be in a capability, in a position rather, to, to, to be able to defend itself with, with, with little U.S. help. And for this, I, I, want, to turn, uh, I want to turn to Barry, uh, because you know, you've argued in your previous work that Europe can defend itself without the United States, uh, without too much additional effort. I'm wondering two things. One. Has your assessment changed since Russia's invasion of Ukraine? Uh, and second, you know, your assessment you know, back in 2020 compared the existing capabilities of NATO Europe with those of Russia, but that comparison in some sense assumes the political will to use those capabilities across Europe, right? assumes a, a high level of alliance cohesion. Have events since February of 2022 changed your assessment of that political will for, for the better or for the worse? So I'll, I'll turn, turn to you, Barry. So when I first started in this business, I was a council fellow across the river in the Pentagon, and I worked in the European Forces Division of the Office of Program Analysis and Evaluation. So I worked this kind of stuff all the time. So I know what the data would look like to answer your question, and I know that I don't have that data. I don't, I don't really have it. Um, so that, that makes the, the problem uh, uh, hard. Um, I think what one of the, the people will be, obviously there's lots already being written about the lessons of Ukraine and what Ukraine tells you about everything from Russian intentions to Russian capabilities. But the, the, standout, the standout thing that I see in the, in the fighting is, and it's controversial in some places, but is a, it, 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 the, the secular trend in the improvement of the power of the defense relative to the offense seems to be continuing and maybe even accelerating. Right. It's striking to me that um, Ukrainian units hold stretches of front that are much wider than we would have ever expected uh, NATO units of comparable size to hold in, in, in my day. Right. So this tells me that um, at least in some, along some parts of the vast frontier with, with Russia, um, defense is not necessarily going to be it's always going to be hard, but it's it's not getting it's going to get not in a secular sense getting harder. It's I, I think getting easier, and I think we have some ideas of where we would spend new money. And this this takes me to the you know the allusion to to my past work. As I said in the past work, you know I agreed with the, the study I critiqued, the ISS study, that we don't know what we don't know, and things like sustainability and readiness were simply unknown to me. I made the argument on the basis of the expensive front end of force structure, you know, squadrons and brigades, right? That, that was the, 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 the basis. And I did not assume the availability of every unit in Europe as being comparable to every other unit, right? I tended to make some, some uh, disparate assumptions about that. But the striking thing to me about, um, about the Ukraine war and the NATO European affect to it is that, um, Europeans have stood up, and most of them have stood up to some extent. And uh, you know, I saw some polling data just yesterday that you know from the fall that suggested that there's actually a surprising amount of support in the public, even going down into Southern Europe for opposing this. So you know, this is sort of the instantiation of Steve Waltz's old balance of threat theory, right? If the adversary has malign intent, offensive capabilities, and is close. You're, tending, you're going to tend to balance. And those who share that perception to the most intense degree are going to balance and coalesce together. I think that's what we're seeing. And um, uh, although people don't like to hear me say this, I, I think with, with, with less of an uh, American um, hand on the tiller, I think, I think Europeans would do more. Right? So um, I'm 
comfortable with the analysis I, I made then in every respect but one, which is my skepticism about um, sustainability was well-founded. And um, if anything, I too probably underestimated the rate at which modern combat consumes things. And I know a little something about that. But still, the rate is high. And therefore, as, we, as I thought then, the force needed more depth. And I think we understand now that the force needs more depth. And you know, coming back to the question of priority, the first thing you got to do is extract as much combat power as you can from what you already own. Right? And I think we are not doing that at all. And I don't know what the marginal cost of doing that will be, but that should be job one. So turning from the alliance as a whole to one of its most important members, uh, I, I want to pose a question to Sophia, on the, particularly on, on Germany. Um, and particularly over the last two years, we've seen two prominent episodes where Germany was reluctant to provide certain weapons to Ukraine, right? In 2023, it was the Leopard 2 tanks. This year, it's Taurus missiles. Uh, two questions. First. What explains Germany's reluctance in these two cases? And what, are the, what do these two episodes reveal about how Germany sees its security role in Europe? Yes. All right. Thank you. Um, so uh, look, these debates, I think, have taken on a, a sort of totemic quality um, with a symbolic significance that sometimes goes beyond their military usefulness, even though I would say, and I'll say this at the beginning, these systems, and right now we're discussing the Taurus system, would be really militarily useful in Ukraine. Uh, and it is incredibly frustrating to me and many others that uh, we are not currently delivering them. And, and not but, but and, Germany has supplied more equipment and weapons in absolute terms than any other European ally uh, in NATO. Um, and I, won't, I don't really think it's interesting for me to discuss those two aspects because we've all talked about them a lot. So, I think in the interest of the Germany explaining that you're asking me to do, um, there's some, these, these instances have become symbolic for a reason. I think they've become a shorthand for the divisions inside the German government, um, inside the governing coalition between the government and the opposition, uh, and then also the divisions between Germany and some of its, its European allies. There are obvious parallels, I think, between the two systems. There are also some differences between these two episodes, the, the Taurus and the Leopard. So if I briefly recap, in both cases, the Chancery has taken on, I think, the role of principal obstructionist uh, and against the advocacy of German elites and uh, some other European capitals and the US. In both cases, the Chancellor has cited concerns of escalation and Germany uh, being seen as a potential party to the war if it were to send these systems. In both cases, the Chancellor can point to public opinion being with him. Uh, in the case of the Leopards, the German public changed its mind at around the same pace of the German Chancellor changing his mind. Uh, in the case of the Taurus missiles, there currently is a majority against uh, sending them of around 70%. Though I would caution uh, relying too much on public opinion polls when it comes to these very specific questions, because I do think that if leadership were to make the case for sending these missiles, then public would probably understand the case uh, as it was made. Currently, what we are discussing is all the reasons why we can't send the missiles, so public opinion follows, follows that. Um, in the case of the Leopards, Berlin took the decision to deploy the tanks only when the US also committed to sending tanks. Uh, in the case of Taurus, the Chancellor seems committed to his decision not to send them. Um, so I think what is interesting <laughs> beyond these facts is that it reveals something about how the Chancellor sees Germany's role in Europe. And that, Brian, I think was, was your question to me. Um, and the Chancellor was very explicit about this because last year after the Taurus, after the Leopard episode, when Germany had just made the decision to deploy the tanks, at the Munich Security Conference shortly afterwards, the Chancellor, faced with criticism around you know, the, the speed of his decision and having waited for the Americans, said quite proudly that this instance was uh, symbolic for the kind of leadership that other allies could expect from Germany in the future. Um, so how do we need to, how should we understand that? Um, 
there's a German word for this, of course there's a German word for this, uh, that the chancellor also likes to use, and it's zusammenführen. And zusammenführen has two meanings. It means to lead together and to forge and to unite. And I think that is the sort of ideal sense of what the chancellor wants to do. He sees Germany not as leading the way in a traditional sense, but as a unifying force in Europe. Um, our national security strategy avoids the term leadership altogether. It speaks instead of special responsibilities, right? Um, our defense minister, Boris Pistorius, makes a similar case in the military realm where he talks about German military as the backbone of European security. And I think that these conceptualization of Germany's role make sense from the perspective of the country's history, its geography, uh, its economy, frankly. And I think there's no point in wishing for a different Germany, right? Uh, I think that the normalization that we're seeing with Zeitenwende, with the defense fund that Heather Williams would have lost a lot of money on, uh, what we're seeing, the normalization, does not mean that Germany is trying to turn into the UK, it's trying to turn into France. I don't think that this is what we should expect but we should hold them to the standard that they set for themselves. We should them, hold them accountable to this idea of a military backbone. What do you expect from a military backbone? You want it to be strong and stable and carry its load sustainably for years to come. I have some question marks on that. And what do you expect from a unifying power? You want it to have strong and stable alliances with its most important neighbors, Paris, Warsaw. Again, I have some questions. So I think, that's where I would begin the criticism. I would want to hold Germany accountable to the standards that it sets for itself. Thank you. So uh, I want to now turn to uh, a question that the morning panels covered in, in, in some depth, but, uh, but I, I want to cover it from a slightly different perspective. So in particular, the, the issue of procurement and the defense industrial base, uh, and th this, this is for, uh, for Camille. Uh, now, the European Commission recently rolled out Europe's first ever defense industrial strategy. Uh, the target is that you know, at least half of member states' procurement budget should go to uh, EU-based suppliers and that at least 40% of defense equipment should be pro uh, procured uh, collaboratively. Uh, two related questions. Um, first, you know, what are the challenges and opportunities to greater EU involvement, involvement as opposed to um, defense matters being handled on a purely sort of more national basis? And in particular, what sorts of incentives will be necessary to get reluctant EU members on board, especially you know, those members like Poland that have long viewed the US as the more reliable partner and which have been predominantly making their purchases from non-EU suppliers in, in the US and in South Korea? Well, um, maybe let me start by saying that I think the EU it's interesting listening to this morning's panel. Um, the EU has more changed strategically in light of the Ukraine war than NATO. For NATO, it was a sort of going back to core business and its DNA. When for the EU, it has been very, you know, uncharted territory, and they, and they've done well. You know, honestly, if you if you think of, I would not have bet two years ago uh, uh, that, you know. Not that Germany would join the, the TPNW, as Heather uh, uh, said, but uh, that uh, typically uh, uh, that uh, you know the European Union would be, have a program to train Ukrainian soldiers to fight Russians, uh, or that the European Union would have pulled uh, 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 multiple tools out of its toolbox to fund uh, defense industry and and support uh, acquisition. So, so those are, I think, quite interesting news that are really making a difference. Um, uh, and that we should probably recognize, and which is not always the case, neither at NATO nor in, in this, in uh, in this uh, uh, in Washington. And I think that's that's really important to to have this on, on on our mind. The second thing is, in that case, I, I tend to be of those who say it's not enough. Not those who say, oh, oh my God, the EU is doing stuff. Uh, 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 so so the, the the you know the the problem with the European defense industry strategy is that there is no money associated with it yet. Yet. Uh, 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 that the uh, that they haven't built ownership with the member states, uh, that they haven't thought through what sort of cooperation it means with non-EU countries. You know, there's all sorts of missing parts in it. Not the, uh, so. I'd, I'd rather see it more ambitious and more robust 
then starting criticizing for a level of ambition that would be inconsistent with, with other things. So, so, so that would be my, my uh, a very important point. But so if I'm trying to be realistic when it comes specifically to the European defense industrial strategy, I think it is below the bar seen from me because it's talking about things that will happen eventually in 2028 once the multi-annual financial framework and all sorts of very complicated Brussels bubble decisions are taken, uh, that it's below the bar today because it's not with reallocating 750 million and nobody even knows that it's, whether it's fresh money or not, that it's going to make a massive difference. Uh, and uh, that, by the way, it's missing, there is a huge uh, um, a missing problem, which is how do we address the shortfalls for the Ukrainians as part of the strategy which doesn't seem to be part of the strategy. Even the EU senior officials admit that. So, so, so at the end of the day, what I would like to see is an EU that is more uh, disciplined. There is a strong EU-NATO dimension that is also missing, and that is, that is part of uh, the responsibility that lies with both organizations, I would say, uh, uh, which is that uh, you know, there, there is a degree of mutual lack of understanding of how the other organization op 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 operates, which is problematic, and a degree of rather than having a sort of sound, uh, easy conversation on where can we mutually support each other, uh, there tends to be, and that's not only about the politics of Turkey and Cyprus, uh, but it's, it's also, uh, I think, broader than that, a, a tendency to sort of uh, uh, focus more on the bureaucratic competition, which is absurd, than on, on the how can we make this work uh, approach. Finally, there is a US dimension to this EU element, if I may put it this way, which is I think that the US discourse on what's happening in, on the EU side, part of town, uh, uh, part of the conversation, is uh, um, uh, I don't think, I think it's honestly not as articulate as it could be. I think there is a Genuine shift on saying, oh, it's okay, and that can be helpful. And I think it's in, all fair, in all fairness, the Biden administration has been gently uh, in a sort of segue towards this. But I think the, the, the default setting remains pretty much 1990s. So the, 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 the 3Ds and all of that, which I think is a, is a bit of a pity because it sort of misses the point about what, what do we do with this. So I would, you know, the sort of US approach of saying, you know, on the one hand, you know, the Europeans need to do much more and immediately, but, you know, that means you buy more American and you do this and you do that. You know, that might not be enough today. So there, there needs to be a sort of recognition that part of it means that probably the Europeans, if they spend a lot more money, they might buy more American stuff, that, uh, more, less American stuff and a bit more European stuff, uh, that if they spend much more money, they're going to be more corporations that are going to benefit from EU tools uh, which are not necessarily super friendly to non-EU countries, but how do we make that work rather than how do we block it uh, uh, and things like that. So I think there is a, a real need for a much more candid conversation. How, how do we make that work on the fact that the EU input into this conversation is useful? I uh, shouldn't be in any shape or form undermining NATO, uh, but needs to be recognized more openly. And that, by the way, all of this is also a European-wide conversation. Uh, I think the, if, the Europeans, if the EU is serious about pulling the strength of the Europeans, it needs to also look at non-EU non Europeans and how to bring them on board. And all of this is, is something where we are, I, I would believe, only opening a conversation. And I'm honestly not sure that it's going to go anywhere, because there is a, a default tendency of many of the players in that conversation to rather block it than, than let it uh, 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 land somewhere uh, where, where progress is the, the key priority. Thank you. So I think now we're going to uh, pivot to question and answer. So I don't know if we have a, a microphone anywhere, but I imagine the room is small enough that we can, we can hear. So if folks would like to start, uh, start raising hands, uh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Input measures, 2%, to output measures based on capabilities. And what 
to make it simple. Uh -huh. We want sort of three measures. Uh, might be readiness, might be enablers. What, how would you design that? Uh -huh. <laughs> That the, the, the tough part in your question is to make it simple. Uh, because, I mean, we've all uh, played with the idea of, okay, there are tons of things that, you know, uh, the Europeans should do more of and that are, but those are not easily measurable. Uh, what I would say, I mean, I use the image full force package, which does speak to a military audience, probably not to the, the rest of that, which is, okay, assuming that we are... Uh, Today, um, I was very struck by a comment by the commander of US Air Force Europe, uh, who said, you know, by the end of the decade, there's going to be 550 fifth generation aircraft in Europe. 500 of them will be flown by um, uh, European Air Forces. Uh, so that's quite a change from, uh, you know, what is the perception of many Americans, first of all, and, uh, and the reality. So, so if, the, the effort was to say, okay, the Europeans need to carry the biggest share of the, the overwhelmingly biggest share of the burden when it comes to conventional defense of Europe. I think nuclear is very complicated and it, you know, it's a separate conversation from that perspective because the, you can't say we sort of segue to more European capabilities as easily, but which means for me, two things, essentially. First of all, and to uh, uh, build up on, on the point Barry made, to say, OK, where are we on sustainability and enablement? Uh, and what I would add, the strategic enablers uh, for that. So is there a situation where the lack of American strategic enablers, because they are, you know, and again, putting politics aside, because they are, uh, there is a priority on the Indo-Pacific, or there is a contingency elsewhere, can the Europeans, you know, take the bulk of that, that responsibility and, and, and for that? And also, can the bigger Europeans, and that's quite demanding, including for the, the French, the Brits, and the Germans, uh, carry a, a fair share of the reinforcement uh, strategy for, for the alliance, at least in the early days of a conflict? All of this carries a strategic risk, which is a bit of decoupling. So you probably, you, you, you want to keep, you know, the, that, that one American soldier in Europe, preferably dead, that Churchill wanted. But, but you, you need to really think through um, uh, that. So, so it is a, an alliance in which the burden does shift much more to the Europeans on, on the conventional front with Europeans that are more capable, more sustainable, and, and more uh, um, uh, responsible. Which, and, and then, uh, while preserving the, the overall uh, picture of a transatlantic uh, relationship. This is quite, in fact, when you start doing the math of that, and, and uh, Barry's done that, it, it, it is quite demanding. But I think there is a story there. So uh, in my answer, you see that it's the, the simple, uh, you know, the bumper sticker I haven't found. If, if someone in the room has, has one, I'm sure the NATO colleagues will be thrilled. Uh, uh, but. Uh, it is, it is something along these lines. And to echo my point about the EU, by the way, I think this should be part of that bigger um, um, messaging uh, there. Is this, uh, is this something that is sufficient to deter Russia? Probably yes. Is, this some, is it something that is sufficient uh, to reassure all the allies that might be more difficult? As we know, reassurance is sometimes more demanding than deterrence. And, w uh, and then it, it could sort of flip the conversation vis-a-vis -vis the US on saying, okay, these are the three things that you really need to be, uh, that is super important in your strategic messaging towards Europe, because those are the things that we feel are at risk uh, uh, in, in, a, in an environment or that we, we will not be able to meet in the short term. All right, right back here. But, and if you could just state your name and your affiliation. We have a microphone coming around. Thanks. Yeah, hi, my name is John Denny from the US Army War College. Uh, I want to push back just slightly on something Kamal said and then have a question for Kamal and Sophia together. Uh, first, Kamal, you suggested that we need to think about reversing this 90-10 split. I think that thinking is already done. It's done in the form of the NATO defense planning process and in the MCR that comes out after it and the capability targets that are now being negotiated to some degree. So. 
The challenge, I think, is not so much that we need to think about this, but really we need to digest the outcome now. Thanks to the operations plans we have, we know what the requirements are, uh, at least ideally, uh, and now we see allies kind of choking on what the reality is of fulfilling all of this. And so Sophia said, we're finally beginning to think in some European capitals, maybe Berlin included, about how to pay for all this, right? I suggested at a conference this past weekend at a room that had lots of Europeans in it that maybe there needed to be a reconsideration, a rebalancing of defense and the welfare state, the guns versus butter debate, right? That caused one of the Europeans in the audience to say, you know, recoil in response and say, no, no, we're defending the welfare state. That's what we have the defense for. Uh, to American ears, that kind of sounded like fingernails on a chalkboard. <laughs> so I'm wondering, to what degree do you think there is a consideration of this sort of thing, a, a, a more of a fundamental reexamination of priorities? And I don't mean, you know, in places like, no offense to these smaller allies, but, you know, the Albanians and the Croatians of the alliance, I mean among the big four, the French, the Germans, the Brits, the Italians, where really we've got the possibility for advanced capability and mass combined. So is, is that in the cards? Does it need to happen? Thanks. Sure. Uh, well, I was, I was nodding along. Uh, I do think, I mean, I said in my comments that I'm encouraged that the debate is beginning to take place, right? I, I think, uh, and I agree with you that we need to look most of all at the large allies because that's where it makes the biggest difference. So let me look at Germany, for instance, where the 100 billion euro temporary fund is going to run out, um, will be almost completely spent by the end of 2027. Um, and follow-up <laughs> financing will have to come from the regular defense budget, which is currently more or less frozen at uh, around 50 billion. Um, we'll need an extra 25 to 30 billion a year to continue reaching 2%. And the German governing coalition does not un agree on where this money will come from. Uh, and you know, you know, we have intense debates on the federal budget right now. Um, spending is capped, as you know, by our constitutional debt break, um, which has re recently been reinforced by our constitutional court. And there's broad popular support, support currently for Zeitenwende for higher defense spending. And I'm with you. I think that that broad support is probably going to erode once you start talking about if you want more money to, for defense, you're going to have to cut it in other places. Uh, I don't think that German elites, for one, are currently um, prepared to have that conversation yet, with the exception of our defense minister, who has been um, making some comments last week about, you know, the money is going to have to come from somewhere. Um, the biggest obstacle in this case is, is fiscal policy. For other allies, uh, the biggest obstacle will be um, whether they're able to borrow more, whether they're able to raise taxes. Um, I think that one potential solution here is EU level funding. Um, that doesn't solve all problems, but it solves some. Um, we have a conversation around euro bonds uh, for defense that I think might be useful. We have a bigger, I don't think we're going to get there honestly this year, but the window is more open than it has been ever before. Um, but stopped by the, by the frugals, of course, stopped by Germany and, and the Netherlands. So. I think that for me, this is the most interesting conversation right now that we can have about where is the money coming from, the, the guns versus butter debate. I, I'm a European, so for me, I have to, I'm a European in DC, so both statements made sense to me. Um, it made sense that we have to reprioritize. It also makes sense that what we're defending is the welfare state. Um, so I think you need some really brave political leaders to have that conversation and to start asking those questions. And I'll leave it at that. I'll, can, if I can add a couple of sentences to, to those points that I very much agree. First of all, I honestly think that the welfare versus warfare debate or the war economy debate in Europe is anywhere close to reality. You know, what the level of effort is absolutely sustainable. It is not insane. You know, what I'm let me take a French example, because instead of doing German bashing, I'll do a bit of French bashing. You know, if the French had spent about 5 or 10 percent more on their defense uh, procurement bill for the next uh, few years, they would probably be meeting a lot of the, what is expected of them in terms of conventional capabilities. So the, 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 the step 
is not as high as, you know, it's a sort of, okay, we give up welfare state and health insurance for, for all, uh, in, uh, for defense. You know, we are not in a, at all in that sort of conversation. We are in a conversation, you know, it's, or it's not in Britain, the NHS, or the deterrent. Uh, uh, it, is, it is, I think, within, completely within what is manageable. It does indeed require political will. It is moving money that is the most complex money to move, which is core investment money uh, uh, and so on. But all, none of this is out of reach. I think we, we ought to be very careful in not shaping that debate as a as a, you're going to drop welfare for uh, welfare. We're not going to drop welfare, I agree. And I don't think there is any constituency that is willing to do this. And I'm, I would argue that in the, in the European case, in most countries, shaping it in this way is going to be very complicated. What we're going to do is maybe sometimes prioritize. And let me give you an EU example, which I love, which is strategic mobility. In the previous round, there was a big push for strategic mobility under the, the budget of uh, DG moves, so all the inf uh, transport infrastructure, so under the civilian budget. At the end, it got killed because the Austrians wanted cleaner uh, tunnels to do, to do uh, 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 things, and it got most of the money that was supposed to, to, to go to uh, the Baltic states and Finland. I mean, that sort of wrong prioritization is something that no, should no longer happen, I, I would argue. But, uh, uh, but, it, the, but the money was there. It was just the wrong priority. So, so my, my point there is to say that we can really make a difference within this, and that that sort of difference, and a, a last figure just, just to give a sense of that, the Europeans have spent 10 times more uh, on uh, uh, mitigating the cost of the energy bill for their citizens than on the support to Ukraine. We're talking, you know, 800 billion versus 80 billion altogether. So, so you know, when, when, so the, if you think in these terms, suddenly uh, things become quite different, you know, because that was just, you know, the government saying, okay, we're going to pay your gas bill, um, which was not necessary, you know, maybe not as necessary as, as, as it was. Maybe it was important to, to keep the support for Ukraine and that people would not go crazy about the fact that they were no longer hitting their homes. But, uh, but it, was, uh, it was there. So, so I'm just putting these on the table just to think through in terms of, okay, there, are, there, there is room for maneuver. We are still very wealthy countries uh, uh, operating uh, uh, with, with budgets that allow such uh, shifts. Why don't we start taking two at a time so we're able to hit everyone? So why don't we take the two up in the front here? Yeah. Hi, uh, Heidi Hart from the University of California, Irvine. Um, we know that EU-NATO relations have been challenging for a very long time, given the Cyprus issue and other issues as well. You're talking about, you know, uh, defense investment, et cetera. But I'm wondering how has uh, you know, this kind of uptick that we're seeing in burden sharing on the part of the Europeans, how has that shifted the uh, EU NATO politics from within the alliance? So thinking about the politics, alliance politics, has that changed? What do you think the future of EU NATO relations is going to look like? Does this matter that, the, that we're seeing the Europeans spending so much more on defense than we did several years back? We had one more in the front here. Hello, I'm Robert Bell, a refugee from NATO who was granted asylum by Senator Nunn at Georgia Tech and Louis Simon at VUB in Brussels, now teaching. My question is for Sophia and uh, my friend Cami on strategic enablers, because I think we all agree on how significant that is for Europe, whether it's from the burden sharing point of view or uh, in the context of standing up on your own or even strategic autonomy. And the question is how you get there, because the arguments are well understood and the history for Europe doing more on that is uh, longstanding. The, the previous question, one back, talked about the role of NDPP and the MCR, so the assignment of capability targets should, should be able to handle that, because you have this rule that no country, no single country, should provide more than 50% of a single capability. Uh, but what happens, of course, is the U.S., uh, not seeing other volunteers, sort of raises its hand and says, 
okay, we'll provide 90% of that capability with the caveat that you can't count on about half of that because we may be engaged in the Indo-Pacific. And then the international staff and the military authorities highlight that risk and the political authorities say, we'll take the risk. <laughs> so my question is, what would happen? Imagine a debate between Trump and Biden where Trump repeats Russia should do the hell they want with any ally that's delinquent on 2%. And Biden says uh, burden sharing matters, but NATO matters. But you know, my policy is we will not provide 50% more of any capability that NATO needs full stop. Is Europe capable, either financially or institutionally, of stepping into that sort of forced gap? Um, I'd be interested in Barry's views on that, but my, 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 uh, my short take is, is um, A, uh, strategic enablers is indeed one of the demanding part of the conversation, because that's not the one thing that you, you, you know, fix in one year by just buying a, a stock of ammunition. Uh, it is demanding. It is, and, in, and it, this is where the, the, the gap and the reliance has been the most visible. Um, so uh, whether you're talking about air-to-air -air refueling, about space capabilities, about ISR uh, assets, this is where the, the, the step is going to be the, the highest. So in order to, to, to do this, I mean, I think, first of all, I think the use of the NDPP is, of course, the, the, the natural venue to push for that. It also probably is the domain where the, the sort of timeline is not going to be uh, one, a sort of one cycle timeline. It's going to take more time. It's probably a domain where buying off the shelf existing capabilities might be a good uh, mitigation strategy, uh, uh, including from from the US, and that, that should be recognized as one potential tool to, to, to meet those demands. Uh, and uh, it is also where, in the longer term, the EU investment might make the biggest difference because it might help develop those capabilities or the next generation of those capabilities the most uh, uh, collectively because that's the way it, it works. So my short answer is that it's doable, but it will take more time than many of the other state steps. But that's precisely one of the reasons why it should, should, uh, should happen. Precisely for the, for the reasons you were mentioning is that for any reason, the notion that the US will apportion more than its share in the NATO environment is not, I would not take it for granted uh, in all contingencies. And again, putting aside the politics. So, so for that reason, I think it's, it's fair to, to, to do this. On the EU-NATO conversation, um, as I mentioned in my, uh, uh, after your first question, I don't think we are where we should be by any means. I, I think we should move away from the blaming game and, and I think the, the responsibilities are well shared across the, the players, both the institutions and the nations. Uh, it's absurd that we have 23 allies that are EU member states and we don't have a much cleaner uh, way to cooperate. Um, and. Uh, and I would say that if we are moving towards a more European NATO, which is probably the case in terms of trends, uh, uh, that more European NATO means that we need to very much clarify and simplify the relationship with EU so that they, the two organizations don't step on each other's toe and, and create that, that narrative of, of um, competition, which is, I don't think, very helpful. Maybe just to, to add on that uh, EU-NATO point, I'm actually, I share everything that Camille has said. I will uh, provide the more optimistic perspective that I do think that the relationship is on a more constructive track than it has been for a while. And that is in part because the EU has really sharpened its idea of itself as a defense player, which for a long time was very vague and quite frankly, very theoretical. Um, after the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine. I think what we've seen is the Commission has taken over and the Commission is a market power, a regulatory power with a budget. 
And so as a function of that, the EU is looking much more at defense industrial policy than at operational defense policy as it has before. So we face a lot less of the questions around duplication and whether it is all necessary. Um, so that brings us on by itself on a, on a much more constructive track. Um, even sitting in the US, I think uh, I hear many more Americans now making the or acknowledging that we really need an all hands on deck approach and that the EU can play a useful role. And I think, um, you know, the Commission Defense Industrial Strategy was a, a draft document. It's a first draft, if you will. We're now going to have a conversation about the really tricky issues, which are issues of uh, third country participation and procurement. But again, I, as I was saying in my earlier comment, I think there's an emerging understanding of short-term needs and long-term needs on both sides, both in Europe and in the US, and that will allow for a better cooperation between the EU and NATO uh, in years to come. Well, isn't it, if, if any of this is going to happen, isn't it essential? I mean, EU has the competencies for, for essentially land communications in Europe. If you want to move stuff by drain and truck across Europe, you need the EU to help you do it. It's, NATO can't do this on their own. NATO has no competencies for managing industrial mobilization. Only the European Union has those political and administrative competencies. Right? So it just seems to me that, that if people are serious about this, there's no choice. The Americans have to drop this silly concern about the European Union. Um, what little experience I have that bears on this is, you know, I, I was in Brussels working on European security issues in 2003. Right? And you know the people I knew who worked security at the EU, they, they could almost never even talk to counterparts at NATO. I mean, it was there was a they called it the blockade, the blockade, right? And I was back before COVID talking to the same people, and it was sort of like, oh, we talk to each other all the time. There's no obstacles anymore. And in fact, if you look at the people, they're the same people. Someone mentioned earlier it's about people. Well, a person works in the European Union on security for three years of their life, then they go back to a defense ministry, then they go to NATO. This is a, a Brussels, uh, you know, kind of merry-go-round. Right? So the, these people all know each other. So the, the, uh, there's still going to be administrative and organizational jealousy. But if, if, if people really believe the wolf was at the door, then this kind of, this kind of stuff is kind of silly at this point. Right? And I think people are starting to, uh, you know, some people are starting to know that it's, that, it's, that, it's, that it's silly. I wanted to come back to this question of enablers that Bob asked. And I just want to raise the question for the room. Some of this I've never understood. Right. Airbus builds tankers, aerial tankers. We, we whine that we don't have enough tankers. Airbus probably offered the US Air Force a better tanker than Boeing did, and we didn't buy it completely idiotically. I mean, completely idiotically, right? And this, this, the same tanker is, is, is still on offer, and Airbus is a going concern. In fact, more of a going concern than Boeing. So how it's possible that, 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 that Europeans or NATO in the same way that it ran the AWACS for some of the years can't generate a 25 or 50 or for that matter, a hundred tanker force if that's needed. This just seems crazy. And the same thing seems true of uh, at least some ISR. I mean, it's not like producing a reasonable reconnaissance or communications drone is way out there on the technology frontier right now. We're we're complaining about Iranian drones going to the to the Russians. So how can this be uh, this be a major issue? Now a lot of it has to do with money, right? So you're going to take money from one place to another, right? Or you're going to dominate the production on a production line where Airbus is more interested in defeating Boeing than they are in providing tankers, you know, to to for this. That's 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 another thing, right? But a lot of these enablers, they seem well within the reach of European countries and well within the reach of European industry. Right? So it sounds to me like this is, as you intimated, old time bureaucratic politics, which is that you know, if, you, if, if, if you can save a buck by assuming that the Americans will do it and not ask many questions, you did that. This was fine before the Americans developed obsessive compulsive disorder about the Taiwan Straits, but now that we do, and we're talking about the Pacific, right? It's it's pretty clear that Pacific is just going to swallow tankers, right? They're just going to disappear into that maw. None of them are going to be left for Europe. It's absurd to believe otherwise. And the same is probably true of air-breathing ISR. Th these are absurd assumptions to make in this day and age. And if people are still making them, it means that they're not serious. If they're not serious, we have to ask why they're not serious. If I can 
just <laughs> jump in on, on that. Having, having been part of that awful bureaucratic conversations for a while. A, uh, just to share one um, example around the tankers. Uh, I was part of the RAND study on the Libyan war. There was an interesting fact that popped up, uh, which was, uh, you know, there is a big temp tanker gap during the Libyan war to conduct the same pace of air operations, which then left, led to new NATO targets. Um, during that moment, the, and we're talk talking 2011, um, um, US Air Force Europe asked uh, PACOM, uh, could we get a few, a few more? And the answer was no, uh, too risky. Uh, uh, so we're talking 2011, so I, I can't imagine what the situation would be today. Uh, second point is uh, when we try to understand how come the US Air Force could not find six tankers to fill the gap. Uh, one of the reasons was a, a presidential visit to Australia that was using more tankers than the Libyan war. Uh, so uh, the, 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 so the, the story is, um, I think, uh, it, it, I, I'm telling this story just to say, you know, I think the Europeans have to realize that. So one of the answer was to do a, a fleet of tankers, but you know, to my great regret, it's uh, Airbus tankers, but it's there only seven of them, uh, uh, eight now, I think. So, you know, if I look at the great victory now, Luxembourg is officially flying a, a, a tanker, has paid for one tanker, that's good. Uh, uh, they don't have an Air Force, so flying an, a tanker is, is great. But on the other hand, you know, why is that fleet not a fleet of 30 or 40? And, and I agree with you on, on, on that. It might be a little different for some of the sophisticated ISR enablers where if you haven't invested money in developing that type of capabilities, it, it, the, 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 again, the step might be a bit higher. Okay, so you, the, your second point was the point that I was going to make, and I'm, I'm just also going to add one fact, which is that Europeans come to DC asking the administration, asking Americans um, in the lead up to the NATO summit, what can we do? What can we offer? How can we help shape the conversations? And Americans say, well, the Republican National Convention is a couple days after the summit. So help us make the case that NATO is a good deal. It's a good deal for American industries. It's a good deal for the American labor market. It helps with jobs. It helps with money. And that is the, the challenge that Europeans still face coming here. And that underpins, I think, a lot of the the speed of what we're seeing in, in terms of these big systems. Yeah, they shouldn't fall for it. <laughs> <laughs> the French are right. Europe needs more autonomous capabilities. They shouldn't fall for this nonsense. Even the Americans believe in NATO, which is, we're having a religious meeting here today about how much we, leave, we believe in NATO. Even the <laughs> Americans believe in this religion, and they don't, right? And, and whether or not you, know, you buy a few extra, it's not going to be the key. It may make Donald Trump happy. Mm. Right. But um, I, I, I think this, these are not, this is not serious. I'll bring you to the, the next time. The Say next what? Meet, I'll bring you to the next meeting. <laughs> nobody, nobody really cares what I think. But uh, <laughs> therefore, I, that's why I assert it with such vehemence. <laughs> well, I, I know we're leaving some questions on the cutting room floor. But uh, alas, we are, we are at time. So uh, just to, to close out, um, in the interest of time, I'll keep this brief. Uh, I'm, I'm struck. You know, kind of reflecting on the panel, the degree to which we started with the 2% standard, uh, kind of everyone coming to the conclusion that it, you know, it was, uh, it's a flawed standard, right? Uh, it's, you know, it only measures inputs, we should be caring about outputs. But in many ways, we conclude with kind of the going back to that standard and the, the sort of political logic that in many ways drives it, right? In, in some ways, we're sort of left with the 2% standard as something that we can't live with, but also can't live without. Uh, so with that being said, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. Uh.
All righty. Thank you for your patience. We're going to get started with our third panel. Welcome back. Please take your seats quickly, which you've already done. Uh, and remember to silence your cell phones. For our third panel today, we are excited to welcome Dr. Benedetta Berti, Ambassador Ivo Dalder, and Professor Luis Simone for a discussion on NATO and the Indo-Pacific, moderated by Tara Varma. Dr. Benedetta Berti is the Head of Policy Planning in the Office of the Secretary General at NATO. She is the author of four books, including Armed Political Organizations from Conflict to Integration, published by Johns Hopkins University Press. Ambassador Ivo Dalder is currently the Chief Executive Officer of the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. He served as U.S. Ambassador to NATO under President Barack Obama and on the U.S. National Security Council under President Bill Clinton. His most recent book with James Lindsay is The Empty Throne, America's Abdication of Global Leadership. Professor Luis Simon is the director of the Center for Security, Diplomacy, and Strategy, CSDS for short, at the Brussels School of Governance and the director of the Brussels Office of the Elcano Royal Institute. Additionally, a prolific researcher, he has authored more than two dozen articles on European security and defense, and is currently leading a European Research Council consolidator project on the implications of the US-China rivalry, rivalry for Europe. And finally, our moderator today, Tara Varma, is a visiting fellow at the Center of the United States and Europe at Brookings. Before that, she was a senior policy fellow and the head of the Paris office of the European Council on Foreign Relations. Her research focuses on European and Asian security developments. Please join me in welcoming the panels to the stage. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you so much to Georgetown University for bringing us together uh, in what has been an absolutely fascinating conference until now, celebrating NATO's 75th anniversary. And we're going to be talking about, I was going to say, a fairly controversial topic right now, at least a feisty topic, which is NATO and the Indo-Pacific. Um, there are many questions across Europe, in the US, but also in Asia, about what a NATO role could be in the Indo-Pacific region, whether there should be actually even a NATO role or not. Uh, and I hope that we'll be able to discuss this with the fantastic panel that we have now. If you look at a number of American and European documents um, that have been published in, in the past five years, one of the sentences that comes back uh, regularly is that security in Europe and security in Asia are indivisible. And we've seen, uh, of course, the NATO strategic concept that was released in July of 2022 also mentioning China. Um, the first time, so, I'm sorry, I'm mentioning China bluntly here because actually, you know, that if there is an Indo-Pacific strategy uh, or if there is thinking around the Indo-Pacific, it is because of the rise of China in particular. Sometimes the two are separate, but there is a sense uh, that the idea of the Indo-Pacific is also a way for allies, Asian partners, to think about what their role could be in, in the region um, with the rise of China. I'll first turn to Benedetta uh, here, who's the head of policy planning at NATO, to ask her about the evolution um, of NATO's thinking about China, how China features uh, as an actor in NATO thinking, and whether NATO should have a role or not when it comes to China. Benedetta, to you. Thank you, Tara. Um, so first of all, I would say that just the fact that uh, there is a panel on NATO in the Indo-Pacific is itself a reflection of how the alliance thinking has evolved in, in recent years. Because even uh, five years ago, this topic would not have been on our mind. And some would have said, why is NATO an alliance focused on the defense of allies on the Euro-Atlantic uh, arena? Even think about the Indo-Pacific. What is the connection there? And I would say, only five years afterwards, we are in a very, in a radically different security environment, one in which allies do not, no longer pose that question because in a context of rising strategic competition, which is the most transformative trend redefining the international security environment, I would say, in that context, the interlinkages, security-wise but broader interlinkages between the Euro-Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific theaters are apparent uh, more and more to all allies. 
and, the, and that starting point makes the discussion about how can NATO better prepare, prepare for security developments in the Indo-Pacific and their impact on your Atlantic security, now it's now front and center part of the political discussion at NATO. So just to say that even in very, very uh, few years, there's been a significant evolution in thinking. And of course, partially that is not exclusively, but partially that has been driven by a much more in-depth understanding of what this China challenge or systemic competition from challenge means for your Atlantic security and for NATO. And that discussion also started relatively recently in NATO. It started all in 2019, where essentially the allies decided to take a look at the People's Republic of China rise. And their initial question was, does this matter to your Atlantic security? And if so, what challenges and opportunities does this rise present? So that was the initial proposition. That was the statement back in 2019. And between 2019 and 2022, so for, the, for a couple of years, allies actually internally within NATO shared intelligence, shared security uh, assessments, and built a shared threat perception, a shared situational awareness of what are the parameters of this China challenge. And I think that um, reflection was crystallized in the 2022 strategic concept that essentially has a very different framing than that initial opening, let's look at challenges and opportunity and figure out what does this, what does this mean for your Atlantic security. In 2022, allies essentially said uh, the People's Republic of China uh, stated objectives on the global scene and course if policies and behavior represent a challenge to our security, to our interests, and to our values. And therefore, we looked, we look at the systemic challenges posed by the PRC as a uh, source of concern. And then, the, and then the, the diagnosis of the strategic concept goes on and lists what are the different elements of this challenge. Fast forward, because I know we have five minutes each to 2024. If I look back at that diagnosis and I, and I look at it through the lens of 2024, I would say that most elements, if not all elements of that diagnosis remain pertinent. But uh, I would say for most of these trends, um, there has been a deterioration of the situation. And I would say back in 2022, the allies talked about looking with concern about the PRC uh, rapid military modernization, conventional nuclear with relative lack of transparency or interest in arms control. That remains a concern today. They talked about how the PRC was uh, flexing its muscle and engaging in coercive policies and behavior in the Indo-Pacific region. Fast forward to 2024, I think we can say that unfortunately that trend has also deteriorated. Uh, the strategic talk concept talked about how uh, the PRC and Russia were at the forefront of an authoritarian pushback against a rules-based international order. Again, with the uh, April 2024, that trend remains very much valid. And in a way, that has been worsened exponentially since the beginning of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine. And today, what we see, I would say, is not just a closer relationship between the PRC and Russia, but we really see how Russia's, how the PRC's support economically and through dual use goods is essentially lending a lifeline and supporting the Russian's war efforts in Ukraine in ways that are incredibly consequential. On top of that, we see really more and more the parameters of what you could call an authoritarian alliance with the PRC and Russia working also with Iran and DDPRK. And if two years ago someone would have said that in the spring of 2024, we would have had North Korea munitions killing, Europea killing Ukrainians, in Europe and Iranian drones, again, killing Ukrainians, we would have, we would have probably thought that was science fiction, but that's where we are today. Um, and then to last minutes, the strategic concept doesn't just talk about all of these more macro trends. You also look at what the PRC's um, posture is with respect and in the Euro-Atlantic theater. So we're looking at cyber attacks, we're looking at economic coercion, we're looking at the whole hybrid toolbox, and we're also looking at the strategic investment in uh, critical minerals, critical resources, critical assets, critical technologies, all of that to foster uh, strategic dependencies. So take all of this together and you have the assessment that this 
crucially matters to your Atlantic security, that the two theaters are interlinked, and the NATO as a political and military organization has absolutely a role to play. First, when it comes to building the shared transatlantic convergence, because you cannot have similar policies if you have different assessments of the reality. And that has been a key role that NATO has played over the last few years and continues to play with respect to the China challenge. Uh, but of course, awareness is not enough, and that's why we're also working very much on the issues of resilience and preparedness. How do we work to counter authoritarian coercion, to build resilience, uh, which is, of course, deterrence by denial or a component of integrated deterrence, depending on how you want to talk about it. And then, of course, the third element, in addition of building awareness, build, building resilience, is working with our partners in the Indo-Pacific, which is my cue to stop talking mm -hmm. and look at Luis, because he will take that he will take that question, so. Thanks a here. lot. Yeah, I was going to say this is a perfect segue into <laughs> what I was going to ask Luis about a, an expanded NATO uh, agenda in the Indo-Pacific. Could you get into a little bit, I guess, continuation in a way of what Benedetta was just talking about? Sure, Th thanks, Tara. I'll, I'll try and build on what Benedetta was, uh, was saying. Yeah, my sense by listening to Benedetta is that NATO as an alliance I mean, if you, if you look at the agreed language, that is, it's as clear-headed about the fact that its center of gravity lies in the Euro-Atlantic as it is about the fact that the Indo-Pacific has become the center of gravity of, of the fate of the international system and of dynamics of global power competition, militarily, technologically, and economically. So I think there's this growing awareness in NATO circles that the fate of the Euro-Atlantic, and Benetta was alluding to that, is increasingly tied to sort of broader uh, global dynamics whose center of gravity lay outside of the Euro-Atlantic. And we're simply not used to that uh, because ever since NATO, um, uh, since, since NATO was born uh, in 1949, and, and long before that, of course, uh, the Euro-Atlantic has been at the center of global power dynamics, and, and that is no longer the case. Uh, and I think that sort of situation, and again, Benetta was touching on that, sort of compels the alliance, and I would actually say Europeans more, more specifically, uh, to, to, to reflect more systematically about the links between Europe, or the Euro-Atlantic, and the Indo-Pacific. Uh, and this is why all those references to you know, growing geostrategic uh, uh, um, uh, interdependence between the Euro-Atlantic and the Pacific have gained so much traction in recent years, particularly in the last few years since the strategic concept, I would say. Uh, at the same time, and, and more concretely, uh, going back to your question, the, uh, the dialogue between NATO and its Indo-Pacific partners tends to avoid or explicitly actually sidestep uh, 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 links to either China uh, or the idea of the alliance playing a direct role in the Indo-Pacific region itself, right? So what we're talking about is not about NATO in the Indo-Pacific, but it's about NATO with the Indo-Pacific, right? Uh, and for understandable reasons, in the sense that first, the European allies uh, in general, I would say, think that NATO's main business, as I was saying, is securing the Euro-Atlantic, which is already challenging enough as it mm -hmm. is. Uh, second, Indo-Pacific countries actually don't really want NATO to go to the Indo-Pacific to the Indo-Pacific itself. What we hear from them is this: please hold the line in Eastern Europe, free up some U.S. bandwidth, and yes, support us diplomatically and so on. Uh, and and honestly, not even the United States itself is uh, pushing for a NATO role in the Indo-Pacific. And we heard Ambassador Smith allude to that this morning quite quite clearly. So what we're talking about here is diplomatic solidarity uh, 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 with each other's problems and standing up for global norms whenever and wherever they're challenged. And, and, and it's global situational awareness and so on. Uh, and yet, there's this powerful narrative out there uh, about NATO somehow expanding, or the possibility that NATO may expand to the Indo-Pacific, which we are told would be highly disruptive and trigger some sort of es regional escalation dynamics. Uh, but that narrative uh, about NATO going to the Indo-Pacific is certainly not coming from NATO. Uh, 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 either from European or Indo-Pacific governments or from the US government. My sense is that it's coming from, from elsewhere, and yet we seem to have developed this huge complex around the no NATO in the Indo-Pacific narrative, which is a bit of a straw man, frankly. Uh, so much so that my, my sense is that that complex is sort of slowing down uh, even NATO's agenda of cooperation with uh, the Indo-Pacific, in the sense that NATO's cooperation with Indo-Pacific partners is still framed by and large in broad transnational sort of 1990s uh, 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 style and, and, and language by emphasizing the need to uphold global norms, tackle challenges like terrorism, proliferation, uh, the climate security nexus, and identifying 
areas like cyber or disinformation as the most promising areas for further incorporation. And, and I get that because you need to start somewhere and that's sort of the low hanging fruit, uh, but it's a fruit that still has a very strong transnational 1990s uh, flavor and it's in my view out of sync with current geostrategic realities and, and priorities. So, and to go back to your question, as we move towards the Washington summit and beyond, I think we should think harder about how to link more explicitly NATO's uh, core strategic priorities, which right now is essentially about deterrence in, in a context of great power revisionism, and it's in the Pacific agenda. And I like your point about more expansive because in my view that is precisely what a more expansive agenda, NATO in the Pacific agenda should be about. And that actually strikes me as common sense because NATO and its Indo-Pacific partners, particularly I would say Japan, Australia, and the ROK, uh, have very similar strategic and operational priorities. How to strengthen deterrence against great power revisionism. So even if our main threat referent or area of responsibility is different, the fact that the challenges we face strategically and operationally uh, are so similar underlines the existence, I think, of very important synergies uh, uh, in key areas like operational planning, uh, force structure, capability development, and military technological uh, um, development. So I think we should be thinking about how to develop a sort of cross-theater deterrence ecosystem in terms of operational concepts, capabilities, and technologies that are transferable and can make a difference in both theaters regardless of the question of who does what or what the appropriate operational vehicle is, which is a contingent and a political question that we shouldn't, we shouldn't prejudice. Um, so for instance, imagine if, if our ammunitions, and, and I think uh, Angus was talking about that earlier, right? Uh, 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 which is a challenge even within, a Europe, within, within the NATO context. If, if uh, ammunitions, platforms, capabilities, doctrine, standards uh, were compatible, uh, that gives you a level of scale uh, 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 to, to, to sort of prevail in the context of, uh, of, 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 of attrition uh, that, that would be a real, a real security multiplier for both regions, regardless, again, regardless of whether you stay out operationally from each other's region. I think I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Um, let me turn to Ivo now. So we are about to celebrate uh, NATO's 75th anniversary here in Washington at a time where the alliance seems reinvigorated. It's been extended. There are 32 allies now in it. But at the same time, and Ambassador Smith referred to this earlier this morning, there seems to be a case to be made for NATO inside the US. And NATO and US foreign policy are being weaponized inside the domestic campaign right now for the presidential election. How, how do you think? Um, the administration will face this tension between this moment that is supposed to be celebrated and at the same time all the challenges that it's been faced right now in the Euro-Atlantic area, of course, uh, with a very difficult situation in Ukraine, but also many questions about an expanded NATO agenda. <coughs> Sorry. So I hope uh, they'll take it head on um, because it is actually not very hard to make the case why NATO matters to the average American citizen. Part of it is a discussion about how the world is evolving, the natures of threats are evolving, not just with Russia and Ukraine, but the center of gravity, is, as Louise put it, sort of shifting uh, away from the, uh, from the North Atlantic, Euro Atlantic theater to a more global one, something that, by the way, started a lot longer ago than before we thought about the PRC as mm -hmm. the kind of threat that Bernadette talked about. Uh, I know it's, it's popular to say that it was the first time in Madrid that the four Indo-Pacific countries were invited to a NATO summit. Actually, uh, they were invited to a NATO summit the first time in 2010 because they were all contributing to, uh, Argentine, to the uh, uh, Afghan operation. But in 2012, um, uh, they were invited as part of uh, four of 13 countries which were called partners across the globe. And NATO was starting to think about how do you operate a Euro-Atlantic slash North Atlantic uh, organization for the defense and the security of that area within a global context. Uh, and partnerships were a, a critical part of it. And, and I think we're just seeing an evolution of that, same, of that same piece. But that's part of the larger argument about how NATO as an institution, which for much of the f first 40 years was focused on to fool the gap, uh, in many ways defending Western Europe against the possibility of a Warsaw Pact slash Soviet invasion, um, 
is still an, is become an institution over the past 30 years that actually has a role that goes well beyond it. And it does so in order to bring together what we talked about over lunch, uh, bring together allies as part of a overall strategy for dealing with the security problems that we face uh, ourselves. And in that regard, part of the problem we have in this country and part of the debate we've had in this country is to assume that what NATO is about is burden sharing. That somehow you have allies because they do stuff for you. That's not why anybody has an ally. You have allies because you believe their security is fundamental to your security. It's very different. It's not about what they do for you. It's that their security is fundamental to yours. That if they are insecure, you will be insecure. That if they are unable to defend themselves, we are unable to defend ourselves. And it's that concept of how to think about uh, security as a win-win proposition within an alliance context, as opposed to a win-lose proposition, which is what burden sharing is about. If you do more, I can do less. Well, no, actually. If you do more, then you are more secure and that's good for me. So we'd like you to do more from that perspective, but not because I can then do less, but because I can then be more secure. And that debate um, is the one that I think we should now start having in this country head on, which is a debate about why do we have alliances? They're not a favor we do to other people. They are fundamentally because having strong alliances keeps us secure, keeps us free, keeps us prosperous. That's why we have alliances. And by the way, if it didn't, we wouldn't have alliances. Then we would walk away. We don't need them anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is a very different argument than who is playing 2% or not, or whether NATO uh, uh, Europeans are, have increased their defense spending by 180 billion over the last 10 years. Great, very important. The threats mandate that it be done. But that doesn't mean our responsibility is less. No, it means our security is bigger. It's more significant than it was in the past. And if we don't take on this debate head on, and we don't stop playing the game that frankly certain people have been trying to play, play which is that this is about how much do you pay versus how much can I then not have to pay, then we're going to lose this argument. We are going to lose that argument. If the argument is about paying, about burden sharing in terms of money, as opposed to how do you provide for security, we're never going to beat that argument. Uh, and I would take it on head on. And I think this campaign is a huge, is a huge opportunity uh, to start talking about what has 75 years of NATO done? Just to recall, the reason we created NATO is because we needed Europe to become free and prosperous. It's pretty darn free, it's pretty darn prosperous, um, and that has benefited us greatly. That's why we did it. Also, oh, by the way, we also did it because we don't want to have World War III starting in Europe, uh, and we better be prepared that we make sure that it doesn't happen, because uh, it's so costly if it does, which, by the way, is also about our security. So that's. That's the argument we need to have. Go back to the kind of first principles as opposed to this is, you have alliances so they do more for you. That's not understanding that we're living in a world where the sum uh, is greater than, uh, th where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Thanks a lot. In a few minutes, we'll open the floor to the audience, so please prepare your questions, short, so that we can have several of them. Before that, I want to ask uh, the three of you two questions. Um, and we'll go in reverse order. The first one is about the kind of risks that the China-Russia rapprochement uh, poses basically to the Euro-Atlantic area because part of what the three of you have been saying and alluding to is the systemic nature of mm -hmm. the China challenge. So what kind of risks do they pose? And what kind of EU-NATO cooperation you could see to reinforce NATO and maybe also EU-NATO cooperation in the Indo-Pacific specifically? Um, we'll start with you, Ivo, then go to Luis, and then Benedetta. So one, uh, I, um, I'm, call me still the skeptic on, on, uh, on Russia-China uh, cooperation uh, in the following sense. That relationship is a very, is a very tenuous one. Uh, clearly, the moment has called 
for uh, the Russians to be increasingly dependent on the Chinese uh, for market access in particular, but also for technology imports that they need because of the sanctions so they can try to rebuild their defense industry. But it is very much a demandeur uh, uh, driven relationship, something where the Chinese are exploiting the opportunity for economic gain in terms of having cheap access to, to, uh, to raw materials and to oil in particular uh, for relatively, relatively little cost. I don't think it is a coincidence, a fundamental interest between them in the same way that our relationship in the United States with our allies across the world is the same. I think it's a very tactical, uh, uh, um, perhaps temporary, perhaps long temporary uh, uh, relationship, and one we need to worry about uh, because they are malign actors in, in each in their own different ways, but it isn't clear to me that their, in, that their interests always coincide um, in, in that way. Secondly, in terms of, I, I think that we, we, are, we are framing the problem, NATO, EU, and the Indo-Pacific in the wrong way. Um, I don't believe there is a, quote, NATO role in the Indo-Pacific. I think Europeans, North Americans, and Asians have similar perspectives, similar values, similar capabilities, and similar needs that need to be integrated in a far better way than they are. And NATO and the EU may not be the best institution for leading that charge. Uh, Jim Lindsay and I, uh, and Jim and I have written a lot together, wrote a piece uh, a couple of years ago about the, the importance for expanding the G7 to become the G12. To bring together the major allies of the United States that are also the major industrial, uh, advanced industrial democracies around the world, happen to be 12, could be longer, more, depending on what you call major, but the countries of the G7 plus the European Union and, the four, and our four Asian, um, Asian democratic allies, uh, to be part of a conversation about how you prepare and deal with the threats that are posed, not just by China, but yes, by China, not just by Russia, but yes, by Russia, and others as well, to coordinate in the way that is necessary. If you look at what's happened in Ukraine, one of the top coordinating mechanisms for thinking about Ukraine is not NATO, it's not the EU, it's the G7. The sanction regime, all done in the G7 with EU, direct EU participation, because it is, the G7 is a direct participatory, participatory one. The security guarantees that came out at Vilnius came out of the G7 construct. Um, doesn't mean NATO doesn't have a particular important role, but it means that it is actually judged by certain countries, particularly the United States, but others, that having Japan part of that conversation is important. It is equally important to have European countries part of the Indo-Pacific conversation, more so than it has in the past, which is why having a mechanism that brings North Americans, Europeans, and Asian Indo-Pacific countries, as it is called these days, uh, that work together on the economic dimension, on the value dimension, and on the security slash military dimension is important. And NATO isn't the best instrument for doing that. The EU isn't the best instrument for doing that. Um, so we need to figure out, is there another instrument? We need to get away from the idea that there's a trans-Pacific or an Indo-Pacific policy and a trans-Atlantic or Euro-Atlantic policy. What we need is one that is integrated more uh, because the threats and the challenges that we are aren't actually geographically limited. They are far more global. Final, if you want to take an example, where should NATO be more, most concerned about a direct Chinese threat to the Euro-Atlantic area? In the Arctic. It's NATO territory. Right now, six of the seven Arctic nations are NATO countries. That's new, that's different. It's also where the Chinese military capability these days is, is growing at a rapid rate. And so that's a place where NATO should and, and spent more time to think about it. But it also needs to do that together with the Koreans, and the Japanese, because much of the shipping comes through that same channel uh, that matters from the Arctic. So we're living in a different world, which is much more global, uh, and thinking about ourselves in these regionally restricted areas may not be the best way 
uh, to deal with those challenges. Thanks. Luis? Yeah, thanks. So following up on what the ambassador was saying, first on the China-Russia dynamic, I think we can all probably agree that uh, the China-Russia relationship is a highly complex animal, right? On the one hand, uh, their alignment appears to be rather tight. Uh, on the other hand, we know there are frictions, right? So we're all trying to wrap our heads around the question of how much friction, how much does it matter, and relatedly, to what extent is it exploitable, right? As some people were saying this morning. Uh, but it seems to me that for the time being, what unites China and Russia is significantly greater than what divides them, in the sense that the need to push back against U.S. power in particular uh, sort of compels these two countries uh, to contain their frictions, right? A sort of gentleman's agreement, if you will. And that matters to NATO concretely because, it, as Benedetta was saying, uh, by helping Russia sort of cushion uh, uh, Western economic and political pressure, China has indirectly but significantly, it seems, uh, 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 assisted uh, Russia's assault on the European security architecture. Now, the expert consensus is that the war has impacted the China-Russia relationship in two main ways. First, it has strengthened the relationship. Second, it has further upset the balance of power within the relationship in China's favor. Now, I would not dispute that, uh, but I would be careful about buying into the narrative that Russia is at China's mercy. Uh, China is actually the main long-term strategic competitor of the United States. And according to U.S. national security language, the only country that can pose a sustained, long-term, multidimensional, you know, pick your objective, challenge to the, uh, to the international order, which is basically uh, 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 an expression uh, uh, to talk about U.S. power. So that means that um, uh, uh, China has a strong interest in preserving an amicable relationship with Russia. Uh, uh, so in other words, well, a short-term perspective uh, uh, and a sort of protracted war in Ukraine may enhance China's leverage vis-a-vis -vis, uh, Russia, a long-term and sort of broader global geopolitical perspective underscores Russia's actual diplomatic leverage vis-a-vis -vis, vis -vis China. Now on the EU-NATO thing, I actually think the EU can play a, a, an important contribution in the context of that ecosystem idea that I was talking about, right? You think about deterrence and collective defense in a, in a context of attrition and protraction. Uh, you need on the one hand the operational concepts, the capabilities, and so on that can deliver deterrence at the front end, but you also need the financial and industrial depth uh, and technological uh, solutions, right? So basically we need to think of deterrence as a whole society uh, effort. And I think the NATO as an instrument, right? NATO has a competitive advantage downstream, if you will, right? When it comes to the operational aspects or the direct implementation of deterrence because of its state-of-the-art uh, uh, C2 uh, architecture, its integrated defense policy planning process, uh, and its excellence when it comes to setting standards, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So it's NATO that can ascertain the kind of operational concepts, capabilities that you need to deliver deterrence and put them in practice. But I would say that the EU actually has a competitive advantage upstream, if you will, in the resourcing and enabling of deterrence. Uh, because it operates as significant multi-annual uh, budget, because it has competences in areas like research, technology, industry, and because it can mobilize instruments like the European Defense Fund, the European Investment Bank, uh, and, 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 and so on and so forth. So even if those technologies, capabilities, and, and skill sets are, are going to be channeled operationally through NATO, the EU can actually play an important role in, in generating them. So I think we need to, again, move on in terms of how we talk about the EU-NATO relationship, because we tend to talk about it, EU-NATO relations in, a, in the context of out-of-area operations in a transnational context, and talk about how the EU-NATO relationship can be put at the service of uh, strengthening deterrence in a European context. Thanks a lot, Benedetta. Well, a lot has been said, so, but let me see if I can add, uh, starting for, with your first point, I think I, I will slightly rephrase what I said before, but I stick by it. It is, I don't think any, any, anybody out there is talking about a formal alliance, at least not as we look at alliances, we in, the, in Washington and in Brussels, when it comes to the Russian-Chinese relationship. That being said, in terms of operational behavior, in terms of concerted action, in terms of mutual amplification of hostile narratives and behavior, I think what we see is, a, is, is at this particular point in time, because they have a shared interest 
in pushing back against the rules-based international order as it is today, uh, we do see uh, growing synergies between these two actors. And I think that has been evident since be the beginning of Russia's war of aggression against Ukraine, even before, of course, with the declaration of friendship without limits, which are, of course gave you a taste of what was to come. But as we are today, where we are today in uh, April 2024, I think there's a certain level of path dependency in what is happening. At this point, the PRC has supported the Russian Federation in its war of aggression to an extent that its outcome will also have an indirect impact on the PRC itself. So that path dependency, I think, is only likely, if anything, to strengthen that relationship into the future rather than weaken it, whilst not uh, excluding the fact that there are areas where indeed there are frictions behind, and, the, and those frictions may be amplified in the future. But in the future, we may all be dead. In the present, they are very much working uh, as a hopeful words from Benedetta. <laughs> this is our, this is, this, this is, you know, this is the spirit. Yes. But, uh, and on top of that, as I see this uh, growing strategic convergence and concerted actions between these actors, as I said before, I think we would be remiss if we didn't also look at the North Korean and Iranian dimension and that crystallizing pseudo alliance, uh, strategic convergence of autocracy as a significant change challenge to the rule-based inter rule international order and transatlantic security. In terms of the NATO-EU peace, I think there's a lot that we are doing together when it comes to the Indo-Pacific, while recognizing what everybody has said, that this is not about NATO shifting its mandate or expanding its military presence in the Indo-Pacific. That's not where we add value. Where we add value is to use NATO for what it was intended in 49, which is to be a military and a political organization. Mm. So to forge that, consen that consensus, to forge that convergence policy-wise, and then to deal with what are the from a European perspective, mostly non-kinetic implication of the rise of the China challenge from cybersecurity to building resilience to countering economic coercion to, especially for European allies, to thinking through what are the elements that European allies can, can bring to the table when it comes to contributing to deterrence and defense on a, in a two theater perspective. Um, and uh, again, a lot of it is about economic statecraft, it's about political diplomacy, it's about French shoring, it's about ring fence in our democracy society, uh, key technologies and assets and infrastructure. All of these, of course, are not about building a military presence, but I would argue are very important in having a coherent, cohesive, and strong response to what is ultimately a collective systemic challenge. And in that piece, and I'll close here because I know we want questions, of course, NATO is crucial because we have very complementary and mutually reinforcing roles, especially on issues concern, con related to resilience. So there's a lot that we can do together uh, with our Indo-Pacific partners at the table, and that's very much the direction of travel, building on what both other panelists say, and added the dimension of technology, defense innovation, and contributing to strengthen our transatlantic and Indo-Pacific defense industrial ecosystem. I think that, to me, will be the future as well. Thanks a lot. Um, we'll open to the floor now. I would please ask you to keep your question short, introduce yourself, and don't hesitate to say if your question is directed at one of the panelists or all of them. I think there should be a mic uh, circulating. Yeah, there'll be a mic here. You, yeah, please go up, up there. Hello. Hello? Oh, sorry. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Uh, my name is Laura Kelly. I cover foreign policy for The Hill. Um, Benedetta, if I may ask for your reaction, um, Secretary General uh, Stoltenberg made his proposals for the Washington summit surrounding NATO's role for Ukraine, and there were some interesting responses from some members uh, White House National Security spokesperson, Council spokesperson John Kirby kind of came out a little bit in opposition to NATO taking over the, the Rammstein grouping, um, and then of course Hungary's blanket opposition to the proposals. Um, so if I may have your reaction, and then Ambassador Dalder, if I may have your reaction since this was your ideas with uh, Secretary Don Fried. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. We'll take uh, the two other questions as well. and. and Sure thing. First of all, thank you so much for all of your time today. It's uh, been a great panel, certainly. Um, my name is Michael Kather. I'm a second-year grad student here at Georgetown in the German and European Studies program. 
Um, and the question I had for you is, in talking about NATO becoming more involved in the Indo-Pacific and you know, the types of burdens that we're talking about, where uh, we're looking at getting involved, uh, I guess I was wondering what each of you would say to the idea of the best way for NATO to become involved in security in the Indo-Pacific would be to take on a greater share of the, of the burden or a greater amount of responsibility in deterring threats in Europe rather than becoming directly involved in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, does that statement make sense? Is it something that we should look to overcome or you know, what your feelings are on the issue? Thank you. Thank you. The last question. Hi, I'm Matt Gluck. I work at Lawfare. Um, so Ambassador Adalder laid out the case for U.S. deep engagement um, in Europe, perhaps to Professor Posen's uh, dismay. Um, but I'm wondering, so, and, and you made that case on the basis that, uh, that the U.S. has significant um, interests and accrues significant security benefits from that engagement. So I'm wondering what benefits uh, the U.S.'s uh, European allies view uh, that they can, what, what kind of similar benefits they think they may be able to gain from uh, potential engagement in the Indo-Pacific if they uh, choose to uh, pursue that sort of engagement. Thanks. Thanks a lot. And I hope you'll have a, a time for a second round. Let's start with you, Benedict. Okay. Um, maybe I'll try, I'll try very quickly in, in reverse order. Uh, and I think the, sec the, 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 the second and the third questions are related, right? In, in the sense that we're asking, what is it for Europeans? Why does it matter to us? And I think that the argument I, very simply is, uh, the way I, at least the way I look at the word, and I'm curious to hear my co-panelist and moderator who knows a great deal about the subject as well, but the way I look at the, at, at the Indo-Pacific is that it's grow more and more the growing epicenter of strategic competition, development, growth. So it has an incredibly important value to everyone, not just to the United States, but also to European allies. And I would say that it's quite clear to me that any significant disruption of the status quo or crisis on conflict or large-scale instability in that region of the world would have great ripple effects that would also impact on your Atlantic security, including directly, and also on our economic and uh, strategic interests. So in other words, for European allies to have greater situational awareness of what happens in the Indo-Pacific, to think about what the impacts of potential crisis on our theater are. Those are not things that we would do in order to please anyone. Those are things that are part and parcel of how we ensure uh, collective security in the 21st century. I would say NATO as an alliance and NATO allies don't have the luxury of only worrying about one threat or one theater, simply because those interlinkages are so deeply rooted. So I would say it's in our interest uh, for European allies to think through what kind of role they can play. And that, to me, has a lot to do with diplomatic elements, with countering economic coercion, with doing our homework at home. And that is about building the resilience of our supply chain so that they're safe and secure, of our critical technologies, or protecting our industry, working on French shoring, de-risking, choose the label of your picking. But all of that are, to me, essential components of how you build this deterrence and defense that holds on two theaters. Because bottom line, what happens there will matter to us. And by the way, that's something our Indo-Pacific partners understand very well. Because when you look at who is supporting Ukraine to fight aggression, to resist aggression, it's NATO allies and it is our Indo-Pacific partners. Together, we provide 100% of the military, financial, and humanitarian assistance to Ukraine. So we understand those linkages. I think that answered the question. But there was a first one, which was about commenting on the uh, ongoing discussions within NATO uh, with respect to the Washington summit on how can NATO take a more um, active role when it comes to the coordination of training and uh, support to Ukraine. I will not be very surprising in telling you that the negotiations are still occurring, so I really want to stay very far away from making predictions of where do we end up in Washington, but I think there is a strong interest shared by all allies in thinking through how can we really put our support for Ukraine on long-term footing, and how can we do that in a way that signals a long-term commitment and also signals to the Kremlin that they will not wait us out, that we will remain committed, and that that uh, support, training, and assistance will be put on a more 
predictable and solid footing. And I think we're working in that direction and seeing exactly what's the NATO piece in that discussion. And more than that, I think, stay tuned. We are only a few weeks away from July where I expect you will see the fully cooked proposal. Evo. Uh, just, uh, Laura, on your, on your question, um, I mean, the reason that, that, that Karen and I sort of push the idea of a greater NATO role is in part because of what Bernadette said, which is to demonstrate the long-term enduring support that NATO countries as a whole, with or without the United States, is part of that, because that's part of the, the, the subcontext, to be real, uh, given where our politics is going that that support is there for the long haul. That's one part of it. The other part of it, and I think in, in some ways more important part, is that we believe, I strongly believe, that Ukraine's future is in NATO. By the way, I'm quoting the Vilnius uh, summit declaration, and that anything we can do to hasten that day where it happens is a good thing, and bringing NATO closer to the whole uh, integrative um, effort uh, with regard to Ukraine is a good thing. So that includes on training, and includes on, uh, on the Rammstein coalition, it includes on uh, building the future force, uh, that all of that is much preferable to be done within the NATO coordinating context than outside of NATO. Now, there is a disagreement in the U.S. government about this. Uh, and, uh, you know, I won't predict how it comes out. Um, but uh, the hesitancy that you heard from, that you quoted from, from Kirby and others reflects the fact that there are elements in the U.S. government who strongly oppose this, uh, mainly because they think they're better at it when it comes to coordinating than NATO. And that actually brings me sort of back to uh, our discussion earlier on with, with regard to uh, burden sharing and debate. The United States needs to get off the high horse that we know everything. And by the way, the more we talk about us knowing everything, you are taking away the responsibility of other countries to do what they not only can, but should be doing. And there's a direct correlation, and Camille talked about that very well, uh, I think, over lunch. There's a direct correlation with our posture that says, we don't trust you to do anything, and then walking around saying, but you need to pay more for the stuff that we're telling you to do. And by the way, Buy American is part of that. It's just not a very consistent and, and, and sophisticated policy. The same argument is now happening on Rammstein. Uh, it's, the same, it's the same basic uh, change of, of thinking that needs to happen in the United States if we want to be uh, uh, serious about this stuff, which brings us sort of to the larger question. I think we need to get out of this idea that we are living in two theaters. We're living on one globe, which happens to have other parts uh, where, uh, that, you know, there are, and there are various parts of it. It isn't clear to me that the Indo-Pacific is the driving force for the future. I could make a good argument by 2050 it's going to be Africa. And so what are the institutional mechanisms that each of our countries have for coordinating to deal with the world as it is and it is likely to evolve? Mm -hmm. Ones that are geographically restricted are increasingly less central to that effort. They're important parts of it, That's but they're not central to it than ones that are more flexible mm -hmm. and that can take on a more global perspective. And so, what I would argue to the Europeans is don't think about the security challenge. I think Bernadette made all those arguments, right? Don't think about the security challenges in a European context, but think of them in a global context. Many of them are coming from Asia because of supply chains, because of technology development, because of what the Chinese are doing. And you need to find ways to cooperate with your friends in the United States and your friends in the Indo-Pacific to deal with that. Is NATO the best way to do that? Maybe on some issues, yeah. Is the European Union the best way to do that? Perhaps on other issues. Are there other mechanisms in which we can bring them together? But my view is it's got to be North American countries, European countries, and Indo-Pacific countries doing that all together uh, in an integrated fashion. Because that's the world we're living in, rather than this idea that you have a trans-Pacific. You know, in Washington, you have people who look one way, across the Atlantic and people who look the other way across the Pacific. Well, you know, if you go far enough, 
They're all integrated <laughs> because the world is round. Thanks a lot. I would just like to get one question into Louis about, because we've, we're getting European and American perspectives on the Indo-Pacific, but I'm, I would like you to tell us what do you think the IP4 are expecting of the US and Europe at a time of an evolving US-China relationship? Uh, and then we'll go to the two people, if you can answer that, and I'll go to the two people waiting. Yeah, and if I can also very quickly yeah, uh, jump in on the, on the second and third question. So I'll take your question first, uh, and I think I touched on that previously. My sense is that what the Japanese and the Australians and so on are saying, guys, we expect you to show a similar degree of solidarity that we have shown with Ukraine in terms of you know, political support, normative support, uh, uh, you know, economic sanctions if it comes to it, uh, and so on and so forth. But militarily, please just you know, hold the line in Europe. Make sure that, there, that there's as much US bandwidth as possible. And do not, do not worry about coming over here, right? Uh, um, and on the second question, uh, uh, look, I mean, I think that um, there's, I, I understand that the China-Russia relationship is one factor that sort of underscores the links between the two regions. But in my mind, the main, the main factor bringing the two regions together is the deterrence and security architecture of these two regions uh, uh, hinges on the, on the same factor, which is US military power and that U.S. military resources are not unlimited, right? I think this is, this is the, main, the main factor bringing the two together. So going back to the second uh, question, uh, I think that NATO needs eyes and, uh, going back to what Benedetto was saying, NATO needs eyes and ears in the Indo-Pacific for global situational awareness purposes to try and understand how developments in the Indo-Pacific uh, impinge on U.S. force posture, defense planning, and force availability uh, in Europe. And I know that the channel between, between Indo-PACOM and EUCOM is, is as direct as it can be through the U.S. system, right? And I know that some U.S. individual uh, NATO allies have liaison officers in Indo-PACOM and elsewhere in the region, but I think it's important to have a direct channel through NATO uh, because it is NATO that it is the main vehicle for defense planning in Europe. Uh, so I think it is NATO that needs to understand in real time how developments in the Indo-Pacific uh, 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 affect uh, um, uh, force availability uh, in the Euro-Atlantic in peacetime and, uh, uh, and, and, and in wartime. Thanks a lot. Let's go to the two gentlemen, the questions. Please go ahead. Yes, thank you for this uh, wonderful uh, panel. So I'm uh, Matthew Droin. I work as a visiting fellow at CSIS. Uh, so I think uh, we clearly see the, the value uh, in, in en enhancing coordination and cooperation between NATO and uh, uh, like-minded uh, Asia-Pacific partners. Now I want to bring some of the reservations that have been voiced within the alliance, but also more importantly, perhaps in the, in the Indo-Pacific, which is uh, NATO as the venue to, uh, to have these uh, discussions, and it has been raised also by Ambassador uh, Ivo. And I think it, the discussion is a bit misleading if we talk about NATO and the Indo-Pacific, because in fact we're talking about four countries, which are largely Pacific, the total population amounts to more or less the, the population of Bangladesh. And so we're missing the ASEAN uh, centrality, which is in the most of the uh, Indo-Pacific documents and more of the Eurasia, in fact. Um, and we cannot blame these countries who are not super familiar with NATO when the only thing they see about Indo-Pacific engagement is uh, leaders of these countries coming to NATO uh, to make, to build narratives out of that. Uh, and so my question is, when you engage with these uh, countries uh, in, in venues like uh, Shangri-La or Resina Dialogue or other, uh, what do you hear in terms of perception and evolution of perception? And more importantly, what do you tell them to assuage their, their concerns? Thank you. Thank you. And we'll take the second question as well. Um, what role do you think NATO has or policy ideas have you had in respect to Africa? Okay, thank you. Um, so we have approximately 12 minutes to finish. Uh, Luis, let's go to you, then Benedetta, and then we'll end with, um, with Ivo. I think I'll leave the Africa question for, for Benedetta, well, sure. and perhaps the ambassador will. But I actually want to say something about the one theater thing, because I actually have an issue with this concept of one theater, a single theater. Uh, because of course that we live in one world and everything is related, but I think we need to 
uh, uh, to, to, to go a bit beyond that. That's too vague of a statement, right? And, and, and security interdependence is a lot more intense within regions than it is across regions, right? So we need to get a handle of how related things are and, and how much it matters strategically, right? Uh, 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 because the fact that security interdependence is much more intense within regions than across regions means that regions require uh, dedicated uh, uh, strategies, right? Uh, and also the single theater uh, thesis also eludes a very much needed and very real discussion on strategic priorities and the fact that there are trade-offs, both for the United States and for its allies. So I, I, I have an issue with this one theater. I'd rather think about cross-theater dynamics and, and try to get a sense of how much, how relevant they are, how much they matter, than one theater which, which, which sort of models uh, uh, the, the strategic picture. Um, so, um, um, I think that shifting the discussion from whether Europe and the Indo-Pacific in, uh, 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 concretely are interdependent or not, uh, which I, I believe we can all agree that they are, to their degree of interdependence can help us think more clearly about how to strike a balance between the need to set priorities and acknowledge that there are trade-offs on the one hand, and then the existence of, of, of synergies or cross-theater or inter-theater dynamics on, on, on the other hand. I just wanted to, to make that point. Sure. So, what do I, and first, the first question, so I, 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 I'm so tempted to go into this discussion, one theater, cross theaters, I talk about two strategically interlinked yeah. the theaters, we could geek out on this, but I would like, no, let's, I mean, let's have the discussion, we have a few minutes, it's, I think we but should that, have but, it, but, and we'll answer, I mean, I, you will be very efficient, I know. I will, okay. But let's get into it, because this is precisely what this is all about, what the panel is all about, so well, I think we should get to the crux of it. I'll try. So I don't think you're saying different. I think it depends on what level we're talking about. Strategically, yes, everything, all the, effect, all, the, all the effects are strategically linked in a way that you could easily talk about one theater in which sometimes geopolitical proximity is more important and overrides geographical proximity. In terms of operational planning from a military perspective, then I am more partial to the notion of two theaters where you differ enough for structure, force requirements, and planning requirements. So, but those two theaters are interconnected, and of course, the assets that you may utilize in one may not be used in the other. So there are, there are trades off, as you say. I'm simplifying because I really hate speaking for too long in panels. It's one of my pet peeves. So it depends on the level, but I, 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 th I think that th that is how I see it in terms of, uh, in terms of the discussion. Discussion, and that's why, from a NATO perspective, I see we have one main operational theater, that, that is the Euro-Atlantic, and then there's an adjacent theater, which is the broader Mediterranean, the Southern Theater, and every big crisis or contingency in our Southern neighborhood impacts directly on our security. And then there's strategically proximate, geographically distant Indo-Pacific theater, uh, and the effects of crisis and instability in that context will also impinge upon our ability to fulfill our critical mission, which remains the defense of the Euro-Atlantic area and of allies. That's my two cents to this debate, which brings me to what do we tell uh, Indo-Pacific countries who are not NATO partners with respect to what NATO is doing in the region? And we have some of these conversations, we have some of this discussion. Just a few weeks ago, I was at Rezina with other colleagues to have this, uh, this exchange of views with India. India, which is, of course, a key actor in the region uh, and very much following all the strategic developments um, and playing a pivotal role, I would say. Well, we, we and having a complicated relationship with China. Correct. I will, let, let's, well, or let's let, let, let the, the India participant in the panel that you will invite in the next edition tell you about their foreign policy orientation, but I would tend to, but I would, I would say that's an indisputable fact as of April 2024. So we talk about debate, we, we talk about NATO as defensive alliance right now, focus on the most extensive and transformative reset of our deterrence and defense posture in generation to respond to what is essentially the most complex security environment we've seen since the end of the Second World War, or the Cold War, pick your, uh, pick your um, 
watershed moment and talk about how we are bec we are doing our homework at home to ensure the territorial defense of Europe in risk with, with, uh, in the context of the assertive, aggressive Russia as our main threat, the continuing and enduring threat of terrorism. So we, we explain what we're doing in our theater and we also uh, point out that what happens in the Indo-Pacific can have and has a direct impact on our security. And we talk about all those issues that are really not, um, as Ambassador Dalder mentioned, are not contingent or bound by geographical borders, uh, cyber threats, uh, economic coercion, terrorism, climate change and security, and all those issues where really it's important to have security cooperation beyond the, the immediate uh, Euro-Atlantic area. So we have those discussions. Some are more open to that, that to, to, to those discussions with us. Others have some doubts, and that's absolutely legitimate. Uh, but the conversation continues, and I think looking into the future, we have no option but being globally minded as an alliance in terms of the approach we, we adopt. And that is a very short 30 seconds on uh, the African continent, which is incredibly large and this, and it heterogeneous, so it's very difficult to talk in one word what does need to do for uh, for Africa, but I can, so I will just pick a little uh, part of the con of this uh, of this continent and talk about the partnership we have with North Africa and the Sahel region, which is of course our most adjacent neighborhood to the alliance, and there the focus is really building security cooperation with partners on issues ranging from uh, security implications of climate change, countering terrorism, uh, supporting the reforms in armed forces. So uh, it's, it's really through the lens of security assistance, training, and cooperation based on the understanding that any security development in that region directly affects your Atlantic security. It is one, that's, that's the Mediterranean is one theater uh, that I can use the one theater. So that, that's the work we do with North Africa and the Sahel region. And if there was more time, I would go a little bit more into our cooperation with the African Union, but I'll leave it at that for now. Sure, thanks a lot. Please go ahead. So I, I, on, the, on the larger meta question, I think we're all saying the same thing. We're just saying it in a different ways as Bernadetta. But I, it's important to understand that while you have institutions that are focused on particular areas of the globe, the fact that they're really good at doing that doesn't mean they're necessarily great at doing something else. So what I resist is this idea, which none of us have actually argued for, but this, there was times when, the, when we are. I resist this idea that NATO needs to have a role in, NATO as an institution needs to have a role in the Indo-Pacific. Doesn't mean it shouldn't have an interest in what happens there and understand it. Uh, but as an institution, it has a role in a particular geographical li limitation and it should focus on that uh, while being aware uh, of what's happening in, in, in other parts of, of the world. And, and, and it sort of gets to the, to the two questions. One reason you don't want to have NATO in that role is because there are a lot of people who live in that region who don't know, care, or actually potentially fear NATO as an institution. And so why, why make the relationship that is central between certain European and, and, and North American countries with certain Indo-Pacific countries institutionalized in a structure that many of their neighbors don't see regard as, as beneficial to them. And that's certainly true for most countries in ASEAN, uh, uh, as was mentioned. And the same is true for, for, for Africa. I don't think NATO should have a role in Africa other than cooperative, uh, helping on training, and all the kinds of things we're doing in the Mediterranean dialogue, helping on, on thinking through how do you democratize uh, and maintain civilian control of your militaries. And that is an expertise that NATO has qua NATO, an institutional way to do it. But this, the, the idea that, quote, there's an African theater and, and NATO now needs to start thinking about that, no. We'll need to think about that in a, in a larger context uh, as, as it evolves uh, in, 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 that, in that way. What I am arguing is that we can no longer afford to bifurcate, trifurcate, are thinking about the role that particularly the United States has in the world in, geo in geographically isolated ways. Yes. Because, just to give a pretty uh, 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 obvious example, if you have a bunch of people who only think about the Indo-Pacific, thinking through how they can get 
Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States to cooperate on certain issues like, say, nuclear submarine technology, they may not think about what the diplomatic impact is on your other friends if they are not part of that conversation. And the blindness is not by not having people who think about the, this in the North Atlantic context. The blindness is the idea that you can do something in one set of issues and have no impact on another set of issues. Because we are, we are organized, think through, and have been, uh, as Americans in particular, like we can have two foreign policies at the same time. One for the Pacific and one for the Atlantic. As if the twins shall never meet. Well, thank you. Uh, I don't think the French thought they never met uh, when, when AUKUS was announced. Doesn't mean an AUKUS isn't a great idea. I think it's fantastic. But how you think about that in a different way means that you need to start developing. The folks who do the Indo-Pacific need to start getting genes that are you know, from the Atlantic family and vice versa. And that's talking from somebody who spent 64 years in the Atlantic theater. We can't afford to just be in that way. We need to think more broadly. Doesn't mean you don't have institutions that are specific for those because they're more, they're, they're more focused on that. But how you think as, an, as, a, as a government, as a policymaker, has to be more integrated uh, than, we are, than we have been used to because that's the, world, the way the world has evolved and it's the way that most of our institutions will have to take care of. Thanks a lot. I think that was a great way to end this panel. And I'm quite struck by, by what you said, Ambassador, which is that actually no one is arguing for NATO to be in the Indo-Pacific, but to think also about what the countries of the region want and what they're saying a lot. And we didn't get to this as much as I thought we would. What they're saying is don't make us choose. And so this is also something that, that we will have to reckon, I think, as Europeans and Americans, because we'll have to continue working with them and think about our alliances, but also understand that for most of the countries of the region, China remains their main trade partner. And they're not going to give up on that. And by the way, China is the main trade partner for a number of European countries too. <laughs> and we're not going to give up on that anytime soon. So I think we're working at multiple layers. I, I mean, I was struck by what you said about working with the G7 and NATO and the EU. Actually, none of these are mutually exclusive. I think the whole point for us, yeah. particularly if we want to work in a system, a rules-based international order, or at least an international order that functions, is that we'll have to work within multiple layers, stay true to our, our sense of purpose, but understand that we'll have to talk to a variety of actors, a lot more actors, I think, that, mm. than we were used to. And that's how, I guess, we'll stay relevant also. Thank you so much. I think 3.15 um, on the spot. I. I think we, we're going to be moving to the next panel, I guess, and the eclipse is setting soon, so <laughs> <laughs> we move to that. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. We're delighted you could join us today to share your insights on NATO's role in the Indo-Pacific. Um, for those in the room, we ask that you kindly please remain in your seats for a moment as our speakers make their way off stage. Um, we will now take a short break, just in time for the eclipse. Um, it is set to, I think, reach its peak at 3.20. So um, our online programming will resume promptly at 3.30 p.m. with a keynote address from the Supreme Allied Commander of Europe, General Christopher Cavoli. For those attending in person with us today, please return to your seats by 3.25 for our final keynote of the day. Thank you.
Welcome back, everyone. Please take your seats quickly. Thank you. Our last keynote of the day will begin momentarily. Please take your seats and silence your cell phones in preparation. For the question and answer portion of this afternoon's keynote and discussion, our moderator will present a handful of questions submitted from our audience via the QR code to General Cavoli. Dr. Daniel Byman, the director of the Center for Security Studies and Security Studies Program, will introduce General Cavoli shortly. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dan Byman. I'm the director of the Center for Security Studies here at Georgetown, and I'm delighted to be the one to introduce General Christopher Cavoli. Uh, he is, of course, the Supreme Allied Commander in Europe. I think we could spend, really, the rest of the next hour discussing his illustrious military career. Uh, let me single out, though, three aspects of his current job that I think make him almost miraculously the perfect person for this moment of crisis. Uh, he is an area expert on Europe, speaking multiple languages, including Russian. That is remarkable for any individual, but particularly remarkable for the Supreme Allied Commander at this moment of crisis. Uh, he is a great communicator. and when the commander has to be the public face, as well as the person who is directing things behind the scene, that skill is invaluable. Um, and last, I would say he's a great diplomat. And at a time when the military role and the diplomatic role go hand in hand, having someone with that skill set is incredible. I really can't think of the, uh, having someone better equipped to deal with some of the most pressing challenges of the alliance today. Uh, General Cavoli is going to begin by presenting formal remarks. After that, Professor Sarah Muller of the Security Studies Program will engage in a fireside chat uh, with the general, and that will be followed by audience Q&A. 
Um, so I am delighted to have uh, General Cavoli here at Georgetown, and please join me in welcoming. Thank you. I need those little glasses. <laughs> what was everybody doing out there? Uh, my Intel guys never predict anything for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, um, what a pleasure it is to be here today. And really an honor as we commemorate the 75th anniversary of NATO with you. Um, but we're not just marking a milestone, we're celebrating really a legacy. So NATO was born out of the ashes of the Second World War, and it has stood as a testament to what nations can achieve when they write, when they unite under a banner of shared values. So for seven and a half decades, NATO has epitomized the collective spirit of its member nations, navigating the twists and turns of history through consensus and emerging stronger with each challenge. That's an amazing feat. In the late 1940s, the aftermath of World War II presented us with a landscape of unprecedented destruction. Europe was fragmented, its economies were shattered, and nations were grappling with the monumental task of reconstruction. And amidst all this, the specter of Soviet expansionism arose and loomed large. So as we stood in the shadow of a war that had engulfed the globe, we were acutely aware of the fragility of that hard-won peace. The lesson of the World War was clear. No nation could stand alone to defend freedom and democracy. And so it was that, in the hope for a better tomorrow, NATO was conceived. The North Atlantic Treaty, the Washington Treaty, bound 12 nations together in a pact of collective defense. The simple proposition that an attack on one would be considered an attack on all. And this has, over the decades, proven to be the cornerstone of Europe's security and, indeed, the peace and stability of the globe. But it was not just a military alliance that we formed here. It was a promise. It was a promise of mutual assistance and a shared commitment to safeguard the liberty and the security of each member nation. In the years that followed, NATO stood against the forces of aggression and tyranny, through the Cold War, when the Iron Curtain cast its long shadow over Europe, the alliance was a symbol for those living under oppression. It provided a framework for the defense of the West, ensuring the security of Europe and forging a transatlantic bond that has become one of the most enduring features of the post-war international order. Throughout the Cold War, NATO's principal aim was unyielding, to deter Soviet aggression. The resolve of the alliance was tested many times in various crises. The Berlin Crisis of 1961, Budapest 1956, the invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968. The unity of the alliance was tested as well. The Suez Crisis of 1956, during my own childhood, the question of Pershing II missiles during the 1980s. But despite all of those challenges to our unity, and those challenges which sometimes appeared to threaten the very integrity of the alliance, our political and military leaders could draw upon our common values to ensure our security. It turns out we have so much more in common across the alliance than we don't. So the foundational doctrines of deterrence and defense remained the twin pillars of transatlantic security, supporting NATO through decades of geopolitical tension. And then, suddenly, <laughs> The world changed. The Soviet Union broke up, the wall fell, and a world bright with new possibilities emerged. It was not a world without problems, however, and NATO did adapt. The alliance formed a partnership with Russia. We imagine this partnership as the inheritor we, we, with Russia, and Russia, of course, imagined itself as the inheritor of the entire Soviet role in the world, it turned out. We established a special consul for consultation. We conducted exercises together. We saw each other not as competitors, but rather as nations and possibly as friends. And a personal note, it was right during this period that I, um, as a mid-grade officer, became a Russian specialist myself. I thought I was entering a very exciting 
new time when there were possibilities that were opening that we could exploit for the benefit of not just the two countries, but all mankind. The bloom did not stay long in the rose, however. Difficulties in our relationship emerged as events of the world, not just events about Russia, events of the world brought themselves to the attention of NATO. In the Balkans, tensions exploded in th into the peaceful post-Cold War. NATO responded by ensuring the collective security of its neighborhood. We established peace enforcement and then peacekeeping missions that have preserved stability right up to this very day. And as you know, NATO remains with K4 in Kosovo. Afterwards, the conflicts in Kosovo, Libya, Iraq, Afghanistan pulled our forces to so-called out-of-area operations. Our focus on collective defense faded, and we instead conducted out-of-area operations to manage crises and to keep the peace. Nations, remembering the alternative to NATO, rushed, rushed to join. NATO did not expand, per se, during this period. We merely opened a door on which nations were knocking. In a series of waves, 99, all the way up to 2017, 14 nations asked to join NATO and were admitted to this club of peace. And so the circle of free democratic nations, which were largely at peace, was growing, and it was ready to solve other problems in the world. But the world changed again. 2008 saw Russia's invasion of Georgia. And then, in 2014, the invasion of the Donbass and annexation of Crimea. NATO again faced threats that challenged the very fabric of our shared security. But really, it was in 2022 that Russia's brutal, illegal, unprovoked second invasion of Ukraine fundamentally altered the strategic landscape for us. It compelled us to reevaluate our strategic direction as an alliance. So at Madrid in July of 22, NATO nations reoriented the alliance on the core task of collective defense and instructed Sakir, me soon, to revitalize an ability, our ability, to accomplish that task. This revitalization took shape through the adoption of the deterrence and defense of the Euro-Atlantic area. DDA, we call it. It's our strategic approach. It's a significant realignment of NATO's post-Cold War focus. DDA demands that we posture NATO forces and activities to deny our adversaries, which we list as Russia and terror groups, any advantage, to deny them any advantage they might seek in geography, or an advantage in readiness, or an advantage in domain. It sounds simple, almost obvious, but implementation of DDA has led to fundamental changes in NATO's deterrence and defense posture, to the activities we perform, and to the way that we are organized to do all of this. The first step has been to create a family of plans to deter and defend. These plans were written in record time and approved last year at Vilnius. They describe how, where, and with what the Alliance will defend its territory, our territory, and how it will deter those who would threaten it. This is key. The last time we had standing defense plans was in 1989. So for the first time in three decades, the Alliance is armed with a set of plans, and these are, again, for the first time in decades, our comprehensive blueprint to describe the force structure we need, the command and control arrangements we need, the exercises we should perform, and all of our activities and investments. It is a wholesale modernization of our collective defense system. It is necessary, and it's hard, but we are doing it. Despite the challenge, the Alliance has exhibited an unprecedented cohesion, focus, and determination during this transformation to conduct large-scale, theater-wide deterrence and defense operations. It's a strong statement about NATO unity that in the three regional plans, which cover a large percentage of the globe and over one billion people's homes, there were no military or operational disagreements among the 31 allies who were then destined to approve those plans. No disagreements at that level whatsoever. That unity of purpose, that unity, is what gives us strength. And it's that strength that makes others want to join. 
And so in the face of the challenges to the alliance, we have actually grown. Finland and then Sweden have joined the alliance since the invasion of Ukraine, the second invasion of Ukraine. They ended traditions, multi-hundred year traditions in the case of Sweden of non-alignment. And they chose to stand with those who share the values they've always had. Their integration into, natural, into NATO is a natural progression. It enhances the operational readiness and interoperability of our forces. Their accession, accession strengthens NATO's eastern flank, and it sends a strong message of unity and resolve in the face of Russian aggression. As we stand here on the threshold of this new era, the lessons of the past and the challenges of the present guide our path towards securing a peaceful and stable future for all member states. As we mark the 75th anniversary of NATO's founding, I'm reminded of the words of wisdom that graced the crest of Allied Command operations and have guided us through our sometimes turbulent past. That motto is, the price of liberty is eternal vigilance. As the Alliance faces our new tests head on, we are vigilant. We are united in our resolve to defend our common values, and we affirm our commitment to the principles that led to NATO's very birth. The road ahead will undoubtedly be marked by challenges, but as we have shown in the past, there is no obstacle too great, no challenge too daunting for an alliance built on a foundation of mutual respect, shared values, and an unwavering commitment to collective defense. So it's in the spirit of those who came before us that we continue to forge a future of peace and prosperity, secure in the knowledge that together we are stronger. As we chart that course for the next 75 years, our past will be our guide. It will guide us through uncertainty. In the enduring words of the first Supreme Allied Commander, Dwight D. Eisenhower, history does not long entrust the care of freedom to the weak or the timid. Now 32 strong, we are neither weak nor timid, but rather we are bold and resolute. For in unity lies the promise of peace, the assurance of security, and the hope for a brighter future for all of our nations and all humankind. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, Thank you. Um, for those extremely thoughtful remarks. I think we've all just seen why, in addition to many other titles within the Alliance, you're known informally as the great communicator. Oof. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to start with a theme that has emerged throughout the course of our day-long discussions, which is how to strike a balance between continuity and change occurring within the Alliance. And you mentioned in your remarks just a moment ago that the military alliance is currently undergoing a major transformation. Uh, this transformational journey began a few years ago, uh, but it's really picked up speed in the last two, three years with a focus on updating guidance and ensuring the right tools are in place. This year, of course, we're now transitioning into the next phase with a focus on implementation and executability. And as part of that transition, NATO headquarters, in addition to national staffs, are currently having to relearn how to do a lot of things that, frankly, they haven't done in, in many years, um, such as how to sustain the demands of high-intensity warfare in a European theater. And this wartime transformation, uh, which as your colleague Admiral Bauer, the chairman of the military committee earlier this year called it, this wartime transformation marks a departure from the peacetime and crisis time mindset of the organization. So first, can you provide an update on how the Alliance's ongoing transformation, the plans, the authorities, the C2 is progressing? And second, could you help us understand from a holistic perspective how the Alliance's return to this pre-war foot footing better positions it to respond effectively to emerging threats and challenges? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, it's important that we talk about this for a minute because these are really profound changes. So when we focused on out-of-area operations, crisis management, um, uh, we optimized for the characteristics of those sorts of operations. Um, and I think you could um, fairly say, um, without making too big of a blanket statement, that such operations were typically small in scale. They involve small units of action, say in the land domain, brigade size organizations. Um, they happened far away at a time and a place of our choosing. We chose to intervene. 
And so as a result of that, we could um, adopt a cyclical process of force generation, right? You, uh, one unit's getting ready to go, the other unit's employed in the theater, another unit's standing down. And that cycle gave us predictability, regularity. It also gave us the an unbelievable opportunity to economize every place in that cycle and outside that cycle, except for that one unit that's deployed. Um, and so we all merrily did that. I mean, that, that was one of the big things that enabled the nations in the alliance to take a peace dividend, our nation included. And um, we deconstructed um, and set aside many of the processes and many of the formations that are necessary for large-scale warfare, things above the brigade level, staying with the land domain, for example, in the air domain, things that were necessary to um, wage large-scale air campaigns. We didn't need that anymore, and so we put that aside, some of it atrophied. Um, we also adopted our readiness models. You only had to be ready when you were deployed. The rest of the force did not have to be ready completely inappropriate for collective defense. Now, we have to be focused on specific areas that we are always ready to defend, which is the basis of our deterrence. And so um, we need standing forces with directed levels of readiness maintained on a continuous basis. Whereas during out of area operations, a headquarters, could be used to do anything. You could say, well, we're gonna send you to Afghanistan next. Now, headquarters are focused on particular pieces of geography. They have to become the masters of the war in that area. Um, so their focus changes. Above all, what we get out of this is a requirement for forces above the small unit level. We need the enablers at division levels. We need division headquarters. We need um, air, air, uh, air operations centers. We need all of these things, these structures necessary for large-scale warfare. And we need the habits and the practices to go along with it. So the change is absolutely profound. And it's not without pain, and it's not without friction. Um, uh, all of our own militaries go through it. Each, each one of the militaries in the alliance is having to go through it individually as a national force. And now we're going through it collectively as, a, as, a, um, as an alliance force. Um, but the changes are very profound. What is gratifying is how quickly the forces of the alliance are adapting to it. Um, you know, we had a new force model instead of the cyclical force model. We've adopted, a, you could call it a pyramidal force model um, with tier one, tier two, tier three forces. In the first series of force sourcing conferences against the new regional plans, it made a 700% jump in the amount of force that nations pledged to make available to SACIR in the event of the activation of the plans. So it's a dramatic change. Um, there's a lot of work left to be done, as I'm sure you can imagine, but uh, well, I believe we're all committed to, to making it happen. Fantastic, thank you. Yes, the t changes are indeed profound, and as I tell my students on a almost weekly basis, it's certainly a very exciting time for the Alliance. Uh, I want to turn to this question of geography that you mentioned, and uh, uh, I also want to stay on this theme of old versus new for a moment longer. Uh, the current strategic environment shares some parallels with earlier periods for the Alliance's history, uh, but there are also some significant differences. So during the Cold War, NATO addressed allies' uneven threat exp uh, exposure by stationing large multinational formations on the front lines so that all the nations of the Alliance had skin in the game, so to speak. But the geography of the frontline states today is very different, as is the composition of the allied nation's military forces, as you touched upon. Uh, so in some sense, every state is now a frontline state because of the proliferation of hybrid activities by right. ad adversaries. So my question is, how do you balance this 360 degree approach, the diverse threats that each region faces, and the requirement to have three joint force commands that are not only fit for purpose, but also equally capable? Uh, and is there a risk that the ongoing reforms to the Alliance's military structures could lead to each region becoming more inward looking, uh, thereby potentially diluting each member's stake in the defense of other regions? Well, that's a simple question. Let me uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'd like to meet the, the person who wrote that one for you. Sorry, that was me. <laughs> that was you. <laughs> um, I, I think there are three big things I'd like to, I'd like to pull, pull out. Please. Because uh, you put your finger on really important things, right? Um, 
the first is this question of 360 de degree approach. It sounds like a, like a slogan, mm -hmm. um, but it's really not. You, you know, when, when you look at the alliance, the alliance has to respect the threat pictures of each of its members individually as well as collectively. And, um, you know, if you're in the southern tier of the alliance, if you're, say, Spain, you're very worried about threats emanating from Africa as well as the general threat of Russia and terrorism. Um, so, so first of all, geographically, it's necessary. It's also very necessary when you're talking about our two named adversaries to remember that there is no rear area in a sense. Um, Russian cruise missiles can come from west to east just as easily as from east to west, which suddenly mm -hmm. reverses our idea of front and rear. Um, terrorism, of course, you know, uh, uh, comes from everywhere and nowhere at the same time. The second thing is, you know, when, when you consider all domains, um, some domains are not geographical at all. And that means the threat is, is, is omnipresent and, and we have to be able to, to, to deal with it in that sense. So this question of 360 degree threat, I think is a very important principle for us to, to, to maintain. We are not a one problem alliance. Um, that would be nice, but that's not us. Um, that, that, that's the first thing I'd say. I'd say the, the second thing is this question of inward looking regional plans. Um, there has to be one theater manager above all of that to balance our efforts among the three and to put the focus where it needs to be at any given time and in fact to choose where the focus in the initiative should be. Uh -huh. That's our job at the Supreme Headquarters. So SHAPE has been undergoing a transformation for about the last year and a half in which we're turning it back into a strategic war fighting headquarters. We shouldn't be confused here. I, I'm not trying to say we're turning it into a battalion headquarters or a squadron headquarters, but we are returning SHAPE's focus back to allied command operations and to focusing on how you run a theater of war and in peacetime, how you run a theater of deterrence across multiple areas simultaneously. So, so uh, those are a couple of very important features of, of what we're up to. Great, thank you. And uh, I should probably have s stated that uh, that question was partly informed by my uh, visit to JFC Norfolk about 10 days ago. So uh, I know there are exciting things excellent, happening down there as well. Yes. Um, we've been discussing uh, throughout the day, and you have touched on as well, uh, this emphasis on relearning operational best practices from the Cold War. Uh, but I'd like to ask you about the strategic level, which is something that's come up on several of the panels today. Are there insights we can glean or pitfalls we should avoid in that regard, particularly in light of Russia's new nuclear saber rattling and the fact that we, quite frankly, have a leadership in Moscow right now that's prone to conspiracy theories? So some analysts in Washington at the moment uh, worry that we lack the finely calibrated tools of escalation management that we had during the Cold War, while others argue there's no such thing Thing as escalation control and warn that we're headed for a very dangerous future if we think we can manage escalation in a crisis between nuclear powers. So how do we strike a balance between being prepared and ready, yep. communicating that message with the risk of unintended, unintended escalation? And in other words, how do we deter our adversaries without setting off a spiral of escalation? Right. Um, um, so I, I think the, the big background fact here is that we used to have a very, very fine and mutually understood vocabulary for signaling each other between the West and the Soviet Union, between NATO and the Soviet Union. Um, we could read each other's signals. We knew how to send signals to each other. We knew how to communicate verbally and non-verbally about our intentions in a way that gave predictability to the other side and gave comprehension to the other side. And this was one of the principal things that we used to manage escalation and to achieve deterrence without, without significant risk. We also had a number of structures and uh, we had the infrastructure, as it were, physical and non-physical, um, to, to, to communicate these to each other. We had treaties, we had organizations, supranational organizations that we used um, to do all that. After the Cold War, we had on-site inspections and things like that. Almost all of that's gone now. Um, so we fell out of the habit of practicing with this vocabulary, um, as it were, of signaling. 
we fell out of the habit of using the mechanisms to signal. And we've, at this point, um, uh, walked away from many of the, we collectively have walked away from many of the, um, the arrangements and the fora and the treaties that, that previously gave us the ability to do this. So um, I think the big background fact is that we used to be really good at this. And um, we, as a globe, fell out of practice. Um, we have been resurrecting that practice. And we have been working that very hard. I think there's a much finer understanding of deterrence management and escalation management, two very different things, um, although related, different. Um, I think there's a much finer understanding of how to move those mechanisms now and how to move that than we did. We have been um, reestablishing these practices a as we go along. Uh, I think it's important to note that um, the world that we're doing this in is, uh, is complicated in a couple of ways that it wasn't during the Cold War. First of all, we're trying to reestablish it during a hot war that's being waged by one of the parties in this deterrence question. The second is there are no longer just two principal parties to the deterrence question, right? Um, um, there's China in the background, and how all this is going to interact on a three-way basis will be a very, very important, important question. Um, I think that I think that our, our ability to manage um, to sustain deterrence and manage escalation is gonna be a key to the way we're, we go forward. Um, it's pretty clear, to me anyway, although I'm sure it's the subject of much debate, that the uh, strategic stability paradox continues to exist. Mm -hmm. um, the strategic nuclear stalemate, deterrence that's established at, at the upper level does give rise to opportunities for great instability below it. And we have to reconnect those and, 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 and reestablish the ways of managing those together. Um, how do we go ahead doing all of this and reestablishing our collective defense capability without being threatening and accidentally having an effect we don't want? Um, well, I think the first step is to uh, describe ourselves openly as what we are, a defensive alliance. I probably use the word defense, defend, defensive about 10 times during a short speech. Uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, we, we have to communicate to others, as well as to ourselves, that we are in this for defense and the deterrent value that that gives us uh, is short of defense. So I think that's the first step. And then our actions have to back that up. Fantastic, yes, and uh, cross domain or integrated deterrence is something I know that uh, the Alliance is also thinking a lot about. And uh, we heard this morning and over the course of the day about the need to dust off some of those old theories of deterrence and uh, get some of that nuclear IQ back. So it's uh, um, a, a very important. Um, but, but like everything else, I think, I, think, I think we have to dust them off, but we have to shine new light on yes. them also, yes. right? right? Uh, okay. It's very easy to talk about return to the past, uh, back to the future, and things like that. But the, the situations the are different. different Some different. of the mechanisms are going to look very familiar. Some of the things that we do will reestablish some things. Uh, but the context is so different, and, and we should be careful about that as well. Excellent point. Thank you. Um, I want to turn to the war in Ukraine next. Uh, there's an important distinction, uh, one which I think is often lost on the wider public between the role NATO allies as sovereign nations have played in supporting the government and people of Ukraine in their courageous efforts to repel Russian forces, either bilaterally or through the US-led Ramstein group, the defense contact group, and the actions that NATO as a political military alliance has taken, which have focused on non-lethal aid or the recent announcement of the JTEC in Bidgosh, the, um, the Joint um, Training and Evaluation Center um, that will be stood up there. Um, but we did see at last week's foreign ministerial meeting that Secretary General Stolberg Stoltenberg announced that there's now agreement among the allies to proceed with, quote, planning for a greater NATO role, end quote, in the coordination of security assistance and training for Ukraine. Um, and uh, he mentioned in his remarks that you've received an initiating directive for the NAC tasking you to propose a framework to come up with a plan for some kind of NATO framework or machinery to coordinate, institutionalize the Allies' security assistance to Ukraine. So recognizing that this is very much early days, um, I wonder if you could share some of the considerations that may guide that study as it moves ahead. Sure, there's no danger in me talking about things that are in the early stages. <laughs> 
uh, uh, so I'll jump in. Um, yeah, so I, th I think starting with the underlying principles is probably probably the most important thing. Um, so the nations of NATO do not believe we are in a war with the Russian Federation, and we don't want to be in one. Right. It's a defensive the alliance. The purpose of our alliance is to deter such a war. Right. Um, and this accounts for the fact that almost all NATO nations have been supporting Ukraine on a bilateral basis, mm -hmm. um, but on a alliance-wide basis, we have not chosen to be put into a position or to put ourselves into a position where we might be viewed as party to the conflict. Um, this hasn't stopped us from doing some of our longer term things, many of which were in place already, the comprehensive action plan, interoperability roadmap, mm -hmm. and all of the other things that are being, uh, that are being done by, by NATO, especially NATO headquarters with, uh, with, uh, with Ukraine. So that's sort of the underlying principle for how to, how to approach this. Um, nevertheless, um, there is an important desire among nations um, to bring Ukraine closer to the alliance. Um, we described that at Vilnius. Um, uh, and to recognize the fact that we ultimately want Ukraine to be part of the security structure that we believe will benefit Europe and the globe. Um, and so a tighter relationship in some ways is something that the nations have decided to explore. More specifically, they have tasked me as SACIR to develop a plan for consideration on how to do that. Um, and I'm in the process of doing that right now with my staff. And then it will be presented to nations for them to examine and to see whether or not it meets their polit political direction and guidance. That will happen, not, it won't take very long to do that. Um, and then nations will have the opportunity to, uh, to say we'd like to do this or we wouldn't like to do this or how about if we take out that um, and, and we'll proceed from there. So that's kind of exactly where it sits right now. And uh, with the timing being the July summit, I imagine. Well, I think people would like that to be, to, to, to be um, uh, you know, everything heads toward the July summit, right? I mean, everybody would like everything to be there, but sometimes things don't fit. I think the important thing is, and I think all heads of state and government would agree, this will be an important decision, so we have to take it properly. We have to take our time with it and make sure that we decide deliberately, that we have thorough analysis and understanding of what we're trying to do and, and how it will work. So I think, I think uh, getting a quality decision will be more important okay. to nations than, uh, than, than getting a fast decision. Absolutely, thank you so much. I'd like to turn to some uh, student questions that were submitted over the course of the day. Uh, the first student is, uh, the stu first student question is from Jan Gerber, who is uh, one of our students from the Security Studies Program, who's actually graduating in a month's time, um, and he's from Poland. Um, and you've touched on this a little bit, but um, I will ask you uh, if you can elaborate. Uh, he asks, could you give us an update on the force sourcing process for the 300,000 high readiness troops and the, the new force model? that NATO announced at Madrid. Have allies been able to agree on national commitments, including personnel, equipment, and enablers? So how is the force generation planning process going? Yeah, so there are two parts to the force sourcing. And um, the first one's pretty easy. Um, so we developed this new force model, tier one, tier two, tier three, readiness levels in different, different amounts of time that those forces need to be ready. And then um, we queried nations, and nations immediately said, I'll put this many into this tier, this many into this tier, this many into this tier. And um, that was the first step. And that's where the 300,000 number comes from, the 700% number, all of which are accurate, but, um, but that's only the first step. The second step was to take in detail the force structure requirements of the plans and to ask nations to assign organizations against those requirements. Um, so country X says, I'll offer you a fighter squadron for that and a destroyer for that. Um, we rapidly discovered that our existing method of force sourcing um, was suited to our previous method of operation where we were trying to cyclically generate small units for a discrete period of time. And uh, uh, DSAC here, Admiral Keith Blount, um, 
he has been placed by me in charge of this process, and he had a great insight. He said, that, so the system isn't working properly, but we're not asking the question correctly. The real question is not, hey, what will you give me for this operation? The real question is, if we were really in a large-scale war what have you got? with one of our named adversaries, what exactly is it that you couldn't give me that you would have to reserve for a national mission, the United States guarding our airspace, for example? What would you have to hold back? Because we can presume everything else will be made available. And when nations looked at it that way, the number of organizations that they said, oh, yeah, I would make all of this available to you, skyrocketed. So it went very well in that sense, and in many aspects of the uh, force sourcing, we're where we need to be. Um, in some notable ones, we are not, especially high-end enablers, um, uh, uh, long-range surface-to-air missile systems, um, uh, logistic enablers, all the things that nobody, nobody wants to build when, when they're not absolutely necessary. Um, but we've um, got a process called a NATO defense planning process, mm -hmm which is a cyclical process to examine what we want and to assign capabilities targets out to nations to build. This year, well, last year, Political Guidance 23, which is the document that drives this NDPP cycle, included for the first time in years the requirements of the plans as the principal input instead of just capabilities we desire in the future. So now the NDPP the um, uh, uh, building process is based on, in the near to midterm, the requirements of our plans. So we're in the process of going through that now and assigning out to nations, negotiating with nations, which parts of the empty boxes in the force structure they want to build. Great, yes, and I know as, as part of the NDPP process, there's also capability reviews that are done every couple of years. That's right, that's right. Some countries have, de uh, have made those available and others haven't. Um, and, and th this is important because Philippe Lavigne, Supreme Allied Commander for Transformation, and I work on this very closely together, and with some people I see Angus Lapsley sitting in the front row here, um, ASG Lapsley. So we, we work this process, and there's a tension, right? Mm -hmm. um, I'm the Allied Commander for Operations. I, I, I'm responsible if something happened tonight to make a plan work. So I need things now. I need, uh, my plans are really based on existing capabilities and existing stuff. But you know, 20 years from now, I don't want my kids fighting the same way I'm required to fight by, by reality. I want them to fight in a new way, right? In, in a way that's cleverer, that's got better equipment and things like that. So we also want to modernize. We have a vision for the future. Philippe is in charge of that. And he develops that and brings it to nations and heads of state and government approve his concepts. And so inside this defense planning process across the multi-year time horizon for building forces. What we've done this time is the early years are devoted to near-term readiness requirements, i.e. the stuff I put in there, and the mid-term and out years are Philippe's to fill with the capabilities we want someday, although we do talk about it so, so, that, so that there will be an evolution as we go forward. Great, thank you. I want to uh, turn to our next student question, which comes from Ashley Kelso, who is also a student in the Security Studies program, class of 2025, and it touches on this question or theme of vision to the future that you just touched on. How does climate change impact NATO's strategic priorities and influence defense planning? And here I should probably note that uh, I teach a class in international security, and for the first time in uh, my decade-long journey of teaching that class, all of my students, all 18, rank climate change as the number one international security challenge. Um, okay. Uh, so <laughs> I was... Then they should get on it immediately. <laughs> um, so how does climate change impact NATO's strategic priorities and influence defense planning? Two, two principal ways, um, al although they are not immediate, right? So uh, it would be an interesting conversation with your... With your uh, uh, students. with your students, um, I think someday they, they, they could be correct, um, but today those pressures are not necessarily acute in the military sphere. But this is where it's going and where, where it could become hugely problematic. 
Um, the first one is the retreat of the polar ice cap. Um, this is opening up the Northern Passage for the Russians, giving them new um, water space um, in which they can maneuver and is also giving uh, China a new approach to Europe. Um, and given the increasing interrelationship between the goals, the strategies of China and Russia, that could become highly problematic to us in the future. Um, and it would be problematic for the alliance as an alliance. There, um, there are eight nations in the Arctic Council. Seven of them are members of NATO, and the other one is the Russian Federation. Um, so clearly, there's something about the retreating polar ice cap that will be very important to us. It will also change technically some of the way we do things um, um, in the high, high north, like uh, sub hunting and things like that. Um, hunting for subs will, will, will change with the extent of the polar ice cap as well. The second big way is if you drop to the southern edge of the alliances area, um, the increasing desertification of uh, the Sahel and um, the competition for water resources specifically, um, growing food insecurity in Africa. When you put that together with the unbelievable youth bulge in Africa, we, we have a very big challenge coming um, over the next 30 years um, for Europe. Um, the problems uh, that populations experience in Africa are going to promote uh, larger scale migration. And, um, you know, that's already sort of a neuralgic uh, issue in, in, um, in Europe. I, I, I think we can well expect um, the challenges to security in Africa to become closer and closer linked to those inside, inside Europe. As I said earlier, our southern allies feel that acutely already. Um, as we go forward, I think climate change could very well make that more widely felt across the alliance. Um, and, um, and, and if it bothers Europe, it bothers NATO. Um, there are a million other ways climate change could be involved um, and, and could, could uh, 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 pose challenges, but I think those are two very direct ones that we can see in the, in the midterm future at the latest. And of course, the alliance will be discussing the southern flank strategy at the upcoming July Washington right, summit right. as well. So that will come up there as well. Um, thank you. Uh, the next question I have is from uh, Ryan Usawadi, who is a SSP student class of 2024. Uh, he asks, considering the proliferation of political interference operations, is NATO the appropriate form for combating these types of hybrid warfare threats? We've talked a lot about political interference, disinformation, yeah. and how it relates to the uh, alliance today. This is a great question because, um, because the answer applies to so many other things in, in the alliance. Um, so everybody knows that um, the Washington Treaty, um, you know, the money chapter is Article 5, right? Um, Article 5, which is the mutual uh, defense, defense guarantee. But the right? preamble. <laughs> right. Um, but Article 3 mm -hmm. um, states that each member nation is responsible for its own security um, and for its own defense. And I always point out to people that 3 comes before 5, <laughs> um, which, is, which is important. So when we think about um, um, physical collective defense, um, you know, the regional plans and everything. The first step is for countries to have a national defense plan that is resourced and for us to find out how NATO can reinforce that and then subsume it if necessary, right? I think it's the same thing inside things like disinformation. The first step is a country has to harden itself against disinformation. You, you know, if we're talking about political meddling, um, it's not the place of the alliance in first place to go into country Y and say, we're gonna help you with, you, you know, this very subtle internal political disinformation campaign. That's really the nation's business. Mm -hmm. The alliance certainly has structures to help and does help, but it begins with the nation defending itself against those. Second, 
to accept help from NATO, ask for help from NATO structures, and go forward from there. And only after that should we contemplate something bigger. We do have a very active strategic communications program. We do have very active disinformation programs, but I'm just calling attention to the fact that the first step in combating this, you know, speaking as an American, our first step is to try to deal with it ourselves. And then after that, to, 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 to look abroad for help. Absolutely, and national resilience is something that the two newest members of the Alliance do quite well. So yeah. Perhaps there are lessons there from, uh, from them for others. There is a ton to learn from Sweden's total defense program. Right. Yeah. Right. Right. All right, I think we have time for one more student question. This comes from Eric Urabi, uh, SSP student class of 2024 as well. Uh, since 2022, many NATO allies have provided some of their most modern and previously unexploited weapons to Ukraine, Leopards, Bradley, Patriots, HIMARS. Russia has been able to uh, exploit or mitigate those weapons. How does the loss of the technical advantage of some of these weapons affect the future warfighting strategy of NATO? And what is being done to regain any lost advantages in weapons technology? We heard earlier today uh, from David Sanger, who has a new book coming out. Um, and of course, uh, General Milley also talked about this um, um, previously about this weird interplay that we have in Ukraine, where we have elements of World War I, elements of World War II, and also elements of future warfare. Sure. Um, the first thing I'd say is that um, things like this are a two-way street. Um, so Ukraine, uh, uh, Russia may be learning some things about our technical capabilities, perhaps, but I would imagine that we're probably learning some about theirs as well. Um, and so I think uh, it's fair to say that Militaries all over the world are studying this conflict pretty closely um, um, to see what works and, and what doesn't work. Um, so um, I, I think on balance, I'm not extremely worried about technical de the loss of technical superiority from this. Um, um, I, I would point out that um, it's our responsibility to keep a good, close eye on where technology ends up going and on um, where capacity ends up going too, just the systems themselves. And we do do that, you know, we do that um, as a nation, the United States does. Uh, I've got a part in it, but I don't have a, a, the whole um, problem in my hands. Um, I share that with a number of other agencies and everything. Um, but it, 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 it's a valid question. There's another question, though, um, and, and that's in terms of the transfer of capacity to Ukraine, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's been done as we could do it in some cases, especially early on. And so um, at some point, we're going to have to get in there with the Ukrainians and um, with our colleagues. We're going to have to roll up our sleeves and figure out how to homogenize the fleets, um, how to um, distribute the equipment um, carefully and um, evenly across their formations and uh, sort of regularize, r regularize things. Because only by then can you really establish the institutional logistics logistical systems and everything to sustain the readiness that clearly they're going to need to, uh, to deter Russia for some years to come. Great, thank you. I'd like to ask my final question now, which is going to conclude our discussion by circling back to where we began and uh, ask a question about NATO's ability to adapt to a rapidly changing security environment. There's every indication that the international security environment is only going to become more complex and challenging in the coming years, not less. And I've been working on NATO adaptation for many years now, and uh, one of the recurring themes I've heard from allies during that time is that NATO will eventually figure out how to do it, um, but that as an organization, it struggles with long-term planning, um, that it's not very good at having a long-term perspective. So we're meeting here today, just days after the 75th anniversary, uh, but I'd like you to peer into the future and uh, speculate a little bit about the Alliance's longer-term prospects and the challenges that it could face in 25 years' time when we all reconvene in Gaston Hall, uh, this time to celebrate the centenary of NATO's founding. So what sorts of challenges might we find ourselves discussing then, and will the Alliance be adequately prepared to address them? I did the math, and I'm hoping to be here. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, I'm badly hoping to be here. Um, so I think in 25 years, this alliance 
um, will still be facing the same challenges it does because the alliance really has an important values-based component to it, right? Um, this alliance will still be lined up against authoritarian regimes, regimes that do not seek to govern by this consent of the governed, um, that sort of thing. We are still gonna be together, and there are gonna be still countries out there that are opposed to that. And I think that's very important. Um, I think we can anticipate that there is gonna be an important military component to that still. I think that component is gonna be both uh, conventional and non-conventional. Um, as well as unconventional, right? So we'll have nuclear conventional and hybrid uh, different types of activities and conflicts that we'll face. Um, I think clearly space will uh, be much more important then uh, than it is uh, today, and it's pretty important today. Um, I think some things will continue to endure, though. Um, you know, I, I sometimes tell people that the great irreducible feature of warfare is hard power, right? You, you, can, you can have all the cyber, you can have all the information operator, you can have everything, but if the other guy wants to fist fight you, you're gonna end up in a fist fight. Um, so our ability to uh, keep the peace by being ready for the hard part of warfare, uh, CV spach and parabellum, um, that is gonna continue to be true mm -hmm. um, this, this whole time, well into the future, and uh, it's, it's our, duty to get to that future by being ready today, and it's our duty to be ready for that future by thinking ahead to the future and working with nations to build the sorts of forces we'll need that. Vigilance is the price of liberty, the shape motto. I think that's a perfect place to end. Uh, thank you for joining us today at Georgetown. It's been a tremendous honor, Pleasure. sir. I want to express my personal gratitude to you, uh, you, not only for our conversation today, but for your daily efforts in transforming the Alliance so that it truly is fit for purpose. We're very fortunate to have you in this role right now. Please thank me in joining the Supreme Allied Commander, General Kavoli. Thank you very much. Thank you. So much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Please, sir. Thank you all. Uh, before we wrap up today's program, I want to extend my personal gratitude to our distinguished speakers and panelists, many of whom traveled from Europe to join us today. Equally important, I want to thank the audience for your active engagement and interest in the Alliance. I know we were competing with an eclipse, uh, but there'll be another one of those in I think 20 or so years, and NATO only turns 75 once. So I think you made the right choice. Uh, I also want to make an appeal, especially to the students and younger audience members, both in the room and online, to please stay engaged in the important work that NATO is doing to safeguard the peace and prosperity of our shared Euro-Atlantic community. NATO, perhaps now more than ever, needs your support and engagement. And the good news is that it's relatively easy, especially for those of you in the audience with us today, but also for those of you joining us from locations in other allied nations to remain engaged. This July 9th through July 11th, the heads of government of the 32 allies will be coming to Washington for the 75th anniversary summit, and they will be joined by heads of government from several NATO partner countries. The Washington summit will be an occasion to celebrate 75 years of historic achievements, but it will also be much more than just a party. As we heard today, it will be an important opportunity to underscore NATO's continued strength, unity, and yes, adaptation, as it advances implementation of the most robust plans and reforms since the end of the Cold War. Alongside the summit, there will be a public forum held on the sidelines where students and young professionals can participate, along with many other public events and opportunities to learn more about NATO, all within your reach and in your backyard. I know the organizers of the summit and the public forums and NATO as a whole is quite keen on having your input, not just on the road to Washington, but also beyond. And apart from the upcoming summit, there are other ways of getting involved with NATO as well. The 2024 NATO Youth Summit will be taking place in Miami, Florida and Stockholm, Sweden on May 13th. Registration is open through April 14th. And if you go to the website, natoyouthsummit.com, all one word, you can apply for a sponsored seat, which will include travel and accommodation. And it's a great opportunity, uh, almost enough to make me wish I was 18 again. 
Uh, it's open to anyone aged 18 to, through 35, by the way. Uh, but the bottom line is that NATO needs your input and your voice, and its leadership is standing by, ready to engage. So I very much hope that you will take up the challenge and the call of service, because you are the ones, not those of us up here on the stage today, who will ultimately determine whether the alliance is around in 75 years' time. So if today has ignited even a small spark of interest in you, then I and the other speakers and panelists will consider this conference a success. It's your engagement and commitment that will shape the future of the Alliance in the decades to come. And we in the Center for Security Studies and the Walsh School of Foreign Service certainly plan on staying engaged as well. Thank you for your attendance, and please enjoy the rest of your afternoon.